Chapter 17 In the quiet house, with the dog snoring at her feet, Abigail scanned the hacked FBI files. It pleased her that Special Agent Elise Garrison had pursued the lead she'd leaked to her, built on it. The 5.6 million the FBI's operation had confiscated equaled a nice, solid chunk, enough to sting, in Abigail's opinion, as would the six arrests. It was hardly enough to put the Volkoffs out of business, but it would annoy them and drive them to dig deeper into their organization, trying to find the source of the leaks. Satisfied, she closed the files, told herself she should go to bed. It was nearly midnight, and she'd contracted two new jobs that week. She needed to be fresh to begin work in the morning. But she wasn't tired. What she was, Abigail admitted, was restless. And what she was doing, under the cover of work and research, was waiting for her phone to ring. How many times, she wondered, had she read a book or watched a movie where she'd been baffled by a woman waiting for a man to call? It seemed to her women who did so not only lacked a sense of self-esteem, but were simply foolish. Now she could only be baffled at herself. She didn't like the sensation she experienced, this combination of nerves and anxiety. Faint, yes, but there. She didn't even want this relationship, she reminded herself, and she certainly didn't want this uncomfortable and unattractive position she found herself in now. She didn't require phone calls or dinner companionship or conversations or any of it. All of those things interfered with her routine, upset her schedule, and, more important, could only lead to complications she couldn't risk. Still, she had to admit it was nice to have those things and to forget, even for minutes at a time, and simply be Abigail. The Abigail he was attracted to, enjoyed being with. But wasn't that falling into the same trap she'd sprung on herself years before? Convincing herself she could be what she wasn't? Have what she couldn't? It was good. Better. No, best. He hadn't called. She could begin immediately readjusting herself, her life back to what it had been before he'd changed it. She'd make herself some herbal tea. She'd take it upstairs and read herself to sleep. That was sensible. That was who she was. When she rose, the dog came awake instantly. He followed her into the kitchen, and when he saw her fill the kettle with water, sat to wait. A good dog, she thought as she set the kettle on the stove. A comfortable, well-secured house and satisfying work. Those were the only things she required to be content, and contentment was all she required. And yet, when her alarm signaled, she didn't feel her usual click of tension and readiness. Instead, she felt a quick surge of hope. Annoyed by it, she turned to her monitor to watch Brooks drive toward the house. He presumed too much, she decided, coming to her door after midnight. She wished now she'd turned off the lights, gone to bed. If she had, at least he wouldn't have any reason to think she'd waited for him. She'd tell him she was on her way to bed and too tired for company. Simple, and again, sensible, she thought, as she went to the door. She opened it as he got out of the car, and in the glare of her security lights, saw in his face, in his movements, layers of exhaustion, anger, sadness. Sorry. He stood for a moment at the base of the porch steps, bathed in that bright light. I should have called earlier. I should have gone on home. You didn't? No. Things got complicated. He shoved a hand through his hair. And I was here before I thought about how late it is. You're still up. Yes. Her resolve thinned and tore as she studied his face. I was making tea. Do you want tea? Sounds good. He came up the stairs. I'm sorry I didn't let you know I'd be this long. You have work. 
I've been working too. Saying nothing, he put his arms around her, pressed his face to her hair. Not for pleasure, she realized. It took her a moment to decipher the tenor of the embrace. He sought comfort. He'd come to her for comfort, and no one ever had. She started to pat his back, there, there, but stopped. And closing her eyes, she tried to imagine what she'd want. She rubbed his back instead, small, light circles, until she heard him sigh. The kettle's boiling, she told him when she heard it whistle. Yeah. But he held on for another moment before he stepped back. You should come in. I need to lock the door. I'll get it. No, I wouldn't feel fully safe if she didn't lock up herself. Okay, I'll get the kettle. When she'd finished, she found him pouring hot water into the squat teapot where she'd already measured out leaves. Lemon balm, right? My mother does the same thing some nights. It's relaxing. I could use some relaxing. She got out a second cup, saucer. Is your friend all right? Not really. Oh. Instantly shamed of her earlier annoyance, she turned. He was hurt? Not physically, other than a fist to the face, but he's had that before. He's likely to again. In silence, she arranged the cups, the pot, the sugar bowl, and spoons on the table. You should sit down. You look very tired. We'll have to share the tea strainer when it's steeped. I only have one. That's fine. Unsure, she remained standing when he sat down. Do you want food? I have the lasagna. It can be heated. No. No, but thanks. You're so sad, she blurted out. I guess that's some of it. Got a lot of pissed off in there, too. I've got to shake both off before I deal with tomorrow. Do you want to tell me, or should I change the subject? He smiled a little. You should sit down, Abigail, and have your tea. I don't know if I'm good at this, she said as she sat. Drinking tea? Comforting, or diffusing. Since you're angry and sad, it should be both. He laid a hand over hers briefly, then poured out the tea. Let's find out. Russ's family's owned the hotel for three generations now. It's not just a business, not just a livelihood to them. It's an essential part of their family history and their place in the community. Yeah, there's pride and love there. Justin Blake, have you heard of the Blakes? Yes, they're a very wealthy and influential local family. Justin's a spoiled, trouble-making fuckwit with a string of DUIs, a bad attitude. He'd have a sheet as long as my leg if his father didn't use that money or influence or political pressure, whatever works, to get him off. The kid has no respect for the law or any other damn thing. It would be difficult to develop one if he's allowed to behave badly with impunity. I'm sorry, she said quickly. I'm supposed to listen. There's no supposed. Anyway, his latest. He and a couple of the assholes he hangs with booked the best suite at the hotel and trashed it. Destroyed it. Why? For kicks? Out of boredom? Because they could? Pick one. Brooks shrugged then scrubbed his hands over his face. Russ went up this evening to deal with them when guests complained about the noise. Upshot is Justin punched him, took some swings at security, got himself arrested. And this time he won't slide through. It's looking like better than a hundred thousand in damages. Maybe more. That's a great deal. Yeah, it is. And Russ and his parents won't cave when Lincoln Blake pushes at them. I had a go-round with him and the kid tonight. You won't cave either. No, I won't. Justin and his pals are spending the night in jail. They'll make bail tomorrow. Blake will see to it. But Justin's got two choices. 
He takes a plea and does time, or he stands trial and does time, but he goes down this time, and either way the Blakes pay every cent of the damages. Jesus, I'm pissed off. He shoved up, stalked to the window. I should have gone home. You wouldn't be pissed off at home? No, I'd be pissed off anywhere. That fat, self-satisfied, cigar-smoking fuckhead figures he can threaten me with my job and I'll scare off? The father? Yeah, the father. Can he have you fired? If he can, they can shove the job. I don't want it if I can't fucking do it. Not if some overprivileged asshole can do whatever the hell he wants and I'm supposed to look the other way. Money is power, Abigail said quietly, but it's not the only power. I guess we'll see. I went over to talk to Russ's parents and Russ and Celine, his wife, after I dealt with the lawyer. She cried. Mrs. Conroy, this sweet, funny woman who always had peanut butter cookies in the jar just broke down and cried. I should have found a way to put that little bastard away before it went this far. It's useless to blame yourself for what this person did or what his father has been able to do, especially when the pattern was set long before you took the position as chief of police. The rational thing to do is arrest him, which you have, and to compile evidence for the prosecutor to assist in getting a guilty verdict at trial. That wasn't sympathetic, she realized. Brooke sat back down, picked up his tea. Worked pretty well, though. I know the logic of it, Abigail. But your friend and his family have been hurt. It's emotional as well as financial and physical and criminal. People should pay for their actions. There should be consequences. There should be justice. Her hand balled into a fist on the table for a moment, before she ordered herself to relax it. It's hard not to feel sad and angry and even hopeless when bad things happen, because fear and influence and money often outweigh justice. He leaned forward, laid a hand over hers. Who hurt you? She shook her head, said nothing. Not yet, then. What will you do tomorrow? I've got a 7.30 meeting with the prosecutor to go over everything again. We'll have an arraignment, bail hearing. I expect they'll cut Justin and the others loose until trial. I don't figure he'll go for a plea straight off. Maybe once it gets closer, maybe if the lawyers don't screw it up. The Conroys are just mad enough to go for a civil suit on top of it. I won't be discouraging that. It's time the pressure came from the other side. Then you know what you have to do and how to do it. Are they violent? The kid likes to bust things up. I meant, could or would they try to hurt you or your friend's family, using violence as intimidation? Can't say for sure, but... I wouldn't go there. Money's Blake's weapon of choice. Abigail considered. I don't believe they can have you fired. Don't you? Objectively, your family is a fixture in the community, liked and respected. You're also liked and respected in your own right. I assume as a multi-generational business family with a key property in the community, your friend and his family are also valued. Their property was damaged through reckless and selfish behavior, so sympathy and outrage will be on their side. Those things are also weapons. Extrapolating from what you've said tonight, I'd posit that the Blakes are somewhat feared but not well liked. There are likely many people in the community who'd be pleased if the son is punished for his actions. Extrapolating. Now, how can you use words like that? and still manage to make me feel a whole hell of a lot better. Did I? This time, he laid a hand over hers and left it there. You were right about the sad. I was, and pissed off and frustrated, 
and will have to toss in a dash of feeling sorry for myself. Now I'm down to sorry and mad, with a whole fat scoop of looking forward to kicking some ass, legally speaking. That's good. It's real good. He gave her hand a squeeze. I should go. I wish you'd stay. He turned her hand over so their fingers linked. Thank God. We should go to bed. Two minds, one thought. It's late, she said as she rose to gather the tea things. You're tired, and I think still a little sad. Sex releases endorphins, so for the short term, you'd feel. She trailed off when she turned and found him grinning at her. I'm half in love with you, he told her, and heading fast toward three quarters. Something inside her burst like sunlight before it flooded away on a rise of panic. Don't do that. I don't think it's something you'd do or don't. It's something that happens or doesn't. It's a mixture of sexual and physical attraction, along with novelty and the tension between mutual interests and conflicts of interest. People often mistake hormonal reaction and certain compatibilities for what they think of as love. He continued to smile as he got to his feet, but something about the glint in his eyes had her taking a cautious step back as he walked to her. He put his hands on her shoulders, lowered his head to brush his lips over hers. He said, "Hush," and kissed her again. "You don't want to tell me what I feel or don't, or I might click back up to pissed off. We don't want that, do we?" "No, but hush," he repeated, with his lips whispering against hers. "Pretty Abigail." So full of suspicion and intellect and nerves. I'm not nervous. Nerves, he repeated, skimming his thumbs along the sides of her breasts while his mouth continued to toy with hers, rubbing, brushing, grazing. When you're not quite sure what's next, when you haven't worked out all the steps or there's a little detour. I like the nerves. Why? And I like the curious why. He tugged her shirt up and off, watching the surprise, and yeah, just a few nerves flicker in her eyes. I like knowing you haven't figured it, me, this, all out. His hands glided up her sides, over her breasts, down. Action and reaction, right? I like your reactions. There were nerves, she admitted. They seemed to slither along her skin, under it, coil in her belly, squeeze around her heart to increase the beat. Everything inside her body felt soft, then sharp, loose, then tangled. How could she keep up? We should go upstairs. She felt his lips curve against her throat and his fingers trail up her back. Why? He murmured and flicked open the catch of her bra. I like your kitchen. He shifted his feet, towing off his shoes. It's warm and efficient. I love the way you feel under my hands, Abigail. She fell into the kiss head first. A breathless tumble that left her dizzy and weak. Seduction, though she'd never allowed herself to be seduced, it was unnecessary. Her mind recognized the sensation, and her body surrendered to it, craving the feel of his skin, his muscles, his bones. She shot her hands under his shirt, found the warm, the solid, the smooth. Her breath caught on a gasp when he hitched her up so she sat on her own kitchen counter. Before the shock of that had fully registered, his mouth closed over her breast. So hot, so wet, so strong, she let out a quick cry of stunned pleasure. Later, 
she would think the orgasm that shot through her was as much a result of the shock as the sensation. But now it caught her unprepared, left her shuddering and defenseless. Brooks. She wanted to tell him to wait, to wait until she steadied herself, but his mouth was on hers again, taking her under so fast, so deep, she could only shudder and yield. She'd never been taken before, he realized. Not like this, where her surrender was complete, not when she couldn't separate some small part of herself to reach for control. And God, he wanted to take her, to destroy that fascinating and innate control. He yanked down her zipper and, half lifting her, peeled the jeans away. Giving her no time to recover, he closed his mouth over hers again, swallowing her instinctive protest. He stroked her, teasing and gentle. She was already hot, already wet, already balanced on the edge. He wanted her to ride that, hold that sensation until it overwhelmed and overcame. He wanted to watch her as she did. The air, so thick and sweet, made her feel drunk with every breath. The pleasure he brought her was so complete, so absolute, she seemed trapped in it, mired and steeped. He caught her nipple between his teeth, bringing her to an exquisite point just bordering on pain while he stroked that heat higher. When she thought she couldn't bear it, couldn't contain it, everything went bright and free. She heard herself moan, the long, long, throaty sound of it as her head dropped heavily on his shoulder. She wanted to twine around him, curl inside him, but he angled her back, wrapped her trembling legs around his waist, and drove into her. Fresh shock. Fresh pleasure, hard and fast and furious, a rising flood churning into the wild sweep of a tidal wave. He dragged her through it, drowned her in it, until that violent wave tossed her to the surface. She could only float there, wrecked, until he joined her. Now, gradually, she felt his heart hammering against hers and the rags of his breath tearing at her ear. She felt the smooth surface of the counter under her, the dazzle of the kitchen lights against her closed lids. She needed a moment or two, just a moment or two, to find her balance again. Then she could... He shocked her again when he scooped her off the counter, into his arms. You don't have to... Hush, he said yet again, and carried her upstairs to bed. She came down first in the morning and could only stop and stare. She'd left the lights on, a careless waste of energy. But she couldn't seem to get too worked up about it. Clothes scattered the floor, hers and his. She studied the counter with a kind of baffled wonder. She'd never understood the appeal for sex in odd or unusual places— what was the point when a bed, even a couch, would be more comfortable and conducive? Though she did enjoy sex in the shower on occasion. Obviously, she'd been too narrow in her viewpoint, though she wondered how long it might take before she could perform basic kitchen duties with equanimity. For now, she started the coffee, then gathered up all the clothes, folded them neatly. By the time Brooks came down, naked, She'd set the kitchen to rights and started breakfast. Seemed to have left my clothes down here. Obviously amused, he picked up the jeans she'd folded, put them on. You didn't have to get up this early, make breakfast. I like getting up early, and don't mind making breakfast. You have a difficult day ahead. You'll feel better if you have a meal. It's just an omelet and some toast. When she turned... He'd pulled on his shirt and was looking at her, just looking at her with those clever, changeable eyes. I wish you wouldn't look at me like that. Like what? I... She turned away to pour the coffee. 
I don't know. He came up behind her, wrapped his arms around her waist loosely, pressed a kiss to the side of her neck. Rounding third and headed for home, he murmured. That's a baseball term. We're not playing baseball. I don't know what that means. He turned her around, kissed her mouth lightly. Yes, you do. It's nothing to get panicked about. He rubbed at the tension in her shoulders. We'll take it easy. What kind of omelets? Three cheese with some spinach and peppers. Sounds great. I'll get the toast. He moved so easily around her kitchen as if he belonged there. Panic tickled up her throat again. I'm not... How did people put it? I'm not built for this. For what? For any of this. I am. He popped bread in the toaster, leaned on the counter. I wasn't sure about that, until you. But I'm built for all of this. From my point of view, so are you. So, we'll see. I'm not who you think I am. He studied her, nodding slowly. Maybe not on all the details, maybe not. But I'm looking at you, Abigail, I'm listening to you, and where it counts, you're who I think you are. That's not... She nearly told him that wasn't her real name. How could she become this involved, this reckless? That's not something you can know. I know that's not what you were going to say. I'm good at reading people. It comes with the territory. I know you're scared of something or someone. You've taken a hard hit or two along the way and done what you can to shield up. Can't blame you for it. Light poured in the window at his back, shot a nimbus around his hair. Dark hair still tumbled from the night from her hands. I don't know what to say to you. You've got a lot of secrets behind your eyes and a hell of a lot of weight on your shoulders. I'm going to keep believing that one day you're going to share those secrets and that weight with me, and we'll figure out the rest once you do. She only shook her head, turned away to put the omelets on plates. We shouldn't be talking about this, especially now. You'll be late for your meeting, and I have two new contracts to work on. Congratulations. Why don't I pick something up for dinner tonight? I have the lasagna. Even better. She put the plates down when the toast popped, then sat with a jerk of temper. I didn't invite you. Or past that. I don't know how to be past that. He brought the toast over, set a slice on her plate as he took his seat. This looks great. You change the subject, or you agree rather than debate, because you're so certain you'll get your way in the end. You're good at reading people, too. He took a bite of omelet. Tastes great. You could make a living. You're frustrating. I know it, but I make up for it by being so good-looking. She didn't want to smile, but couldn't help it. You're not that good-looking. He laughed and ate his breakfast. When he'd gone, she considered her options. She couldn't tell him, of course, but, hypothetically, what were the probable results if she did? She was wanted for questioning in the murders of two U.S. Marshals. As a law enforcement official, he'd be obligated to turn her in. It was highly doubtful she'd live to give testimony. The Volkoffs would find a way to get to her and eliminate her, most likely through one of their law enforcement plants. But, hypothetically again, if Brooks believed her and believed her life would be forfeit should he do his duty, he would be less inclined to fulfill that duty. She tried to imagine being able to talk to him about John and Terry about Julie and everything that had happened since those horrible nights. She simply couldn't imagine it, couldn't theorize on how it might feel to be able to talk to him, to anyone, to share the burden. He was kind, she thought, and dedicated to justice, to doing the right thing for the right reasons. 
in many ways, in basic, vital ways, he reminded her of John. If she told him, if he believed her, he might be, like John, driven to protect her, to help her. And wouldn't that put his life at risk? Yet another reason to keep her own counsel, to go on as she'd gone on for a dozen years. But everything had already changed, she reminded herself. Everything wasn't as it had been. He'd done that. She'd allowed it. So if she told him, because the balance had already shifted, she would have to be prepared to go, to run again, change her name again, whether he believed her or not. Therefore, logically, rationally, she couldn't tell him. Their relationship would gradually lessen in intensity until the balance shifted back again, until her life was back to what it had been. Her conclusions should have made her feel more confident, more calm and certain. Instead, they left her unhappy and unsettled. Chapter 18 The morning business went pretty much the way Brooks had figured, with a few extra points for the good guys. He'd expected Justin and his idiot pals to make bail, and had calculated the judge would set it high enough to sting a little. He set it high enough to sting a lot. Harry objected, of course. He had to do his job. But the judge held firm. The Conroys might not have been as deep in the pockets as the Blakes, but they were as well-respected and a hell of a lot more well-liked. Justin had kicked the wrong cat this time, in Brooks's opinion. From his position in the courtroom, he watched Blake seethe, Justin sneer, and the two others being arraigned keep their heads and eyes down while their parents sat stone-faced. He had to fight back a mile-wide grin when the judge agreed to the prosecutor's demand that all three under charges turn in their passports. This is insulting! Blake surged to his feet at the judge's ruling, and this time, Brooks did a happy dance in his head. I won't tolerate the insinuation my son would run away from these absurd charges. We want our day in court. You're going to get that. Judge Rheingold, who played golf with Blake every Sunday, slapped his gavel down. And you're going to show respect in this courtroom, Lincoln. You sit down and keep your peace in here, or I'll have you removed. Don't think you can sit up there and threaten me. I helped put you in those robes. Behind his wire-framed glasses, Rheingold's eyes glittered. And as long as I'm wearing them, you'll show them respect. Sit down, be quiet, or sure as God made little green apples, I'll hold you in contempt of court. Blake shoved Harry aside when the lawyer tried to intervene. I'll show you contempt. You just did. Rheingold banged his gavel again. That's five hundred dollars. Bailiff, remove Mr. Blake from the courtroom before he makes it a thousand. Red-faced, teeth set, Blake turned on his heel and stalked out under his own power. He took a moment to pause, scald Brooks with a blistering stare. Brooks sat through the rest of the legal wrangling, the instructions, the warnings, the scheduling. He waited until Justin and his friends were led back to their holding cells until their bail could be posted. More than satisfied, Brooks had to control a little bounce in his step when he walked over to speak with Ross and his family. There was no doubt in his mind that having the entire Conroy family present, Russ's split lip, Mrs. Conroy fighting tears, had influenced Rheingold's ruling. That pompous bully Blake made it worse for himself and those vicious boys. Celine, dark eyes sparkling in contrast to her usual easiest Sunday morning temperament, kept her arm protectively around her mother-in-law's shoulders. I loved it. I only wished he'd opened his mouth again so it cost him more. I wasn't sure Stan would stand up against Lincoln. 
Mick Conroy nodded toward the bench. I feel some better about it. I'm going to take your mom home, he said to Russ. You want me to come? Hilly, her eyes still shadowed, the bright hair she'd passed to her son pulled back in a haphazard ponytail, shook her head. She kissed Russ's cheek. We'll be all right. Brooks. She kissed Brooks's cheek in turn. We're grateful. There's no need for that. She's still sad, Celine murmured when her in-laws walked out. She can't find her mad through it. I want her to find that mad. She'll feel better when she does. You're mad enough for all of us. Celine smiled a little. God knows. I've got to get to school. The kids have probably traumatized the morning substitute by now. She gave Brooks a hard hug, turned to Russ, held on to him for a long minute. Don't fret too much, cutie, she told him. Let me buy you a cup of coffee, Brooks said to Russ when they were alone. I should get to the hotel. Take a few minutes, decompress. I could use it. Okay, I'll meet you there. The minute Brooks walked into the diner, Kim grabbed a coffee pot and beelined toward him. She pointed at a booth, turned the mug on the tabletop over, poured. Well, she said. Just coffee, thanks. She poked him on the shoulder. How am I supposed to maintain my status as news queen if you don't give me the dish? Do you want me to get demoted? No, indeed, we can't have that. They made bail. Her mouth turned down ferociously. I should have known Stan Reingold would play weasel for Lincoln Blake. Now, I wouldn't say that, Kim. I expected them to make bail. I didn't expect the judge to set it as high as he did, and I can guarantee you Blake didn't either. That's something, then. And he's confiscating their passports until after the trial. Well, now. Lips pursed, she gave a satisfied nod. I take it all back. That had to burn Blake's fat ass. Oh, I'd say he felt the heat. He mouthed off and the judge fined him five hundred for contempt. This time she slapped Brooks's shoulder. You're shitting me. Swear to God. I take it all back double. Next time Stan Reingold comes in, I'm giving him pie on the house. You hear that, Lindy? She called to the man at the grill. Stan Reingold fined Lincoln Blake five hundred for contempt. Spatula fisted at his hip. Lindy turned. About time contempt cost him cause the sum bitch has plenty of it. That coffee's on me, Brooks. Lindy lifted his chin toward the door. And his too. Kim spotted Russ when he came in, turned the second mug over. You sit right on down here, sweetie. She rose to her toes to kiss his cheek. And no charge for the coffee or anything else you want. You be sure to tell your folks that anybody worth spit in this town is sorry as hell about what happened, and behind them a hundred percent. I will. Thanks, Kim. It means a lot. You look tired out. How about a big wedge of that French apple pie you like to perk you up? Couldn't right now. Maybe next time. I'll leave you to talk then, but you need anything, you just holler. Brooks pretended to sulk. She didn't offer me any damn pie. Russ managed a wan smile. She's got to feel sorry for you first. Did you know about the passports? I knew we were going to request it, but I didn't figure Rheingold would rule on our side. He surprised me, and maybe that's on me. He's let the Blake kid slide on plenty before today. Yeah, he has, and I think he's feeling the weight of that. He may be Blake's golf buddy, but he can't, and I think won't, brush off this kind of thing. I believe his honor was well and truly pissed this morning, and I believe Blake isn't going to let Harry talk his boy into a plea on this. He wants the trial because he absolutely believes he and his are too fucking important to bend to the law. 
That boy's going down, Russ, and he may go down harder than I expected. I'm not sorry about it. Can't say as I am either. Brooke shifted forward. I wanted to talk to you for a few minutes because I'm dead sure Blake's going to do whatever he can to buy you off or pressure you into dropping the assault charges. He gets that gone, he's going to figure it's mostly about money. Pay the two dollars, so to speak, try to manipulate community service and some rehab, a suspended sentence for the boy. Russ's bruised mouth set like stone. It's not going to happen, Brooks. Did you see my daddy this morning? He looks ten years older. I don't give a damn about taking the punch, and if it wasn't for the rest, I'd let it go. But I'm not going to shrug this off so that little bastard slides through this. Good. If Blake starts hounding you, let me know. I'll mention harassment charges and restraining orders. Russ sat back, and his smile came easier. Which one of them are you really after? It's two for one as I see it. They both need a good, swift kick. I don't know if Justin was born an asshole, but his daddy sure as hell helped make him a bigger one. He stirred at his coffee, but found he didn't have a taste for it. I didn't see his mama in court. Word is Mrs. Blake's embarrassed and tired out, about done with it, and Blake's ordered her to keep it shut. He runs that house. That may be, but he doesn't run this town. Do you, chief? I protect and serve, Brooks said with a glance out the window. The Blakes are going to learn what that means. How about you, Mr. Mayor? It may be tougher to win an election with Blake backing whoever I run against, but I'm in it. New times. Brooks lifted his mug in toast. Good times. You're pretty sassy this morning, son. Is it all about Rheingold's rulings? That didn't suck, but I've got me a fascinating, beautiful woman I'm falling for. Falling hard. Quick work. In the blood. My mama and daddy barely did more than look at each other, and that was that. She's got me, Russ. Right here. He tapped a fist on his heart. Sure it's not considerably lower where she's got you? There, too. But Jesus, Russ, she does it for me. I just think about her, and I'm there. I look at her, and... I swear, I could look at her for hours. Days. Brooks let out a half laugh, edged with a little surprise. I'm done. I'm gone. If you don't bring her over for dinner, Celine's going to see to it my life's not worth living. I'll work on it. I figure I'm going to have the women in my family making the same demand before much longer. Abigail's the type who needs to be eased in. Something in there, he added. Something from before. She's not ready to let me in on that yet. I'm working on that, too. So she hasn't figured out you'll just keep digging, nudging, and chewing until you know what you want to know or get what you want to get? I'm blinding her with affability and charm. How long do you figure that'll last? I've got a little more to spare. She needs help. She just doesn't know it, or isn't ready to take it. Yet. Abigail spent the morning happily at her computer, redesigning and personalizing the security system for a law firm in Rochester, she was particularly pleased with the results as she'd gotten the job on referral and had nearly lost it as the senior partner had balked when she'd refused to meet with him personally. She believed he and the other partners would be more than satisfied with the system and her suggestions. If they weren't, it was the price she paid for doing business on her terms. To give her mind a rest, she shifted gears into gardening— she wanted to create a butterfly garden along the south corner of her cabin and had read and researched how to best accomplish the goal. With Bert by her side, she gathered tools, loaded her wheelbarrow. It pleased her to see the little vegetable garden she'd already planted doing so well, 
to smell the herbs soaking up the sunshine as she wheeled by. Her narrow stream bubbled along, and birds sang to its tune. Through the thickening trees, a frisky breeze danced, and wild dogwood peeked out like flowery ghosts. She was happy, she realized, as she marked off her plot with string and stakes. Really happy. With spring, with work, with her home, with Brooks. Had she been really happy before? Surely there had been moments, at least during her childhood, in her brief time at Harvard, even moments after everything changed so completely, when she'd been happy. But she couldn't remember ever feeling quite like this. Nervous. Brooks was right about the nerves, and she wasn't entirely sure she liked his being right. But over them and through them was a kind of lightness she didn't know quite what to do with. As she switched on her tiller, she hummed along with its churning grind, with the bubbling brook, with the bird song. No, she didn't know quite what to do with it, but if she could, she'd have held these moments, these feelings, tight, so tight, forever. She had satisfying work, had her gardening, which she enjoyed more than she'd ever imagined. She had a man she respected and enjoyed, more than she'd ever imagined, who would come to dinner, talk, laugh, be with her. It couldn't last, but what was the point in projecting, in making herself unhappy? Hold it tight, she reminded herself as she added compost to her soil. For the moment. She trundled her wheelbarrow back to the greenhouse, wandered through the smell of rich, moist earth, burgeoning flowers, sharp, strong greens, selecting the plants she'd nurtured for this particular project. Good, steady, physical labor in the warm afternoon. That made her happy, too. Who knew she had such a capacity for happy? She made four trips, her glock against her hip, her dog trotting at her heels before she began to lay out the plan she'd sketched out on chilly winter nights. The cardinal flowers and cone flowers, the sweet-scented heliotrope mixed with airy lantana, the flow of verbena, the charm of New England asters, the elegance of oriental lilies for nectar. She had the sunflowers and hollyhocks and milkweed for host plants to tempt the adults to lay their eggs, the young caterpillars to feed. She arranged, rearranged, grouped, regrouped, gradually veering away from her initial, somewhat mathematical layout when she found the less rigid and exact pleased her eye. In case, she took out her phone and took pictures from several angles before she picked up her trowel to dig the first hole. An hour later, she stepped back and checked her progress before going inside for ice to add to the tea she'd left steeping in the sun. It's going to be beautiful, she told Bert, and we'll be able to sit on the porch and watch the butterflies. I think we'll draw hummingbirds, too. I love seeing all this grow and bloom, the butterflies and birds. We're putting down roots, Bert. The deeper they go, the more I want them. She closed her eyes, lifted her face to the sun. Oh, she loved the way the air sounded, loved the way it smelled. She loved the rhythm of work and pleasure she'd found here, the quiet moments, the busy ones. She loved the feel of her dog leaning against her leg and the taste of tea cool on her throat. She loved Brooks. Her eyes popped open. No, no, she'd just gotten caught up in the happy moments here, in this euphoria of having everything just as she wanted, and she'd let herself mix that with what he'd said to her that morning, how he'd looked at her. Action and reaction, she told herself. Nothing more. But what if it were more? Her alarm beeped, stiffening her spine and shoulders as she laid a hand on the butt of the Glock. She wasn't expecting a package. She walked quickly to the monitor she'd set up on the porch. She remembered the car even before she made out the driver. 
Brooks's mother, dear God, and two other women, talking, laughing as Sunny drove toward the house. Before she could decide what to do, the car rounded the last curve. Sunny gave the horn a cheery toot toot when she spotted Abigail. Hey there! Sunny shouted out the car window before the three of them piled out. The woman in the front had to be Brooks's sister. Abigail thought. The coloring, the bone structure, the shape of the eyes and mouth were too similar not to be genetic. Look at this butterfly garden. Yes, I've been working on it this afternoon. Well, it's just going to be wonderful, Sunny told her. Smell the heliotrope. I've got Plato in the car. Do you suppose Bert would like to meet him? I, I suppose he would. Mom is so busy worrying about introducing the dog, she doesn't worry about the humans. I'm Maya, Brooks's sister, and our middle sister, Sybil. It's nice to meet you both. Abigail managed as her hand was gripped and shaken. We blew the day off. Maya beamed out, a lanky woman with a pixie cut in streaky brunette. Work, kids, man. We had ourselves a fancy ladies' lunch, and now we're heading in to do some shopping. We thought you might like to come along with us, Sybil said. Come along? Baffled, off balance, one eye on her dog, Abigail tried to keep up. Shopping, Maya repeated. After we're talking about frozen margaritas. The puppy bounced, rolled, nipped, and generally went crazy around and over Bert. Who sat quivering, his gaze slanted toward Abigail. Ami, joué. Instantly he hunkered, head down, tail up, and wagging, and playfully knocked Plato into an ungainly roll. Ah,、oh, aren't they cute? Sunny declared. He won't hurt the puppy. Honey, I can see that. That big boy's gentle as a lamb. And God knows Plato can use a little running around time. He's been in the car or on the leash all afternoon. Did you meet my two girls? Yes. We're trying to talk her into putting away her trowel and coming along for shopping and margaritas. Sybil offered Abigail a warm, easy smile that showed hints of dimples. Thank you for asking. Abigail heard the stiffness in her voice when compared with the other women's ease. But I really need to finish planting. I got a later start than I'd planned. Well, it looks just beautiful. Sybil wandered over for a closer look. I didn't inherit Mama's or Daddy's green thumb, so I'm envious. It was very nice of you to come over and invite me. It was, Maya agreed. But mostly, Sib and I just wanted to get a close-up look at you and check out the woman who's got Brooks all tangled up. Oh, you're not the type I imagined would hook him so good and proper. Oh, was all Abigail could think of again. Something's in Maya's mind. Sunny began hooking an arm around her daughter. It just rolls right off her tongue. I can be tactful and diplomatic, but it's not a natural state for me. Anyway, I meant it as a compliment, a good thing. Thank you. Maya laughed. You're welcome. Mostly, say Brooks, in the past, tended toward the looks without necessarily much substance to back it up. But here you are, pretty and natural, strong and smart enough to live out here on your own. Clever enough to plant a well-designed garden, I did get the green thumb, and you run your own business, from what I'm told. And I guess since you got that big gun on your hip, you know how to take care of yourself. Yes, I do. Have you ever shot anyone? Maya, don't mind her. Sybil said, "She is the oldest and has the biggest mouth. Are you sure you wouldn't like to come with us?" I really need to finish this garden, but thank you. We'll have a cookout Sunday afternoon, Sunny announced. Brooks will bring you around. Oh, thank you, but nothing fancy, just a backyard barbecue. And I've got some yellow flags I need to divide. I'll give you some. They'll like that sunny spot over by the brook. 
I'll round up that pup and we'll see you Sunday. You've been seeing Brooks for a while now, Maya commented. I suppose. You know how he just chips amiably away at you until he gets his way? Yes. Maya winked and grinned. He comes by it naturally. We'll see you Sunday. Don't worry. Sybil surprised Abigail by taking her hand as her sister walked off to help their mother with the puppy. It'll be fine. Your dog's all right with kids around? He wouldn't hurt anyone. Unless I tell him to, she thought. You bring him along. You'll feel easier having your dog with you. We're pretty nice people and inclined to like anyone who makes Brooks happy. You'll be fine, she said, and gave Abigail's hand a squeeze before she released it and walked back to the car. There was a lot of laughing and chattering, a lot of waving and honking. Shell-shocked, Abigail stood, her deliriously happy dog at her side, and politely lifted her hand as the O'Hara Gleason women drove away. It was like being rolled over by a steamroller made of flowers, Abigail thought. It didn't really hurt. It was all very pretty and sweet-smelling. But you were still flattened. She wouldn't go, of course. It would be impossible on so many levels. Perhaps she'd write a polite note of regret to Brooks's mother. She put her gardening gloves back on. She wanted to finish the bed. Plus, she'd used finishing it as an excuse, so finish it she must and would. She'd never been asked to go shopping and have margaritas and wondered, as she dug, what it was like. She knew people shopped even when they didn't need anything. She didn't understand the appeal, but she knew others did. She thought of that day, so long ago, in the mall with Julie, how much fun it had been, how exhilarating and liberating it had been to try on clothes and shoes with a friend. Of course, they hadn't been friends, not really friends. The entire interlude had been one of chance and circumstance and mutual need, and that interlude had led to disaster and tragedy. She knew, logically, the harmless rebellion of buying clothes and shoes hadn't caused the tragedy. Even her own reckless stupidity of forging the IDs, agreeing to go to the club, hadn't caused the events that followed. The Volkovs and Yakov Korotki held that responsibility. And yet, how could she not link them together, not feel the weight and the guilt even after all this time? The argument with her mother had lit the chain reaction that had ended with the explosion of the safe house. If not fully responsible, she had been one of the links in that chain. And still, as she planted, she wondered what it was like to ride in a car with women who laughed, to shop for unnecessary things, to drink margaritas and gossip. And wondering took some of the bloom off the pleasure of the sounds and smells of her solitude. She planted it all, added more, worked through the afternoon into soft evening, wheeling bags of mulch to the bed. Filthy, sweaty, satisfied, she set up the sprinklers just as her alarm signaled again. This time she saw Brooks driving toward the house. She'd lost track of time, she realized. She'd meant to go in, put the lasagna on warm in the oven before he arrived, and had certainly hoped to have cleaned up at least a little. Well, look at that. He got out, a bouquet of purple irises in his hand. These feel a little dinky now. They're beautiful. It's the second time you brought me flowers. You're the only one who ever has. He made them both a silent promise to bring them often. He handed them to her, pulled out a rawhide for Bert. Didn't forget you, big guy. You must have worked half the day putting that bed in. Not quite that long, but it took some time. I want butterflies. You're going to get them. It's pretty as it can be, Abigail. So are you. I'm dirty, she said, backing up when he bent to kiss her. 
but I don't mind a bit. You know I'd have given you a hand with the planting. I'm good at it. I got started and caught up in it. Why don't I get us some wine? We can sit out here and admire your work. I need to shower and put the lasagna in to warm. Go on, get your shower. I can put the food in, get the wine. From the looks of things, you worked harder than I did today. Here, he took the flowers back. I'll put them in water for you. What? he said when she only stared at him. Nothing. I... I won't be long. Not sure what to do, he concluded, when offered the most basic and minimal help. But she'd taken it, he thought, as he went in, filled her vase. And without argument or excuses, that was a step forward. He put the flowers on the counter, expecting she'd fuss with the arrangement later, and likely when he wasn't around. He switched the oven, set it low, slid the casserole in. He took the wine and two glasses out on the front porch, and, after pouring, carried his own glass over to lean on the post, study her flowers. He knew enough about gardening to be sure the job had taken her hours, knew enough about gardening artfully to be sure she had a knack for color and texture and flow. And he knew enough about people to be sure the planting of it was another mark of ownership, of settling in. Her place done her way. A good sign. When she stepped out, he turned to her. Her damp hair curled a little around her face, and she smelled as fresh as spring itself. It's my first spring back in the Ozarks, he said, picking up her glass to offer it. I'm watching it come back to life, the hills greening up, the wild flowers bursting, the rivers streaming through it all. The light, the shadows, sunlight on fields of row crops freshly planted, all of it new again for another season. And I know there's nowhere else I want to be. This is home again, for the rest of it. I feel that way. It's the first time I've felt that way. I like it. It's good you do. I look at you, Abigail, smelling of that spring, your flowers blooming or waiting to, your eyes so serious, so goddamn beautiful. And I feel the same. There's nowhere else. No one else. I don't know what to do with how you make me feel. And I'm afraid of what my life will be if this changes and I never feel this way again. How do I make you feel? Happy. So happy. And terrified and confused. We'll work on the happy until you're easy and sure. She set down her wine, went to him, held on. I may never be. You came outside without your gun. You have yours. He smiled into her hair. That's something, then. That's trust and a good start. She didn't know, couldn't analyze through all the feelings. We can sit on the steps, and you could tell me what happened this morning. We can do that. He tipped her face back, kissed her lightly. Cause I'm feeling good about it. Chapter 19 He filled her in while the shadows lengthened and her new garden soaked up the gentle shower from her sprinklers. She'd always found the law fascinating, the ins and outs of the process, the illogic, and, in her opinion, often the bias, infused into the rules and codes and procedures by the human factor. Justice seemed so clear-cut to her, but the law that sought it, enforced it, was murky and slippery. I don't understand why, because they have money, they should be released. Innocent till proven guilty. But they are guilty, she insisted, and it has been proven. They rented the room and caused the damage. Justin Blake assaulted your friend in front of witnesses. They're entitled to their day in court. She shook her head. 
But now they're free to use money or intimidation against those witnesses and the others involved, or to run or to craft delays. Your friends suffered a loss, and the people who caused it are free to go about their lives and business. The legal system is very flawed. That may be, but without it, chaos. From her experience, chaos came with it. Consequences, punishment, justice should be swift and constant. Without the escape hatches of money, clever lawyers, and illogical rulings, I imagine most mobs think that when they get a rope. She frowned at him. You arrest people who break the law. You know they've broken the law when you do so. You should be frustrated, even angry, knowing one of them finds a way through a legal loophole or, due to human failure, isn't punished for the crime. I'd rather see a guilty man go free than an innocent one go down. Sometimes there are reasons to break the law. I'm not talking about our three current assholes, but in general. Obviously relaxed, Brooks stretched out his legs, gave Bert a little rub with his foot. It's not always black and white, right and wrong. If you don't consider all the shades and circumstances, you haven't reached justice. You believe that? The muscles in her belly twisted, vibrated. That there can be reasons to break the law. Sure, there are. Self-defense, defense of others, or something as simple as speeding. Your wife's in labor. I'm not going to cite you for breaking the speed limit on the way to the hospital. You'd consider the circumstances. Sure. Back when I was on patrol, we got called in on an assault. This guy went into a bar and beat the shit out of his uncle. We'll call him Uncle Harry. Now we've got to take the guy in on the assault, but it turns out Uncle Harry's been messing with the guy's twelve-year-old daughter. Yeah, he should have just called the cops and child services on it. But was he wrong to break Uncle Harry's face? I don't think so. You have to look at the whole picture, weigh those circumstances. That's what the courts are supposed to do. Point of view. She murmured, "Yeah, point of view." He trailed a finger down her arm. "Have you broken the law, Abigail?" It was a door she knew that he invited her to walk through, but what if it locked behind her? "I've never had a speeding ticket, but I've exceeded the posted limit. I'm going to check the lasagna." When he wandered in a few minutes later. She was standing at the counter, slicing tomatoes. I harvested some tomatoes and basil from the greenhouse earlier. You've been busy. I like to be busy. I completed a contract a bit earlier than I projected, so I rewarded myself with gardening. And I had visitors. Is that so? Your mother and sisters. He was on the point of topping off her wine. Say what again? They were out this way. They'd had what your mother called a fancy ladies' lunch, and were going shopping and to drink frozen margaritas. They invited me to join them. Uh huh. Maya explained they essentially came by to check me out. I liked her honesty, though at the time it was somewhat unnerving. Brooks let out a sound that might have been a laugh. She can be. They had Plato with them. Bert enjoyed playing with him. I bet. They laugh a lot. Bert and Plato? No. And that made her laugh. Your mother and sisters. They seem very happy. They seem like friends as well as relatives. I'd say they are. We are. Your other sister, Sybil, has a kind and gentle way. You appear to have qualities of both your siblings. You also share a strong physical resemblance, particularly with Maya. Did Maya tell you embarrassing stories about me? No, though I would have been interested. I suspect she was more curious about me. She said when it came to women, to relationships, 
Abigail paused a moment as she layered slices of buffalo mozzarella with the tomatoes. In the past, you tended toward the looks without necessarily much substance to back it up. Brooks watched her as she spoke, as she perfected the pattern on the dish. I bet that's word for word. Paraphrasing can impart a different tenor, even a different meaning. Can't argue. Is it true? He considered, shrugged. I guess it is, now that I think about it. I think it's flattering. And it also spoke to the novelty she'd brought up that morning. Novelty wore off. What surprises me is they had you three to one and took no for an answer. I was obviously and honestly deeply involved with the garden. She picked up the wine now, drank. Your mother did, however, invite me to an impromptu backyard barbecue this Sunday. He laughed, lifted his glass in salute. See, they didn't take no for an answer. She hadn't considered that, and now saw Brooks was right. Your mother seemed to ignore my reasonable excuse to decline. I thought it might be better to write her a polite note of regret. Why? She makes great potato salad. I have my gardening and household chores on my schedule for Sunday. Chicken? I'm sure your mother makes very nice chicken, but no, you're a chicken. He made a clucking sound that deepened her frown and stirred her temper. There's no need to be rude. Sometimes honest is rude. Look, there's no reason to be nervous about hanging out in the backyard and eating potato salad. You'll have fun. No, I won't, because I'll have neglected my schedule. And I don't know how to behave at a backyard barbecue. I don't know how to have conversations with all those people I don't know or barely know, or how to meet the curiosity that would, I assume, be aimed at me because you and I have been having sex. That's a lot of don't knows, Brooks decided. But I can help you with all of it. I can give you a hand with the gardening and household chores beforehand. You do just fine with conversations, but I'll stick with you until you're comfortable. And they may be curious, but they're disposed to like you because I do, and my mother does. Plus, I'll make you a promise. He paused now, waited until she lifted her gaze to his. What promise? You give it an hour, and if you're not having a good time, I'll make an excuse. I'll say I've got a call I have to handle, and we'll go. You'd lie to your family? Yeah, I would. They'd know I'm lying and understand. There, she thought, one of the complications that tangled into social duties and interpersonal relationships. I think it's best to avoid all of that and just send a note of regret. She'll just come fetch you. That stopped her slicing again. That's not true. It's gospel, honey. She'll figure you're too shy or too stubborn. If she decides on shy, she'll mother you over there. If she decides on stubborn, she'll push you every mile from here to there. I'm not shy or stubborn. You're both, with some of that clucker tossed in. Deliberately, she brought the knife down on the board a little harder than necessary. I don't see the wisdom in insulting me when I'm preparing you a meal. I don't see being shy or stubborn as insulting. And everybody's got a little clucker pecking around, depending on the circumstances. What are your circumstances? That's a change of subject, but I'll give it to you. Semi-annual dentist visits, wolf spiders, and karaoke. Karaoke, that's funny. Not when I do it. Anyway, take my word. Give it an hour. An hour won't hurt you. I'll think about it. Good enough. I'm repeating myself from last night, but that sure smells good. Hopefully tonight will be more quiet and peaceful than last. It proved to be until shortly after 2 a.m. When her alarm sounded, 
She rolled out of bed, reaching for the gun on her nightstand, and gripped it before her feet hit the floor. Take it easy. Brooks's voice stayed utterly calm. Ease it down, Abigail. You too, he said to the dog, who poised at her feet, a low growl in his throat. Someone's coming. I got that. No, don't turn on the light. If it's somebody up to mischief, it's better if they don't know we know. I don't recognize this car, she said as she turned to the monitor. I do. Shit. His sigh was more fatigued than annoyed. It's Doyle Parsons, so that would be Justin Blake and his pal Chad Cartwright and Doyle. Let me get my pants on. I'll take care of it. There are only two people in the car. Brooks jerked on his pants, grabbed his shirt, shrugging into it as he walked back to study the monitor. Either Chad got some sense and stayed home, or they dropped him off to circle around the back. Since I don't credit them with that many smarts, I'd say Chad skipped the party. Firmly, Brooks laid a hand on her shoulder. It's not about you, Abigail. Relax. I don't relax when someone sneaks onto my property at two in the morning. It's not reasonable to expect me to relax. Good point. He took her arms, but loosely, rubbing his way up and down them. I'm just saying they're looking to cause me some grief, not you. Most likely creeping up here. See there, they're pulling off some ways from the house. Planning on slashing my tires, or maybe spray-painting some obscenities on my car. Figuring I'll get a rude surprise come morning. Jesus, high as hot air balloons, the both of them. If they're under the influence of drugs, they're unlikely to be rational. Rational isn't Justin's default position, straight or high. And coming here like this told Brooks he was escalating, as Tybal had been. Watching them, he took the time to button his shirt. Go on and call 911. Ash is on call tonight. You just give him the situation. I'll go out and see to it. He pulled on boots in case he had to chase them down, strapped on his weapon. You and Bert stay inside. I don't need or want to be protected from a pair of delinquents. Abigail, I'm the one with the badge. His tone brooked no argument. And I'm the one they're here to screw with. No point getting them riled up toward you. Call it in and wait for me. He went downstairs in the backwash of her outdoor security lights, taking his time. The bust would be clearer, stick harder, if he walked out on them doing something, or about to, rather than just creeping around, muffling the snorting giggles of the drunk and or high. Abigail would get her view of justice now, he thought, as the pair of them would spend the time until their trial in jail. He watched them through the window, and as he'd anticipated, they crouched beside his cruiser. Justin opened a bag, tossed a spray can to Doyle. He let them get started. The cruiser would need a paint job, but the evidence would be unarguable. Then he stepped to the front door, dealt with the locks, and walked out. You boys lost? Doyle dropped the can and fell back on his ass. Sorry to interrupt your field trip, but I believe the half-wit pair of you are trespassing. We'll add vandalism to that, and seeing as you've just vandalized police property, it's a tough one for you. And I'm just betting I could find controlled substances and or alcohol in your possession and in your bloodstream. To sum up, boys, you're royally fucked. Brooks shook his head when Doyle tried to scramble to his feet. You run, Doyle. I'll add on fleeing and resisting. I know where you live, you idiot, so stay down, stay put. Justin, you're going to want to let me see your hands. You want to see my hands? Justin punched the knife he held into the rear tire, then surged to his feet. Gonna let the air out of you next, asshole. Let me get this straight. You've got a knife. I've got a gun. See this? Brooks drew it almost casually. And I'm the asshole? Justin, you are deeply, deeply stupid. 
Now toss that knife down, then take a look at your marginally brighter friend. See how he's face down with his hands linked behind his head? Do that. In the security lights, Brooks noted Justin's pupils were the size of pinpricks. You're not going to shoot me. You haven't got the stomach for it. I think he does. With her favored Glock in her hand, Abigail stepped out from the side of the house. But if he doesn't shoot you, I will. Hiding behind a woman now, Gleason? Brooks shifted just a little, not only to block Abigail if Justin was stupid enough to come for them with the knife, but because he wasn't sure at all she wouldn't shoot the moron. Do I look like I'm hiding? I'd like to shoot him, Abigail said conversationally. He's trespassing, and he's armed, so I believe I'm within my rights. I could shoot him in the leg. I'm a very good shot, as you know. Abigail. Torn between amusement and concern, Brooks stepped forward. Drop that knife now, Justin, before this gets ugly. You're not putting me in jail. How many ways can you be wrong tonight? Brooks wondered. Justin lunged forward. Don't shoot him, for Christ's sake, Brooks shouted. He blocked the knife hand with his left arm, swung up his right elbow, and jabbed it into Justin's nose. He heard the satisfying crunch an instant before blood spurted. As the knife dropped, he simply gripped Justin by the collar, propelled him forward so he stumbled to his knees. Out of patience, he shoved Justin down on his face, put a boot on his neck. Abigail, do me a favor and go up and get my cuffs, will you? I have them. Brooks lifted his brows when she pulled them out of her back pocket. You're a planner. Toss them over. He caught them, knelt down to yank Justin's arms behind his back. Doyle, you keep still now or Ms. Lowry might shoot you in the leg. Yes, sir. I didn't know he was going to do that, I swear. We were just going to mess around with the cruiser, I swear to God. Keep quiet, Doyle, you're too stupid to talk. Brooks glanced up as he heard the siren. Jesus, what's he doing coming in hot? I saw the knife when I was relating the situation. Your deputy became very concerned. All right. Hell, Justin, you just came at a cop with a knife. That's assault with a deadly on a police officer. The prosecutor might even bump that to attempted murder when we add in the trash talk. You're done, boy, and it didn't have to go like this. You're under arrest for trespassing, vandalism, defacing police property, and assault with a deadly weapon on a police officer. You have the right to remain silent. You broke my fucking nose! I'll kill you for that! Do yourself a favor. Take that right to silence to heart. He finished the Miranda as he spotted the lights from Ash's cruiser zipping down the road. Doyle, where's Chad Cartwright? He wouldn't come. Said he was in enough trouble and his daddy's likely to kick his ass he gets in more. A glimmer of sanity. He got to his feet as Ash slammed out of his car. Chief, you all right? Jesus, you're bleeding. What? Where? Shit. Brooks looked down, hissed in disgust. That's Justin's nose blood. God damn it, I liked this shirt. You should soak it in cold water and salt. Both Brooks and his deputy looked over to where Abigail stood, the dog at full alert at her side. Ma'am, Ash said. Siren screamed out again. What the hell, Ash? It'll be Boyd. When Miss Lowry reported she saw a knife and only had a visual on two when this bunch usually runs in three, I thought I should call Boyd in for backup. Are you sure he didn't cut you? Yeah, I'm sure. He was stupid enough to try, so he's charged with assault on a police officer. I guess you and Boyd can take the pair of them in. I'll be along shortly. All right, Chief. Sorry for the trouble, Miss Lowry. You didn't cause it, Deputy Heiderman. Brooks stepped over to her. Why don't you take Bert and go on inside? I'll be in in just a couple minutes. Yes. She signaled to the dog and went back the way she'd come. 
In the kitchen, she rewarded Bert with one of his favorite cookies, then put on coffee. She considered a moment, then opened a container to put human cookies on a plate. Somehow, it seemed like the right thing to do. She sat at the table and watched Brooks and the others on the monitor. The boy he'd called Doyle cried a little, but she found she couldn't feel any sympathy. Justin remained sullen, snarling like a bad dog, in her opinion, sneering out of eyes she expected would be swollen and bruised from the broken nose shortly. Once the prisoners were secured in the back of the first deputy's cruiser, Brooks spoke to his men for another moment, then said something that made them laugh. Breaking the tension, she deduced. Yes, that would be a sign of a good leader. She started to rise and go unlock the front door, but saw Brooks head toward the back as she had. Instead, she walked over and poured his coffee, adding the sugar as he liked it. He stepped in, saw the plate. Cookies? I thought you might want something. I might. I've got to go in and deal with this. Yes, of course. He picked up his coffee, took a cookie. I don't have to ask if you're all right. Steady as a rock, right on through it. He's a stupid, violent boy, but we were never in any real danger. You might have been cut, which would have been upsetting. Was he right? Who and about what? Justin Blake. When he said you wouldn't shoot him. Biting into the cookie, Brooks leaned back in that easy way he had. Mostly. If I'd had to, yeah, but I didn't have to. Better all around. Would you have shot him? Yes. She didn't hesitate. I'd wondered if I could or would, as he's young and stupid. But yes, if he'd cut you, I would have. But you have excellent reflexes, and he telegraphed his move and was slow due, I suspect, to drugs or alcohol. You weren't afraid. You gave me a moment initially. I told you to stay inside, and I told you I didn't need or want to be protected. It's my property, and I was armed, as always. He took another bite of the cookie. Added to that, though nothing registered on the monitor, I wanted to be sure there wasn't a third who might have flanked you. I appreciate it. You should soak that shirt before the stain sets. I've got a spare at the station. Abigail, I'm going to need for you to give a statement. You can come in, or I can send one of my men to take it here. Oh, yes, of course. I couldn't give you the statement under the circumstances. No, I think I'd prefer to go in. I could do it now. Morning's fine. If I came in now, it would be done. I'd rather it be done. I'll change and drive in now. I can wait for you. That's all right. You should go now. Do what you need to do. Yeah. The way you handled this makes me think you've handled trouble before. I'm hoping you'll trust me enough to tell me about that some day soon. Wanting the link, she curled her fingers around his wrists for a moment. If I could tell anyone, it would be you. Okay then. He set the coffee down, took her face in his hands, and kissed her. Thanks for the backup, and the cookie. You're welcome. Thirty minutes behind Brooks, Abigail walked into the station. The older deputy, Boyd Fitzwater, she remembered, immediately got up from his desk and came around to meet her. Miss Lowry, we sure appreciate you coming in like this. The chief's in his office, talking to the prosecutor and all. I'm going to take your statement. Yes. You want some coffee? Something cold? No, thank you. We can sit down right here. Should be quiet. Ash is back with the paramedic we called in to treat the Blake boy's nose. He smiled when he said it. It's busted good. I'm sure a broken nose is preferable to a bullet. I believe Chief Gleason would have been justified in firing his weapon when Justin lunged toward him with the knife. I'm not going to argue, but if we could start this from the beginning, I'm going to record it so we get it all straight. I'll be taking notes too. All right with you?
Of course. All righty then. Boyd switched on a tape recorder, read off the date, the time, the names of all involved. Ms. Lowry, why don't you just tell me what happened tonight? At 2.07 a.m., my perimeter alarm signaled a breach. She spoke clearly, precisely. As Chief Gleason had indicated, Justin Blake most usually traveled with two individuals. I wanted to be certain there wasn't indeed a third man who might have circled around— my alarms didn't register, but I felt it best to be certain. After I spoke with Deputy Heiderman on the phone, I took my dog and went out the back of the house. My dog showed no sign of detecting anyone in that area, so I continued around to the front, where I saw Chief Gleason and the two trespassers. One, identified as Doyle Parsons, was already on the ground, and Justin Blake continued to crouch by the left rear tire of Chief Gleason's police cruiser. Did you hear anybody say anything? Oh, yes, quite clearly. It was a quiet night. Chief Gleason said to Justin, You're going to want to show me your hands. I should add that at this time Chief Gleason's weapon was secured in his holster. Justin responded, You want to see my hands? And drove the knife he held in his right hand into the left rear tire. She continued, giving Boyd a word-for-word, move-by-move statement. Boyd interrupted once or twice to clarify. That's really detailed. I have an eidetic memory. You might call it photographic, she added, though it always irked her to explain with that inaccuracy. That's really helpful, Miss Lowry. I hope so. He would have killed Brooks if he could have. Though he reached over to turn off the tape recorder, Boyd lifted his hand from it, sat back. Ma'am? Justin Blake. He would have stabbed Chief Gleason, and he would have killed him if he could have. His intent was very clear, as was his anger and, I think, his fear. It's what he knows, you see. To hurt or eliminate what gets in his way, what interferes. There are people who simply believe their own wants and wishes are above everything and everyone else. She'd seen murder she thought. The boy didn't remind her of the cold, mechanical Korotki. He lacked that efficiency and dispassion. But he'd made her think of Ilya, of the hot rage on Ilya's face when he'd cursed and kicked his dead cousin. He might not have killed or caused serious physical harm before tonight. I think if he had, he wouldn't have been so inept at this attempt. But if it hadn't been this, tonight, it would have been someone else, another night, someone without Chief Gleason's resources, reflexes, and equanimity. There would have been more to clean up than a broken nose. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. It was upsetting, more than I realized. My opinion isn't relevant. If that's all you need, I'd like to go home. I can get somebody to drive you. No, I'm fine to drive. Thank you, Deputy. You've been very kind. She started for the door, paused when Brooks called her name. He crossed over, laid a hand on her arm. Be a minute, he told Boyd, then led her outside. Are you okay? Yes, I told you. And you just told Boyd it was more upsetting than you realized. It was, but that doesn't mean I'm not all right. I am tired, though. I think I'll go home and get some more sleep. Good. I'll call or swing by later, just to see how you are. You can't worry about me. I don't need it. Didn't want it, any more than she wanted Justin Blake to remind her of Ilya Volkov. Did you soak your shirt? Cold water and salt? I trashed it. I'd see his blood on there whether it was there or not. I don't much care for that shirt anymore. She thought of a pretty sweater. Stained with blood. I understand. You're tired, too. She let herself touch his face. I hope you can get a little sleep. I wouldn't mind it. You drive safe, Abigail. He kissed her forehead, then her lips, before stepping over to open her car door. You were right, what you said in there. 
It was only a matter of time before he pulled a knife or a gun, picked up a bat, before he did somebody serious harm. I know. You don't have to worry about him anymore. Then I won't. Leading with emotion, she threw her arms around him, held tight. I'm very glad you have good reflexes. She slid into the car and drove away. Chapter 20 Just past three that afternoon, Abigail watched on her monitor as a dark Mercedes sedan cruised toward her house. The look of it sent a quick tingle up her spine. She didn't recognize the car, the driver, late thirties, early forties, broad shoulders, short, dark hair, or the passenger, fifty-ish, dark gray hair, wide face. She keyed the license plate into her system, reminding herself she was prepared for anything. Her quick search through DMV records popped Lincoln Blake as the owner, and her shoulders relaxed. An annoying interruption, but not a threat. Blake looked prosperous, she noted, when he got out of the passenger side. It struck her that he looked deliberately prosperous in his perfectly cut suit and city shoes. The second man also wore a suit and carried a briefcase. She believed she saw a slight bulge on his right hip that disturbed the line of his jacket. He carried a weapon. Well, she thought, so did she. She considered ignoring the knock on her door. She wasn't under any obligation to answer, to speak with the father of the boy who'd tried to kill Brooks. But she also considered the fact that a man like Blake, from everything she'd heard and intuited about him, wouldn't simply walk away. In any case, she was a little curious. With Bert at her side, she opened the front door. Ms. Lowry... Blake offered a wide smile and his hand. Forgive the intrusion. I'm Lincoln Blake, one of your neighbors. Your home is several miles away, in fact, on the other side of Bickford. Therefore, you don't live close enough to my property to be considered a neighbor. We're all neighbors here, Blake said jovially. This is my personal assistant, Mark. I'd like to apologize for my son's inadvertent trespass on your property last night. May we come in, discuss this situation? No. It always puzzled her why people looked so surprised, even annoyed, when they asked a question and the response was negative. Now, Miss Lowry, I came out here to offer my apologies, as I understand my son caused you some inconvenience, and to sort this all out. It'll be helpful if we could be comfortable while we talk this out. I'm comfortable. Thank you for your apology, Mr. Blake, though it hardly applies, as it was your son who came on my property without permission in the middle of the night and who attempted to stab Chief Gleason. I believe the police are sorting all this out, and we really don't have anything to discuss at this point. Now, that's just why I came by. I dislike trying to have a conversation through a doorway. I dislike having strangers in my house. I'd like you to go now. You can discuss this with the police. I'm not finished. He jabbed out a finger. I understand you're friendly with Brooks Gleason, and that, yes, we are friendly. He wouldn't have been here at two in the morning when your son and your son's friend came illegally onto my property with the intent to deface Chief Gleason's police cruiser if we weren't friendly. However, my relationship with Chief Gleason doesn't alter the facts. One fact is, you haven't lived here long. You're not fully aware of my position in this community or the history behind it. She wondered, sincerely, why he thought any of that was relevant, but didn't bother to ask. I'm aware, and your position and history don't alter the facts of what transpired here early this morning. It was very disturbing to be awakened in that manner, and to witness your son attack Chief Gleason with a knife. Fact. Blake slapped an index finger on his open palm. 
It was the middle of the night, and therefore dark. I have no doubt Brooks Gleason goaded my boy, threatened him. Justin was simply defending himself. That's inaccurate, Abigail said calmly. My security lights were on. I have excellent vision and was less than ten feet away during the attempted assault. Chief Gleason clearly asked your son to show his hands, and when your son did so, it was, first, to puncture the cruiser's tire, and, second, to threaten Brooks with the knife. My son! I haven't finished correcting your inaccuracies, she pointed out, and stunned Blake into momentary silence. Only then, when your son threatened him verbally and with gestures, did Brooks draw his weapon, and still your son would not drop the knife. Instead, even when I stepped out with my own weapon, your son lunged at Brooks with the knife. In my opinion, Brooks would have been fully justified in shooting your son at that time, but he chose to disarm him hand-to-hand -hand at a greater risk to his own safety. Nobody knows you around here. You're an odd, solitary woman with no background or history in the community. If and when you tell that ridiculous story in court, my lawyers will rip your testimony to bits and humiliate you. I don't think so, but I'm sure your lawyers will do their jobs. If that's all, I'd like you to leave. You just wait a damn minute. Blake stepped forward, and Bert quivered, growled. You're upsetting my dog, Abigail said coldly and if your assistant attempts to draw his sidearm, I'll release my dog. I can assure you he'll move faster than he can draw his weapon. I'm also armed, as you can plainly see. I'm a very good shot. I don't like strangers coming to my home trying to intimidate and threaten me. I don't like men who raise violent, angry young men. Like Sergei Volkov, she thought. I don't like you, Mr. Blake, and I'll ask you to leave for the last time. I came here to settle this with you, to apologize and offer you compensation for the inconvenience. Compensation? Ten thousand dollars. A generous apology for a mishap, for a misunderstanding. It certainly would be, Abigail agreed. The money's yours, in cash, for your agreement that this was indeed a misunderstanding. Your proposal is I accept $10,000 in cash from you to misrepresent what happened here this morning. Don't be stubborn. My proposal is you accept the cash in my assistant's briefcase as an apology, and you simply agree what occurred here was a misunderstanding. You'll also have my word that my son will never step foot on your property again. First, your word can hardly regulate your son's behavior. Second, it would be your son, not you, who owes me an apology for this morning. And last, your proposal constitutes a bribe, an exchange of money for my misrepresenting the facts. I believe attempting to bribe a witness in a criminal investigation is a crime. The simplest solution, and certainly the best outcome for you, is for me to say, no thank you, and goodbye. She stepped back, shut the door, clicked the locks in place. He actually beat on the door with his fist. It didn't surprise her, Abigail realized. His son had inherited that same unstable temperament and illusion of entitlement. With her hand resting lightly on the butt of her gun, she walked back to the kitchen monitor, watched the assistant attempt to calm his employer down. She didn't want to call the police, more trouble, more interruptions, more ugly behavior. It had shaken her a little. There was no shame in admitting it. But she'd stood up to the intimidation, the threats. No panic, she thought now, no urge to run. She didn't believe in fate, in anything being meant. But if she did, maybe, theoretically, she'd been meant to go through these two experiences the reminder of Ilya, and now of his father, to prove to herself she could and would stand up. 
she wouldn't run again. If she believed in fate. We'll give him two minutes, from now, to regain some composure and leave. If he doesn't, we'll go out again. But this time, she determined, her weapon would be in her hand, not in her holster. As she meant it literally, she set the timer on her watch and continued to observe him on the monitor. His blood pressure must be at dangerous levels, she thought, as his face darkened, his eyes literally bulged. She could see the rapid rise and fall of his prosperous chest as he shouted at his assistant. She hoped she wouldn't have to call for medical assistance as well as the authorities. All she wanted to do was finish her work and spend a little time working in her gardens. This man's difficulties weren't hers. At the one minute, forty-two second mark, Blake stormed back to the car. Abigail let out a small sigh of relief as the assistant made the three-quarter turn and drove away. All these years, she thought. Was it irony she was once again a witness to a crime and once again the subject of threats and intimidation? No, she didn't believe in fate. And yet, it certainly felt as though fate had decided to twist her life and circle it right back to where she'd begun. It was something to think about. She looked at her work, sighed again. I think we'll take a walk, she said to Bert. I'm too annoyed to work right now. Her mood leveled out in the air, calmed when she walked through the trees, studied the progress of wildflowers, considered again her private seating area with its view of the hills. She would start a search for the proper bench very soon. She felt happy, she realized, when she received a text from Brooks. How about I pick up some Chinese? Don't cook. You're probably tired. She considered, texted back. I'm not tired, but I like Chinese food. Thank you. Moments later, she got another text. You're welcome. It made her laugh, picked up her mood a few more notches. Since she was already out, she gave Bert a full hour of exercise then went back home to work with a clear mind. She lost track of time, a rarity for her, and was prepared to be annoyed when her alarm beeped again. If that disagreeable man had come back, she wouldn't be so polite, she determined. Her mood shifted yet again when she saw Brooks's cruiser. A check of the time showed her she'd worked past six. No gardening today, she thought, and put the lack of that pleasure on the head of the disagreeable man and his stony-faced assistant. But she shut down and went to the door happy, again, at the prospect of having dinner with Brooks. Her smile of greeting turned to concern when she saw his face. You didn't sleep. We had a lot going on. You look very tired. Here, let me take some of that. You brought a great deal of food for two people. You know what they say about Chinese food. It's not really true. You won't be hungry an hour later if you eat properly. I see you brought Pijin to go with it. I did. Chinese beer, she said as she led the way in. Chinese villagers brewed beer as far back as 7000 BC. I don't think the Zhu Jiang I picked up is that old. That's a joke. It was used, not the beer you bought, in rituals. It wasn't until the 17th century that modern beer brewing was introduced to China. Good to know. You sound tired, too. You should sit. Have one of the beers. I slept another two hours and had an hour's walk. I feel rested. I'll take care of the food. I just told them to load me up. I didn't know what you wanted, especially. I'm not fussy. She opened cartons. I'm sorry you had a difficult day. You can tell me about it if you like. Lawyers, arguments, accusations, threats. He opened a beer, sat at her counter. Paperwork, meetings. You don't have to put all that in bowls. The beauty of Chinese is you can eat right out of the carton. Which is rushed and less soothing. 
She believed he required soothing. I can fix your plate if you tell me what you'd like. Whatever. I'm not fussy either. We should take a walk after dinner. Then you should try a warm bath and try to sleep. You seem very tense, and you rarely are. I guess I'm just annoyed at having lawyers in my face who try to push and intimidate me and my deputies. Yes, he's a very annoying man. She scooped rice out of the bowl, ladled sweet and sour pork over it, added a dumpling, some noodles, some butterfly shrimp. I had to walk off my own mood after he left this afternoon. Left? Here? Blake came here? This afternoon, with his assistant, ostensibly to apologize for his son's inadvertent trespassing, but that was just a ruse, not well disguised. He was displeased when I wouldn't let him come in to discuss the situation. I bet he was. He doesn't like being refused. It's good you didn't open the door. I did open the door, but wouldn't invite him in. She decided she'd try the beer straight out of the bottle, as Brooks did. Are you aware his assistant carries a gun? Yeah. Are you telling me he pulled a weapon on you? Oh, no, no, don't be upset. She'd meant to soothe and had accomplished the opposite. Of course he didn't. I just noticed the line of his suit and then his body language when Bert growled. Brooks took a long pull of beer. Why don't you tell me what was said and done? You're upset, she murmured. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Yes, you should have. It wasn't anything important, really. He said he'd come to apologize, then was clearly put out when I refused to invite them in. He termed what happened a misunderstanding and indicated it was of your doing. I disabused him of that, as I was a witness. He implied I didn't understand his position in the community and that my relationship with you made my standing as witness suspicious. Not in those words, but that was the meaning. Do you want me to relay the exact conversation? Not just yet. The gist is fine. The gist? All right. He was displeased and angry as I told him to leave, and warned him and his assistant that if the assistant drew his weapon on Bert, I would release Bert, who would disarm the assistant handily, and reminded them I was also armed. Jesus Christ. I was, clearly. It seemed best to point out the obvious— Mr. Blake reiterated he'd come to apologize and added he'd come to offer compensation in the amount of $10,000 if I accepted it and agreed that what had happened was a misunderstanding. It annoyed me. How many times did you ask them to leave? Three. I didn't bother to ask again, simply said goodbye and closed the door. He did bang on the door for nearly two minutes after that. He's very rude. Then his assistant convinced him to get back in the car. Brooks pushed back from the counter, paced the kitchen. Why didn't you call me? There wasn't any need. It was relatively simple to deal with. Irritating, but simple. I... She broke off because when he turned to her, the controlled rage on his face snapped her throat closed. Listen to me. Two men you don't know come to your door. One of them's armed. They refuse to leave when you tell them to multiple times. What's the logical thing to do? Close the door. I did. No, Abigail. The logical thing to do is close the door, then call the police. I don't agree. I'm sorry if that makes you angry, but I don't. They left. She decided to avoid more anger by not mentioning she'd intended to go back out, weapon drawn, at the two-minute mark. Later, she'd wonder if the avoidance equaled one of those interpersonal relationship tangles. I was armed, Brooks, and Bert was on alert. I wasn't in any danger. In fact, Blake became so agitated I would have called both you and medical assistance if he hadn't left when he did. Do you want to press charges? No. You're angry with me. I don't want you to be angry with me. I did exactly as I felt best at that time under those circumstances. If your ego's threatened because I didn't call for help, maybe some, yeah, I'll own that, 
And I'm not going to say it's not a relief to me knowing I'm with a woman who can handle herself. But I know Blake. He tried to bully and intimidate you. Yes, he tried. He failed. Trying's enough. And he attempted to bribe you. I told him his attempt to bribe a witness in a criminal matter was illegal. I bet you did. Brooks shoved a hand through his hair, sat again. You don't know him. You don't know the kind of enemy you made today, and believe me, you made one. I think I do know, she said quietly. I think I know very well. But making him an enemy isn't my fault or yours. Maybe not, but it's what it is. You're going to confront him over it. You're damn right I am. Won't that just increase the level of animosity? Maybe, but if I don't deal with it, he'll see it as a weak spot. He could come back, try again, figuring you didn't mention it, or just angling for a bigger payoff. I made my position very clear. If you understand the kind of person you're dealing with, you'll realize that it doesn't matter a damn. Twelve years of running, she thought. Yes, she understood. You're right, but it mattered to me on a very personal level that I made my position clear. Okay, that's done. Now I'm telling you, if he comes back, don't open the door to him. Call me. Subjugate my ego to yours. No. Maybe. Shit, I don't know about that part and don't much care. She smiled a little. That would be another discussion. The way he took a breath told her he was trying to cool his temper. I'm telling you, because he'll only be more intimidating and bullying if he comes back. I'm telling you because I want him to understand action will be taken if he tries to harass you or anyone else. I asked the same of Russ, his wife, his parents, told my deputies to tell their families. She nodded, felt less annoyed. I see. He's in a rage, Abigail. His money and his position, as he sees it, aren't making this one go away. His son's behind bars, and very likely to be behind them for a very long time. He loves his son. I don't know about that either, honest to God. But I know his ego's bound up in it. Nobody's going to put his boy in jail. Nobody's going to sully the Blake name. He's going to put everything he's got into fighting this. And if that means pushing at you, he'll push. I'm not afraid of him. It also matters to me I'm not afraid of him. I can see that. I don't want you to be afraid, but I want you to call me if he comes here again, if he tries to talk to you on the street, if he or anybody associated with him contacts you in any way. You're a witness, and you're damn well under my protection. Don't say that. Her heart literally skipped. I don't want to be under anyone's protection. It is what it is. No, no, no. Now panic spurted, fast and hot. I'll contact you if he comes here again, because it's unethical for him to try to influence me to lie, and it's illegal for him to bribe me to lie. But I don't want or need protection. Calm down now. I'm responsible for myself. I can't be with you if you don't understand and agree. I'm responsible for myself. She'd taken several steps back, and the dog had ranged himself in front of her. Abigail, you may be, you are, as far as I can tell, capable of handling most anything that comes at you. But I'm duty-bound to protect everybody within my jurisdiction. That includes you. And I don't like you using my feeling for you as a weapon to get your own way. I'm not doing that. You damn well are. I'm not... She broke off, searched for calm, for sense. It's not what I meant to do. I apologize. Screw apologize. Don't ever use what I feel as a hammer. You're so angry with me. I didn't mean to use your feelings. I didn't. 
I'm clumsy in this kind of situation. I've never been in this kind of situation. I don't know what to do, what to say, or how to say it. I just don't want you to feel particular responsibility for me. I don't know how to explain how uneasy it would make me if you did. Why don't you try? You're angry and tired and your dinner's gone cold. It appalled her to feel tears running down her cheeks. I never meant for any of this to happen. I never thought you'd be so upset about Blake. I'm not doing the right thing, but I don't know what is. I don't mean to cry. I know tears are another weapon, and I don't mean them as one. I know you don't. I'll warm up the food. It's fine. He rose, got a fork from the drawer, then sat again. Fine, he repeated after he'd scooped some up, sampled. You should use the chopsticks. Never got the hang of them. I could teach you. I'll take you up on that some other time. Sit down and eat. I... You're still angry. You're pushing it down because I cried. So the tears are a weapon. Yeah, I'm angry and pushing it down some because you're crying and obviously torn up about things you won't tell me or feel you can't. I'm pushing it down some because I'm in love with you. The tears she'd nearly had under control flooded back, hot and fast as the panic. On a sob, she stumbled to the door, fought the locks open, rushed out. Abigail! Don't! Don't! I don't know what to do! I need to think, to find some composure! You should go until I can speak rationally! Do you think I'd leave you alone when you're twisted up like this? I tell you I love you and it feels like I broke your heart. She turned, her hand fisted over her heart, her eyes drenched with tears and emotion. No one ever said that to me. In my life, no one's ever said those words to me. I'm making you a promise right here that you'll hear them from me every day. No, no, don't promise, don't. I don't know what I'm feeling. How do I know it's not just hearing those words? It's overwhelming to hear them, to look at you and to see you mean them. Or it seems you do. How do I know? You can't know everything. Sometimes you have to trust. Sometimes you have to just feel. I want it. She kept her hand clutched over her heart, as if opening her fingers would allow it all to fly away. I want it more than I can stand. Then take it. It's right here. It's not right. It's not fair to you. You don't understand. You can't. Abigail, that's not even my name. She slapped a hand over her mouth, sobbed against it. He only stepped to her, brushed tears from her cheek. I know. Every ounce of color draining, she stumbled back, gripped the porch rail. How could you know? You're running or hiding from something or someone, maybe some of both. You're too damn smart to run and hide under your real name. I like Abigail, but I've known it's not who you are right along. The name's not the issue. You're trusting me enough to tell me is. And it looks like we're getting there. Does anyone else know? Scares the hell out of you. I don't like that. I don't see why anyone else would know or care. Have you let anyone else get as close as you've let me? No, never. Look at me now. He spoke quietly as he moved to her. Listen to me. I am. I'm going to tell you I won't let you down. You're going to come to believe that, and we'll go from there. Let's try this part again. I'm in love with you. He eased her into a kiss, kept it soft until she'd stopped trembling. There, that wasn't so hard. 
You're in love with me. I can see it and I can feel it. Why don't you try the words? I don't know. I want to know. Just try them out. See how it feels. I won't hold you to it. I. I'm in love with you. Oh, God. She closed her eyes. It feels real. Say it again and kiss me. I'm in love with you. She didn't ease in, but flung herself, starving for that knowledge, the gift, the light of it. Love, being loved, giving it. She hadn't believed in love. She hadn't believed in miracles. Yet here was love. Here was her miracle. I don't know what to do now. We're doing fine. She breathed in, out. Even that felt different, freer, fuller. I want to heat up the food. I want to teach you how to use chopsticks and have dinner with you. Can we do that? Can we just be for a while? Sure we can. If she needed a little time, he could give it. But I'm not promising anything on the chopsticks. You changed everything. Good or bad. She held on another minute. I don't know. But you changed it. Chapter 21 Dealing with the meal settled her down, the simplicity and routine. He didn't pressure her for more. That, she understood, was his skill and his weapon. He knew how to wait. And he knew how to change the tone, to give her room, to help her relax, so her thoughts weren't tied up in knots of tension. His clumsiness with the chopsticks, though she suspected at least some of it was deliberate, made her laugh. She'd laughed more since he'd come into her life than she had in the whole of it before him. That alone might be worth the risk. She could refuse it, ask for more time. He would give it to her, and she could use it to research another location, another identity, make plans to run again. And if she ran again, she'd never know what might have been. She'd never feel what she felt now with him. She'd never again allow herself to try. She could, would, find contentment, security, she had before. But she'd never know love. Her choice was to take the rational route, leave, stay safe. Or to risk it all, that safety, her freedom, even her life for love. Can we walk? she asked him. Sure. I know you're tired, she began as they stepped outside. We should wait to talk about everything. Tomorrow's as good as today. I don't know if I'll have the courage tomorrow. Then tell me what you're afraid of. So many things. But now, most of all, that if I tell you everything, you won't feel the same about me. And for me. Brooks reached down, picked up a stick, threw it. Bert looked at Abigail, got her signal, and chased after it. Love doesn't turn on and off like a light switch. I don't know. I've never been in love. I'm afraid to lose it, and you. And this, all of this. You have a duty... But more, you have a code. I knew a man like you, more like you than I realized at first. He died protecting me. From whom? It's complicated. Okay. Did he love you? Not the way I think you mean. It wasn't romantic or sexual. It was duty. But he cared about me beyond that. He was the first person who cared for me. She pressed a hand to her heart. Not for what I represented or what I accomplished or what I was expected to be, but who I was. You said you don't know who your father was, so not your father. A cop? Duty. 
Were you in witness protection, Abigail? Her hand trembled. Did he see it or just sense it, she wondered. But he took it in his, warmed and stilled it. I was being protected. I would have been given a new identity, a new life, but... It all went very wrong. How long ago? I was sixteen. Sixteen? I turned seventeen on the day... John's blood on her hands. I'm not telling you the way I should. I never even imagined telling anyone. Why don't you tell me the beginning? I'm not sure where it is. Maybe it was when I realized I didn't want to be a doctor, and I knew that for certain in my first semester of pre-med. After things went very wrong? No, I'd completed pre-med, the requirement for medical school, by then. If I'd continued, per my mother's agenda, I'd have continued into medical school the next fall. You said you were sixteen. Yes, I'm very smart. I took accelerated courses throughout my education. My first term at Harvard, I lived with a family she selected. They were very strict. She paid them to be. Then I had one term on my own, in a dorm, but carefully supervised. I think my rebellion started the day I bought my first pair of jeans and a hoodie. It was thrilling. Back up. You were, at sixteen, in Harvard, in pre-med, and bought your first pair of jeans? My mother bought or supervised the acquiring of my wardrobe. Because it still seemed huge to her, she smiled. It was horrible. You wouldn't have looked at me. I wanted so much to be like the other girls. I wanted to talk on the phone and text about boys. I wanted to look the way girls my age looked. And God, God, I didn't want to be a doctor. I wanted to apply to the FBI, to work in their cyber crimes unit. I should have figured, he murmured. I monitored courses, studied online. If she'd known, I don't know what she would have done. She stopped at the view where she'd wanted a bench and wondered if she'd ever have reason to buy one now, now that it was too late to stop in the telling. She'd promised me the summer off from studies, a trip, a week in New York, then the beach. She'd promised, and that had gotten me through the last term. But she'd made arrangements for me to participate in one of her associate's summer programs, intense study, lab work. It would have looked well on my record, accelerated my degree. And I, for the first time in my life, defied her. About damn time. Maybe, but it started a terrible chain of events. She was packing, she was covering for another associate and keynoting at a conference. She'd be gone a week, and we argued. No, not accurate. Annoyed with herself, Abigail shook her head. At such times, accuracy was vital. She didn't argue. There was simply her way, and she had no doubt I'd fall in line. She concluded my behavior, my demands, my attitude, was a normal phase. I'm sure she noted it down for my files. And she left me. The cook had been given two weeks off, so I was alone in the house. She left without a word while I was sulking in my room. I don't know why I was so shocked she'd leave that way, but I was sincerely shocked. Then I was angry, and maybe exhilarated. I took her car keys and I drove to the mall. To the mall. It sounds so silly, doesn't it? My first real taste of freedom and I went to the mall. But I had a fantasy about roaming the mall with a pack of girlfriends, giggling about boys, helping each other try on clothes. And I ran into Julie. We'd gone to school together for a while. She was a year or so older and so popular, so pretty. I think she spoke to me that day because she'd broken up with her boyfriend and was at loose ends. Everything just happened from there. She told him about shopping, how it made her feel, about the hair dye, the plans to make fake IDs and go to the club. 
That's a lot of teenage rebellion in one day. I think it was stored up. I bet. You could make passable IDs at sixteen. Excellent ones. I was very interested in identity theft and cyber crimes. I believed I'd have a career as an investigator. It wouldn't surprise me. It's flattering you'd say so. It mattered so much once. That day in the mall, I took Julie's picture and I took my own later. I cut my hair and I dyed it black, very black, and I bought makeup, used it the way Julie showed me, and I'd studied the other girls in college, so I knew how to apply it. Hold on a minute. I'm trying to picture you with short black hair. He studied her, narrowed his eyes. A little goth, a little funky. I'm not sure, but I looked very different from the way my mother wanted me to look. I suppose that was the point. Sure, it was. And the other point is, you were entitled to it. Every kid is. Maybe that's true. I should have stopped there. It should have been enough. The clothes, the hair, and makeup. And the program she'd assigned me to started that Monday, and I'd made up my mind not to go. She would have been furious, and that should have been enough. But I didn't stop there. You were on a roll, he commented. You created the fake IDs and got into a club. Yes, Julie picked the club. I didn't know anything about them, but I looked up the one she wanted, so I knew it was owned by a family rumored, known really, to be Russian mafia, the Volkovs. Rings a dim bell. We didn't deal with the Russians as a rule in Little Rock. Some Irish, some Italian mob types. Sergei Volkov was, is, the Pakan, the boss of the Volkov Bratva. He and his brother owned the club. I learned later it was run primarily by Sergei's son Ilya. His cousin Alexei worked there, ostensibly. Primarily, again, I learned later. Alexei drank there, did drugs and women there. I didn't know or understand any of that when we met him. We drank Cosmopolitans, Julie and I. They were popular because of the television show Sex and the City. We drank and danced, and it was the most exciting night of my life. And Alexei Gorievich came to our table. She told him everything. How the club had looked to her, sounded. How Ilya had come. How he'd looked at her, talked to her. How she'd been kissed for the first time in her life, and by a Russian gangster. We were so young and so foolish. She continued, "I didn't want to go to Alexei's house, but I didn't know how not to go. I felt ill, and when Ilya had to stay back, promising to meet us later." It was worse. Alexei's house wasn't far from my mother's, really. I imagined just going home, lying down. I'd never been drunk before. It had stopped being pleasant. It'll do that. Did you ever, when you were a teenager? Russ and I got drunk and sick together a few times before we hit the legal age, and a few times after. It was my first and last time, and I've never had another cosmopolitan. Even looking at them makes me vaguely ill, and a little afraid. She admitted to herself. He had a beautiful home with a river view, furnished with too much deliberation. I thought too consciously trendy. He made more drinks, put on music, but I felt ill. And I used the bathroom off the kitchen to be sick, sicker than I'd ever been in my life. All I wanted to do was curl up on the floor and die. Yes, yes. She laughed a little. I suppose it's something a lot of people experience at least once. I still didn't feel well when I came out, and I saw Julie and Alexei were having sex on the sofa. I was fascinated and horrified at the same time, and so embarrassed. I went out through the kitchen to the terrace. It felt better in the air. 
I sat on a chair and fell asleep. And the voices woke me. You're cold. Because she'd started to shiver, Brooks put an arm around her shoulders. I was cold that night, with the breeze off the water, or the sickness, or with what happened next. This feels the same. I'd like to walk back. It may be easier to tell you when we're walking. Okay. I planned to put a bench here, something organic, something that looks like it just grew here. I like the view, and it's so quiet, with just the stream gurgling and the birds. See how Bert likes to play in the water? It feels like it's all mine. Silly. It's not. Silly, she repeated in her head. That night, I looked through the glass of the sliding doors, and I saw two men with Alexei. I didn't see Julie. They were speaking Russian at first, but I'd studied Russian. I like languages, and I have an aptitude for them. I understood. The man, his name was Korotki, Yakov Korotki, accused Alexei of taking money from the family. They argued, and at first Alexei was very arrogant. But that didn't last. They said he'd informed to the police because he'd been arrested for drugs. The other man, he was big, forced Alexei to his knees, and Alexei became afraid. He tried to bargain, to threaten, then to beg. Would you hold my hand? He took it, squeezed gently. Stop when you need to stop. It needs to be finished. Korotki shot him once, then twice at the temple. He shot him the way you might start your car or put on your shirt. An ordinary thing. Then Julie came out. She wasn't dressed. She'd been sick. She barely spoke, barely saw, and Korotki shot her. Like a reflex, like you swat at a gnat. God. God. Here now, lean on me. He released her hand, but only to wrap an arm around her tuck her in as they walked. He was angry, though, Karatki, because he hadn't known she was there, because his information hadn't included her. Or me. They didn't know about me, huddled outside the sliding door, frozen, just frozen. She shouldn't have come outside, Abigail thought. Her legs didn't feel steady, and her stomach had begun to churn. She wished she could sit, Wished she couldn't still see and hear and feel it all so clearly. That's enough now, Brooks murmured. Let's get you back inside. Ilya came. He'd kissed me, my first. He was so beautiful and he'd kissed me and made me feel like I was real. I don't think I'd ever felt quite real. Except when I'd bought the jeans and the hoodie, then when I dyed my hair. Then, when Ilya Volkov kissed me. That's not relevant. Yes, it is. He came in, and he was angry. Not that his cousin had been murdered, but because Korotki was supposed to assassinate Alexei the next night. And I knew the man, the first man who'd kissed me, would kill me. He knew I was there, and they'd find me and kill me. He cursed Alexei. He kicked him and kicked him. He was already dead, but Ilya was so angry, he kicked him. I saw that in Justin Blake last night. I saw what I saw in Ilya in him. It's more terrifying than any weapon. She smelled her garden now, just a hint of it, spice and sweet on the air. It comforted as much as Brooks's arm around her. So I ran. I'd taken off my new shoes, but I didn't think of that. I ran without paying attention to where. Just blind terror, running, sure they'd catch me and kill me because I'd defied my mother, done what I wanted to do, and Julie was dead. She was just eighteen. All right, it's all right now. It's not all right, and not all. It's not nearly all. I fell and my purse flew out of my hand. I didn't even know I still had it. My phone was in my purse. I called the police. They came, the police, and found me. 
I told them what happened. I talked to two detectives. They were kind to me. Detectives Griffith and Riley, they helped me. Okay, give me your keys. My keys? We'll go inside now. I need your keys. She fished them out, handed them to him. They took me to a house, a safe house. They stayed with me. And then John came. Deputy U.S. Marshal John Barrow and Deputy U.S. Marshal Teresa Norton. You're like him, like John, patient, insightful, and kind. We're going to sit down. I'm going to start a fire, make you some tea. It's too late in the season for a fire. I want a fire, okay? Of course. She sat obediently. I feel a little strange. Just sit there. Rest a little till I'm done. They called my mother. She came back. She didn't want me to testify or to stay in the safe house the marshals had waiting or to go into witness protection. She was worried about you, Brooke said as he set the kindling. No, she wanted me to start the summer project, to go back to Harvard, to be the youngest neurosurgeon ever on staff at Chicago's Silva Memorial Hospital. I was ruining her agenda and she'd gone to so much time and effort. When I wouldn't go with her, she walked out, as she had the day it all began. I've never spoken to her again. Brooke sat back on his heels. She doesn't deserve a word, not one word from you. He struck a match to the paper he'd crumbled, watched it flame up, catch the kindling. He felt like that, he realized ready to flash and burn. That was the last thing she needed. I'm going to make that tea. Just rest for a few minutes. I want to tell you all of it. You will, but you take a break now. Are you going to call the marshals? The FBI? Abigail! He took her face in his hands. I'm going to make you tea. Trust me. He wanted to strike something, break something to pieces, to punch his fist into something hard that would bloody it. She'd been abused as surely as if she'd been found with bruises and broken bones by a mother who could walk away from a traumatized, terrified child. He put the kettle on. She needed to get warm again, feel safe and quiet again. He'd needed to know what she told him. But he wished he'd let it go, let it slide away from both of them. Still, as the kettle heated, he took out his notebook, wrote down all the names she'd given him, then tucked the notebook away again, made her tea. She sat very straight on the couch, very pale and very straight, her eyes shadowed. Thank you. He sat beside her. I need to say some things to you before you go on with this. She stared into her tea, braced. All right. None of this was your fault. Her lips quivered before she firmed them. I have some responsibility. I was young, yes, but no one forced me to make the IDs or go to the club. That's just bullshit because neither of those things make you responsible for what happened after. Your mother's a monster. Her head snapped up. Her shadowed eyes went huge. My, that, she? Worse. She's a fucking robot, and she tried to make you one, too. She let you know from the get-go she'd created you to her specs. So you're smart and beautiful and healthy, and you owe her for that. More bullshit. My genetic makeup, shut up, I'm not done. She made you dress as she wanted, made you study what she wanted, and all lay odds made you associate with people she chose, read what she chose, ate what she de-fucking-creed. Am I wrong? Abigail could only shake her head. She may never have raised her hand to you, may have kept you clothed, fed, with a nice roof over your head. But honey, you were abused for the first 16 years of your life. A lot of kids would have run away or worse. 
You cut your hair and snuck into a club. You want to blame somebody other than the shooter and his boss for what happened? Blame her. But have you ever had any therapy? I'm not crazy. No, you're not. I'm just asking. I was in therapy as long as I remember until I left home. She engaged one of the top child therapists in Chicago. You never had any choice on that either. No, Abigail said with a sigh. No, choices weren't on her agenda. He took her face, laid his lips on hers. You're a miracle, Abigail. That you could come from something that cold-blooded, that cold-hearted, and be who and what you are. You remember that. You can tell me the rest when you're ready. Will you kiss me again? You don't have to ask me twice. Again, he took her face in his hands, leaned in to lay his lips warmly on hers. She curled her fingers around his wrists to hold him, hold there a moment longer. She wasn't sure he'd want to kiss her once she'd told the whole of it. She told him about John, about Terry, the house itself, the routine of it, the legal delays. Stalling a bit, she admitted. She told him about Bill Cosgrove teaching her poker and Linda doing her hair. It was, in a terrible way, the best time of my life. I watched television, listened to music, studied, cooked, learned, had people to talk to. John and Terry, I know it was a job, but they were family to me. Then my birthday came. I didn't think they knew or would think anything of it, but they had presents for me and a cake. John gave me earrings. I'd gotten my ears pierced that day at the mall with Julie, and he gave me my first real pair of earrings. And Terry gave me a sweater. It was so pretty. I went up to my room to put the earrings and the sweater on. I was so happy. She paused for a moment, working out how to explain to him what she'd never fully explained to herself. It wasn't like the day in the mall. The happiness wasn't fueled by rebellion and novelty and lies. It was so deep, so strong. I knew I'd wear that sweater set, those earrings, on the day I testified in court. That while I couldn't bring Julie back, I would have a part in getting justice for her. And when it was done, I'd become who I wanted to be. Whatever name they gave me, I'd be free to be myself. And then... I don't know everything that happened. I can only speculate. I've put it together so many ways. The most logical is that Bill Cosgrove and the agent who substituted for Linda that night, his name is Keegan, came in through the kitchen as usual. I think Terry was in there alone and John in the living room. She must have sensed or suspected something. I don't know what or why. They killed her, or at that point disabled her, but she managed to call out to John first, so he was alerted. But he couldn't get to me, couldn't get to the stairs without exposing himself. I heard the gunfire. Everything happened so fast. I ran out of the bedroom and saw John. When John got to me, he was shot several times. He was bleeding, from the leg, the abdomen. He pushed me back in the bedroom, and he collapsed. I couldn't stop the bleeding. She looked down at her hands. I couldn't stop it. I knew what to do, but I couldn't help. He didn't have much time. There wasn't much time. He told me to run, to take what I could and get out through the window. I couldn't trust the police. If they had Cosgrove and the other, they'd have more. The Volkoffs? I didn't want to leave him like that. But I went out the window, with the money I had, with my laptop, some clothes, with his ankle weapon. I was going to try to call for help. Maybe if help came, he wouldn't die. I didn't know if Terry was alive or dead. 
I'd barely gotten a block away when the house exploded. I think they'd planned to blow it up with me in it. They'd have taken over from John and Terry, staged something, and blown up the house. Where did you go? I went home. My mother would be at work, and the cook would have gone for the day. I still had my key. I went home so I could hide until my mother got home. And I found she'd boxed up all my things. Some were already gone. I don't know why that upset me so much, considering. I do. Well, I opened her safe, and I took money from her. Ten thousand dollars. It was wrong, but I stole from my mother, and I left. I've never been back. I walked, tried to think. It had been storming, but now it was just rain, just rainy and dark. I knew John and Terry were dead, and the last thing he told me to do was run. I saw a pickup truck with Indiana plates outside a coffee shop. I got in the back, under the tarp. I fell asleep somewhere along the drive, and when I woke up, I was in Terre Haute. I found a motel, paid cash. I went to a drugstore and bought bright red hair dye. It turned my hair orange, but I looked different. I slept again, a long time. Then I turned on the television, and I saw on CNN the report about John and Terry, about the house, about me. They thought I'd been in the house. They were looking for our remains. I nearly called the police. I had Detective Griffith's card, but I was afraid. I decided I'd wait, buy a cell phone, a disposable, in case. I waited another day, eating in the room, barely leaving it, watching the news, trying to find out more through the Internet. She paused, took a long breath. Then I found out more. They didn't think I was in the house. They knew I wasn't. There was speculation someone had abducted me, and other speculation that I'd snapped, shot John and Terry, blown up the house. Cosgrove and Keegan had each other to back up the story, how they'd gotten there just seconds too late, and Cosgrove was wounded. John got a piece of him? What about ballistics? It was through and through. They said the lights went off, and they couldn't be sure who fired at them, but Keegan got Cosgrove out. The house exploded as he called it all in. So I ran. I took a bus to Indianapolis. I got supplies, another motel, and I made new identification, and with it and some of the cash, I bought a used car from a junk dealer that got me to Nashville. I waited tables there for three months. Then I changed my hair again, my ID again, and moved on. She drew another breath. There wasn't much on the news anymore, and I wasn't quite able to hack into the files, the U.S. Marshals and FBI. I went to MIT on a forged ID and transcripts, and monitored classes on computer science and anything else that seemed helpful. I connected with a student there, a boy. He knew a lot about hacking more than I did. I learned from him. I slept with him. Then I left him. I think he cared for me a little, but I left him with only a quick note once I'd learned all he could teach me. I moved around every few months, a year at the most. Changed IDs, modified my appearance. The details aren't really important. She paused again. I'm wanted for questioning in the murder of two U.S. Marshals. He said nothing, just pushed to his feet, walked over to the window, and the world dropped away for Abigail. He would be finished with her now, she thought. Everything would be finished now. Have you kept tabs on Cosgrove and Keegan over the years? Yes. Keegan has been promoted several times. Good. You know where they are, what they're doing. That'll save time and work. I don't understand. He turned back to her. You don't think we're going to let those two bastards get away with murdering two good cops and implicating you? 
for keeping you running since the day you turned seventeen, for doing all that so another murderer and his murdering, thieving son of a bitching friends and associates could walk on killing an innocent girl. She could only stare at him. You believe me? Jesus, of course I believe you. I'd believe you even if I wasn't in love with you. It's so obvious you're telling the truth. You still love me. Listen up. He stalked back over to her, pulled her to her feet. I expect, no, I demand more respect than that from you. I'm not some weak-spined, half-ass fuckhead who slithers off when everything's not just exactly perfect. I loved you an hour ago. I love you now. I'm going to keep right on loving you, so get used to it and stop expecting me to let you down. It's insulting and it's pissing me off. I'm sorry. Good. You should be. He yanked her in for a kiss. Let her go. Where'd you learn to shoot? John taught me initially. I lived in Arizona for a time and took lessons from an old man. He was a conspiracy theorist and a survivalist. He was interesting, but not entirely stable. But he liked me and was very knowledgeable. I spent time at a number of universities under assumed names. I needed to learn. What's in the locked room upstairs? I'll show you. She led him up, unlocked the triple locks. It's a safe room, she said as she opened the door. And a friggin' arsenal, he noted. Handguns, long guns, knives, shelves of packaged food, bottled water, a computer setup as elaborate as her station downstairs, a chem toilet, clothes, wigs, hair dye, batteries, he saw as he wandered, flashlights, dog food, books, a frickin' grappling hook, tools. Did you set this up yourself? Yes. I needed to learn, as I said. I learned. I have several alternate IDs and passports in here, in a lockbox. Cash, credit cards, and the laminate and paper I need to make still more IDs if necessary. It's against the law. Oh, yeah, I'll arrest you later. Okay, you know how to protect yourself and you think ahead. You've been at this how long now? Twelve years. Long enough. Time to stop running. I want to. Today, I thought... What? It's not rational. Jesus, Abigail. Despite it all, he had to laugh. Be irrational. It seemed like a circle. Seeing Ilya in Justin Blake, seeing what I thought of Sergei Volkov in Lincoln Blake, seeing so much of what I admired in John in you, and finding I could stand up to the Blakes, I could do the right thing and not panic or run. It seemed like I could make the running stop, but I don't know if I can. You can. I, I want another beer. I want to think. We'll figure this out, and we'll fix it. Brooks. Beer. Thinking. Figuring and fixing. You've stopped being alone, Abigail. You'll have to get used to that, too. What's your real name, anyway? She took a breath. Elizabeth. Her voice sounded rusty on the word. Elizabeth Fitch. He angled his head. You don't strike me as an Elizabeth. For a little while, I was Liz. Yeah, I can see that. I'm partial to Abigail, but I can see Liz. So, he stepped forward, took her hand. Nice to meet you, Liz. Chapter 22 It wore her out, Brooks realized as he sat drinking his beer and thinking. The telling of it, and, he imagined, the reliving of it. She'd wedged herself into the corner of the couch, drooping. So he kept his silence, let her drift away a while, while the fire went to simmer, 
and the breeze kicked up against the windows. Storm coming on, he thought. Twelve years on the run. She'd turned seventeen and had, or believed she'd had, nothing and no one to depend on but herself. He pictured himself at seventeen, considered his biggest worry or problem at the time, wishing he'd had a mightier bat, a faster glove, he remembered, to drive him toward his fantasy of living up to his name as a hot major league third baseman, and longing, lusting, for Sylby. And that, he concluded, had been pretty much that. Some schoolwork stress, fights with the longed-for Sylby, annoyance with parental demands and rules. But he'd had parents, family, home, friends, structure. He couldn't imagine what it had been like for her, being seventeen and in constant fear for her life, witnessing cold-blooded murder, watching the man who'd given her a sense of security, even family, bleeding to death and trying so damn hard to obey his dying request. John Barrow told her to run, no question saving her life with the order, and she'd never stopped. He shifted, studying her while she slept. Time to stop running, he thought. Time to trust someone to help, to make it right. Sergei and Ilya Volkov, Yakov Krotky, Alexei Guryevich. He needed to do some research on the players, or utilize Abigail's research. He imagined anything that was or could be known about them was in her files, and in her head. Marshals Cosgrove and Keegan, same deal. A dirty cop earned a cell shared by those he'd sent over, in Brooks's opinion. A dirty cop who killed another cop for profit or gain? There was a special circle of hell reserved for them. He wanted a part in putting Cosgrove and Keegan dead center of that circle. He had some ideas, yeah, a few ideas on that. He wanted to chew on them some, do that research, let it all sift around. After a dozen years, a few days, even weeks of studying and formulating wouldn't hurt and he expected she'd need some of that time to adjust to the new situation. He'd need it to convince her to let him do what needed to be done, once he'd settled on exactly what that would be. For now, he figured the best thing would be to cart her on up to bed. They could both sleep on it a while. He got up, started to lift her, and she kneed him dead in the balls. He swore he felt them tickle his throat, then stick there when her elbow jabbed his larynx. He felt his own eyes roll up and back as he dropped like a stone, airless. Oh, God! Oh, God! Brooks! I'm sorry! Since the only sound he could make was a wheeze, he gave it up after one attempt. He'd just lie there for the moment, maybe forever. I must have fallen asleep. You startled me. She tried to turn him over, brushed his hair from his face. The dog licked it sympathetically. Can you breathe? Are you breathing? You're breathing. He coughed, and that burned like fire to match the inferno raging in his crotch. Shit, he managed, and coughed again. I'm going to get you water and ice. Just take slow breaths. She must have told the dog to stay with him, as Bert laid down so they were eye to eye. What the fuck? When that hissed out of him, Bert licked his face again. He managed to swallow, then roll cautiously to his hands and knees. He stayed there another moment, wondering if he'd complete the cycle and puke. He'd made it to sitting on the floor, stomach contents intact, when Abigail rushed back in with the cold pack and a glass of water. Don't you put that on my balls. It's bad enough. He took the water, and though the first couple of sips ripped like drinking broken razor blades, the rawness slowly eased. What the fuck? he said again. It was reflex. I'm so sorry. You're so pale. I'm so sorry. I fell asleep, and I was back there at Alexei's. Ilya found me, and... 
I think you touched me, and I thought it was Ilya, so I reacted. I'll say. God help him if he tries for you. We may never have kids now. A minor insult of this kind to the genitalia doesn't affect fertility. She began, then looked away. She went considerably pale herself. I'm very sorry, she repeated. I'll live. Next time I start to carry you up to bed, I'll wear a cup. Now you may have to carry me. I'll help you. She kissed him gently on the cheek. I'd say that's not where it hurts, but if you kiss me where it does and I have the normal reaction, it may kill me. He waved her away, pushed to his feet. It's not so bad. He cleared his throat, winced. I'll help you upstairs. I've got it. I'm just going to check things out for my own peace of mind. All right. I'll let Bert out before I come up. When she came up, he'd stripped down to his boxers, but stood by her monitor, studying it. Is everything, um... Yeah, that's some aim you've got, killer. It's a particularly vulnerable area in a man. I can attest. I'm going to want you to show me how this system works sometime soon, how you switch from view to view, zoom in, pan out, and so on. It's very simple. Do you want me to show you now? Tomorrow's soon enough. I figure you've got plenty of data on the Volkovs and the agents in their pocket. I'm going to want to review that. Yes. He caught the tone. What? I haven't told you everything. Now would be a good time for that. I'd like to clean up first. Okay. And get her thoughts together, he concluded. She took a nightshirt from the drawer. I'll just be a minute, she told him, and went into the bathroom. He wondered how much more there could be as he heard the water running, and decided there was no point in speculating. Instead, he turned down the bed, lowered the lights. When she came out, she got two bottles of water out of her cold box. She offered him one, then sat on the side of the bed. I think, if I were you, I'd wonder why I'd never tried to go to the authorities, tell everything that happened. You didn't know who to trust. That's true, at least initially, and I was afraid. For a long time I had nightmares and flashbacks, panic attacks— I still have occasional anxiety attacks. Well, you've seen. And even above that, though it took me time to understand it, I believed I had to do what John told me. He died protecting me. It all happened so quickly, so violently, and was so urgent, so insistent. I realize now we were both very much in the moment, and in that moment my survival hinged on escape. If you hadn't run, you'd be dead. That's clear. Yes, I've never questioned that. In those first days, weeks, it was all panic. Get away, stay away, stay concealed. If the Volkovs found me, they'd kill me. If the authorities found me and they were involved with the Volkovs, they'd kill me. If they weren't involved, they might arrest me for murder. So I ran and I hid the way I told you. No one could blame you for that. Maybe not. I was young and traumatized. No matter what the intellect, seventeen is still immature, undeveloped. But after some time had passed, I began to think more clearly, think beyond the moment. There had to be others like John and Terry, others who'd believe me, who'd listen, do whatever they could to protect me. How could I keep running, hiding? How could I do nothing when I was the only one who'd seen Julie's murder? who knew the truth of how John and Terry had died. So, I hacked into the FBI's and U.S. Marshals' databases. You... you can do that? I do it routinely, but I learned a considerable amount in the first year or two after I went into hiding. Some from the boy I told you about, some on my own. I wanted to learn everything I could about Cosgrove and Keegan, about Linda Pesky, too. She'd called in sick that day. Was that true? Was she another Volkov mole? Her medical records showed she'd been treated for food poisoning, so... You accessed her medical records? 
I've broken many laws. You said sometimes it's necessary to break the law. He rubbed his forehead. Yeah, I did. Let's put that on the shelf. You were, what, about nineteen or twenty and capable of hacking into the files of government agencies? I would have been a very good cyber investigator. Law enforcement's loss. I believed, and still believe, Linda Pesky wasn't part of it. I can't be sure, even now, but there's nothing to indicate she was anything but a marshal in good standing. Retired now, married with two children. I suspect Cosgrove put something in her food to make her ill that day, but I can't prove it, and I didn't feel safe contacting her. I believed, and still believe, Detectives Griffith and Riley are good, honest police officers. But I hesitated, as they're Chicago police, not federal, and federal often takes over from the local police. Added to that, I worried I'd put their lives in danger. It seemed more productive, safer, to research and study. At the same time, I needed money. I had fifteen thousand when I ran— but there are expenses in flight, in generating documents, in transportation and clothing and so on. As my primary skill was in computers, I worked on programming. I developed some software, sold it. It was lucrative. Is that so? Yes, and I developed a computer game, actually three connecting games. It was more lucrative. What game? It's called Street Wars. My research indicated most game players are male and enjoy battle or war-type games. I... I've played that game. Eyes narrowed, he pointed at her. Russ and I used to have marathon tournaments whenever I came home from Little Rock. It's bloody and brutal, and really cool. My target demographic enjoys brutal and bloody in their gaming. Having three was also key— if the first gains popularity, the target audience will want and pay for a follow-up. I was able to sell the three-part package outright for a considerable amount. It seemed less complicated under my circumstances than a royalty-based contract. You rich? Yes, I have a great deal of money, which I add to with my current security business. He smiled at her. I like having a rich girlfriend. I've never been anyone's girlfriend. Well, I'm sewing you into that, because you're rich. He made her smile. You said you loved me before you knew I was rich. It's less complicated and stressful to relocate, to arrange private transportation if necessary, to equip and secure a new location if there's money. I didn't want to steal it. And you could have. Oh, yes, of course. I accessed Cosgrove's and Keegan's bank accounts, found what I believe are payments from the Volkoffs. I could have siphoned funds from them, even from the Volkoffs themselves. Wait. Now he held up a hand, circled around. You've hacked into the Volkoffs' network? Yes. I'll explain. I secured the money I made in several different accounts under various identifications. I felt safer, less afraid with money— and with the information I'd gathered. I wanted more time. I'd started to study a particular FBI agent. I wanted to follow her, review her files, reports, her evaluations for at least a year before contact. I'd moved to New York. I felt safe there. So many people, all so busy, too busy to pay attention to me. And by that time, I could work almost entirely out of my brownstone. She thought back on it, a bit wistfully. I had a very nice house in Soho. It was there I considered getting a dog, for security and companionship. I'd started my security business, and at that time dealt face-to-face -face with clients. I would go to them, evaluate their system, their needs. When was this? I located in New York six years ago. I was 23, but my identification claimed I was 26. Older is better in these cases. I started fairly small, designing and installing security systems for homes and small businesses, business computer networks. It gave me considerable time for my research. And in researching, I found the agent I felt might be the one. I wanted what I wanted at 16. Friends, relationships, normal. 
and I wanted to do the right thing for Julie, for John and Terry. I was there more than a year, the longest I'd stayed in one place. I thought about buying a home in the country, because I realized, though I enjoyed the convenience of the city, I preferred the quiet. But it felt safe there, in Soho, all those people, the busy pace, and I'd landed a big account, a law firm. I'd done the personal security for one of the associates, and he'd recommended me. Six more months, I told myself. I'd stay in New York, complete the new contract, continue my research. Then, if I felt absolutely sure of this agent, I'd contact her and begin the process. What happened? I was nearly there, nearly ready. I'd completed the contract, and that had netted me another for one of the clients of the firm, my first corporation. It was good work, exhilarating, challenging. I believed absolutely my life was about to begin again, and I came out of the client's building, Houston Street downtown. I was thinking how I'd go home, change, go to the market, and buy myself a good bottle of wine to celebrate. I was thinking the six months I'd set to contact the agent was nearly up. I was thinking of getting a dog, of where I'd want to live when I could really live again. I was thinking of anything but the Volkovs, and he was just there. Who? Ilya, Ilya Volkov, and another man, his cousin. I found out later. They got out of a car just as I started for the curb to hail a cab. I almost walked into him. All those people, all that city, and I nearly walked into the man I'd run from for nearly eight years. He looked right at me, and I froze just as I had on the terrace that night. He started to smile, as a man does at a woman who's staring at him, I suppose. And then he knew me, and the smile went away. He recognized you. Are you sure? He said my name, Liz. Here you are, just like that. He reached for me. He nearly had my arm. His fingers brushed my sleeve before I jerked away, and I ran. He came after me. I heard him shouting in Russian. I heard the car gun away from the curb. I thought he'll shoot me in the back or catch me and drag me into that car. She pressed a hand to her heart, rubbed it there as the beat began to thud as it had that day in New York. I ran into the street. It was crazy. I was nearly run over. I didn't care. Anything would be better. I lost my shoes. It was like that night again, running in my bare feet. But I was smarter now, panicked at first, but more prepared. I knew the streets. I'd studied them, and I'd pulled away when I'd run into traffic, and his driver couldn't make the turn. I don't know how far I'd run before I realized I'd gotten away. I got on a crosstown bus, then I got in a cab. Too warm now, she thought, and crossed to a window to open it. I didn't have any shoes, but no one seemed to notice or care. It was a benefit of a large city. I guess I'm a country boy, as that doesn't strike me as a benefit. It was that day. When I got home, I got out my go bag. I would have run again with only that, but I calmed down. Packed up what I felt I'd need. I wasn't sure how much time I had. If he'd seen which building I'd come out of, if he'd managed to dig out the name I was using, find my address. I kept a car in another name in a garage. It was, I'd thought, worth the expense, and it proved to be true. I called a private car service. Had it take me to the garage? They might trace me there, but that would take time. By then, I'd be gone. I'd buy a new car, change my ID. Where did you go? I stayed mobile for weeks. Motels, paid cash. I watched Ilya's email. I learned they hadn't been able to trace me for several days. I didn't have to leave so quickly after all, and they weren't able to trace me once I left the brownstone. No one had seen or paid attention to me leaving, but I learned a lesson. I'd gotten careless. I'd let myself plan for a normal life, even in some way to live one. They'd never stop coming after me, so I had to accept the way it was, and do what I could to get justice for John and Terry and Julie another way. I'm tied in to the Volkovs network, 
email, e-files, even text messaging. When I have something that seems worthwhile, I leak the data anonymously to the FBI agent I studied and cleared to my specifications. I don't know how much longer it'll be safe to use her as a contact. If Volkov's people connect her, they may eliminate her. I think, logically, they'd try to use her to find the source of the leaks before they eliminate her. But that may be worse. They could torture her, and she couldn't tell them because she doesn't know. I'd be safe, but she wouldn't. Neither will you, if you involve yourself. You'd have made a good cop, cyber or otherwise, to my way of thinking. But I am a cop. You're just a cop's rich girlfriend. Don't joke. If they connect you to me, in any way, they'll kill you. But not just you, they'll kill your family. Your mother, your father, your sisters, their children. Everyone you care about. I'll take care of my family, Abigail. I guess we'll stick with Abigail for now. He stroked a hand over her hair. I'll have to get used to Liz when this is finished. It's never going to be finished. You're wrong. I want you to promise me something. To keep their eyes level, he shifted his hand to cup her chin. I want your word on this. You won't run out on me. You won't run figuring you're doing what's best for me and mine. I don't want to make a promise I might break. Your word. I'm going to trust your word, and you're going to trust mine. You promise me that, and I'll promise you I won't do anything without your full knowledge and approval. That's no easy promise for me to make, but I'll make it. You won't do anything unless I agree? That's my promise. Now I want yours. You won't run. What if they find me, the way Ilya did in New York? If you have to run, you run to me. You're like John. They killed John. Because he didn't know what was coming. Now, if you look me in the eyes and tell me you're seriously worried the Russian mafia is going to infiltrate the Bigford Police Department, we'll pack up Bert and whatever else we need and head out tonight. Name the place. I don't think that. Good. Then promise me. You won't do anything without telling me. I won't run without telling you. I guess that's close enough. You've had enough for tonight. We're going to get some sleep. I'm going to think about all this. I may have more questions, but they can wait. And after I've thought on it a while, we'll talk about what we'll do. That's we. You're not alone anymore. You're not going to be alone anymore. He urged her into bed pulling her close after he turned off the light. There, that feels right. Maybe I do have one question for tonight. All right. Did you hack into our system at the station? She sighed, and in the dark didn't see him smile at the sound. I felt it was important to know details about local law enforcement. The security on your network isn't very good. Maybe I should talk to the selectmen about hiring you to fix that. I'm very expensive, but under the circumstances I could offer you a large discount on my usual fee. She sighed again. I'd secure your personal computer for free. Jesus! He had to laugh. You're in my personal email and all that? I'm sorry, you kept coming here and asking questions. You'd looked up information on me. Well, the information I generated, but it was disturbing. I guess it was. You should be careful, calling the current mayor a fuckwit, even in correspondence with your good friend. You can't be sure who might see your personal email. He is a fuckwit, but I'll keep that in mind. He turned his head, kissed the top of her head. I love you. She pressed her face to the side of his throat. It sounds lovely in bed, in the dark, when everything's quiet. Because it's true. And it'll be true in the morning. She closed her eyes, held the words to her as he held her, and hoped, in the morning, he'd give them to her again. Elizabeth
Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Lord Mansfield Chapter 23 Roland Babbitt checked into the Inn of the Ozarks on a spring afternoon that simmered hot and close as August. In his room, with its engaging view of the hills, he set up his laptop on the glossy old desk. He appreciated the amenities, the complimentary Wi-Fi, the flat-screen TV, the carefully, he imagined, selected furnishings, and the generous shower. A great deal of the time he worked out of crap motels with piss-trickle showers and stingy slivers of soap, or out of his car, where the facilities ran to a mason jar he could empty of urine periodically. Such was the life of a private investigator. He enjoyed it, even the crap motels and mason jars. Two years as a cop had taught him he didn't work all that well with rules and regs. But he'd been a pretty good cop, and that had segued into a job with Steuben Price Investigations. In the nearly ten years he'd worked there, he'd proven himself reliable, inventive, and dogged, qualities appreciated by the firm. He also enjoyed his bonuses and hoped to net another on this job. He unpacked cargo shorts and pants, tees, sweats, rough boots. He'd selected the wardrobe to go with his cover as a freelance photographer, one that would allow him to wander the town, the outskirts, take photographs, talk to locals. He didn't like the client. Roland considered Lincoln Blake a first-degree asshole and the fruit of Blake's loins a raw pimple on society's ass. But work was work, and Blake generated a lot of income, being a nosy, pushy, scheming first-degree asshole. When the boss said go, Roland went. Especially since he had one kid in private school, another who'd enroll in the fall, and, surprise, a third on the way. He loved his family, and the pay from Steuben Price plus bonuses gave them a good life, which included a hefty mortgage on their new four-bedroom in West Little Rock. So, asshole or not, the client was king. If Blake wanted to know all there was to know, especially the dirt on one Abigail Lowry, Roland would find out all there was to know. The same for Brooks Gleason, Bickford's police chief, and according to the client, Lowry's lover. The client claimed the two in question, along with the Conroys, the owners of the hotel with the very nice view and amenities, had set up his son in order to extort money. Blake fervently and loudly denied his boy had caused the extensive damage to the hotel's premier suite as claimed, nor had he assaulted Russell Conroy, nor had he pulled a knife on the chief of police. Roland, nobody's fool, fervently but quietly believed the butt pimple had done all that and more. But he'd do his job, earn his salary, and pay his bills. He checked his camera gear, his recorder, his notebook, and lockpicks, then called his wife on his cell phone to let her know he'd arrived safe and sound. He told her he wished she were there, and meant it. The room boasted a king four-poster, Pregnancy turned Jen into a sexual dynamo. As he packed up for his first walk about town, he promised himself he'd make a return trip, with Jen, after the baby came and her parents were still dazzled enough to take on three kids for a long weekend. He shouldered the camera bag, hung the Nikon around his neck on a strap decorated with peace signs. Wearing cargo shorts, rock ports, and an REM t-shirt— he slipped on sunglasses, checked himself out in the mirror. He hadn't shaved that morning, deliberately, and thought the scruff added to the look. He liked pulled-on personas and, given the choice, kept them fairly close to his own. Natural. Easy. He considered himself to be a personable guy. He could talk to anyone about anything, as vital a tool as his computer. He wasn't bad-looking, he thought, as he added a green-piece ball cap to his ensemble. Though he was starting to worry about male pattern baldness, his brother, only two years older than Roland's thirty-four, 
already showed a fist-sized patch of bare scalp at the crown of his head. He thought fleetingly of picking up some Rogaine. Why not try preemptive measures as he walked out of his room? He'd wrangled a room on the top floor, though the reservation clerk had offered another due to construction noise, but he'd brushed off the warning and inconvenience. This way, he should be able to get a look at the suite the client's son hadn't trashed, if you believed first-class assholes. He strolled down the hall, noted the door, firmly shut, a sign apologizing for the inconvenience due to unexpected repairs. The noise, somewhat muffled, sounded more like demo than repair. He'd check it out later, when the crew and staff weren't around. For now, he took the stairs down, since he was also mildly concerned about encroaching middle-age paunch, and walked outside into the heat. Pretty little town, he thought. Jen would like it. The shops, the art. He'd pick up something for her and the kids, including the as-yet-unnamed and unknown surprise, before he left. Plenty of tourists, he noted. A guy with a camera blended right in. He made use of it, taking a few shots of the hotel, zooming in on the windows of the suite in question, with their curtains tightly shut. He had a good eye for a picture. He thought when the time came to retire from private investigating, he'd try photography as a working hobby. He wandered, framed in, shot. An interesting window, a close-up of flowers and a half-whiskey barrel— to the casual eye, he'd look like someone meandering without specific destination. But he had the salient addresses in his head. Lowry's place would require a drive, but he could walk past the police chief's apartment and the house where his parents still lived. Just getting a feel for the place, the people, Roland thought, and spent some time studying the windows of Brooks Gleason's apartment above a busy diner. Shades up, he noted. Nothing to see here. He wandered around the back, took some pictures of flower pots as he studied the rear entrance. Decent locks, but nothing major, should he feel the need to do a little snooping inside. He'd avoid that, if possible. With the town map in his hand, courtesy of the hotel, he strolled down the sidewalk and stopped, absolutely charmed and bedazzled by the mural house. He checked the address and confirmed it was indeed the residence of the police chief's parents. Information already gathered told him the mother was an artist, the father a high school teacher. He had to assume the woman with the rainbow kerchief over her hair, currently standing on scaffolding in paint-splattered bib overalls, was the subject's mother. Leashed to the base of the scaffolding, a puppy curled in the shade and snoozed. As much for his own interest as the job, Roland took a few pictures, moved closer. When he got to the edge of the yard, the puppy woke in a yappy frenzy. And the woman looked down. She tipped her head. Help you? I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just walking around, and this is just amazing. Did you paint all of this? I did. Visiting? I'm spending a few days in town. I'm a photographer, and I'm taking a few weeks in the Ozarks. I want to put a show together. You won't lack for subject matter around here. All right, Plato, I'm coming. She climbed down nimbly, unclipped the dog, who instantly raced over to sniff at Roland. Good dog. He hunkered down to give the dog a rub. I guess I woke him up. He's a fierce guard dog, as you can see. Sonny O'Hara, she added, offering a hand dotted with paint. Roland Babbitt, would it be all right if I took some pictures of the house? It's wonderful. You go ahead. Where are you from, Roland? Little Rock. My son lived there some years. He was a police detective. Brooks Gleason. Can't say I know the name, but I try to stay out of trouble. She grinned along with him. That's good, because he's chief of police here now. It feels like a nice town. I hope he doesn't stay too busy. Oh, well, there's always this and that. Where are you staying? 
I'm splurging, since I'll do a lot of camping on the second part of this trip. I'm at the Inn of the Ozarks. Couldn't do better. It's one of the brightest jewels in Bickford's treasure box. We had some trouble there a few days ago, as it happens. Town troublemaker and a couple of his minions tore up the Ozark suite. Is that what it is? I'm on that floor and they told me there'd be some noise. Repairs going on. A lot of them. You may want to get yourself on another floor. Oh, I don't mind it. I can sleep through anything. Casual and friendly, he let his camera dangle by its strap. I'm sorry to hear about the trouble, though. It's a really beautiful hotel. The architecture, the furnishings. It has the feel of a family home, with benefits. Why'd they tear it up? Some people just like to break things, I guess. That's a shame. I guess even nice little towns have troublemakers. I'll try to steer clear of him while I'm here. He's in jail, and likely to be there a while. You'll find most people who live here are friendly. We depend on tourists and artists like yourself. That's a serious camera you've got there. My baby. He tapped it. He really wanted the pictures, nearly as much as the information she so breezily passed on. I still do film now and then, but digital's my primary choice. If you get anything you want to sell, you can take it into Shop Street Gallery. They buy a lot of local photography. I appreciate the tip. A couple sales will keep me in hot dogs and beans for the next few weeks. He chatted with her for a few more minutes, then walked back toward the center of town. If Sonny O'Hara was anything to go by, Roland thought, the client wasn't going to be pleased with the report. He headed for the diner. Diners and waitresses were usually good information sources. He chose a booth with a good view of the comings and goings, set his camera carefully on the tabletop. He was tempted to take a picture of the waitress. He really did love saturating himself in the persona, and she had a good, interesting face. Coffee, please. How about some pie to go with it? Cherry's especially good today. Cherry pie? He thought of encroaching middle-aged paunch. So he'd do fifty extra crunches tonight. I don't think I can say no. Warmed up? Vanilla bean ice cream? Okay, seventy-five extra crunches. Yes, ma'am. I don't know anybody strong enough to say no to that. If it's as good as it sounds, I'm going to be in here every day while I'm in town. It is. Visiting, she said, in nearly the same easy tone as Sonny. He gave her the same cover, even showed her a few pictures he'd taken of the mural house. You never know what she'll paint on it next. Those are right nice pictures, too. Thanks. I'll put your order in. He doctored his coffee while he waited, studied his guidebook like a good tourist. She brought back a generous wedge of pie with ice cream gently melting on the laced crust. Sounds good, looks good. Roland forked off a bite. Tastes even better. Thanks, Kim. You enjoy now. She glanced over, and so did he, as Brooks walked in. Hey there, Chief! When she gestured to the booth directly in front of him, Roland decided to double her tip. Just coffee. You ain't heard about the cherry pie a la mode. I got it on good authority nobody can say no. She sent Roland a wink as she spoke, and he toasted her with a forkful. It'd be wasted on me right now. Lawyers. Well, sweetie, that calls for two scoops of vanilla bean on the pie. Next time. I just came in for a decent cup of coffee and some breathing room to review my notes. All right, then. Blake's lawyers, she asked as she poured the coffee. New ones. Harry got the axe, and between you and me, I think he's doing a dance of joy at the fire, and Blake hired on a firm from up north. Yankee lawyers? Kim's mouth twisted in derision. I shouldn't be surprised. Armani suits and Louis Vuitton briefcases, at least according to the paralegal Big John Simpson's got doing research on the case. They've got motions on top of motions. 
Want to change a venue for one thing. The judge doesn't like them, so that's something. Want to get him away from here, away from where people know what a nasty piece of work that Blake boy is. Can't say I blame them. But here or on Pluto, facts fact. The trouble is, facts aren't always enough in a courtroom. On one step back, she slapped both fists on her hips. You don't think he'll get off? Not after what he did. I'm not going to think it, because if he gets out of this whistling, the next time I know in my gut he's likely to kill somebody. Well, my Jesus, Brooks. Sorry. Brooks rubbed at his tired eyes. I should have taken my crappy mood to my office. You sit right there and have your coffee and don't let all this weigh on you. She leaned down, kissed the top of his head. You did your job, and everybody knows it. You can't do more than your job. Feels like I ought to. Anyway, just the coffee. You holler if you want anything else. Shaking her head, she walked away, topping off Roland's coffee as she went. Roland sat, mulling. Nothing the cop said struck him as false. He despised the nasty piece of work himself. But as the wise and wonderful Kim had said, you couldn't do more than your job. His was to find anything that might tip the scales in the client's favor. He nearly choked on his pie when the vision walked in. He knew small southern towns could produce some beauties, and in his personal opinion, southern women had a way of nurturing that beauty like hothouse roses. Maybe it was the weather, the air, the chance to wear all those thin summer dresses like the one the vision wore now. Maybe it was the slower pace, or some secret mothers passed to daughters. Whatever it was, it worked. He loved his wife, and had never, in their twelve years together, ten-plus with rings on the finger, strayed. But a man was entitled to a little fantasy now and then, when possibly the sexiest woman ever created sashayed into his line of sight. She hip-swayed right up to Gleason's booth, slid in like melted butter on warm toast. Not a good time, Sylvie. In Roland's world, it was always a good time for Sylvie. I just have a question. I'm not going to try to get you back or anything like that. I learned my lesson back in March. I appreciate that, but it's a bad time right here and now. You look tense and tired and out of sorts. I'm sorry about that. We were friends once. When he didn't speak, she looked away, let out a breath that had her delectable breasts rising, falling. I guess we weren't friends, and maybe that's my fault. I've been doing a lot of thinking since I humiliated myself for your benefit. Let's not go there. It's easy for you to say, since you weren't the one standing there naked. Roland felt himself going hard and mentally apologized to his wife. It was a mistake, and some of it's on me for not talking it out with you. You're sorry, I'm sorry, let's forget it. I can't forget it until I know. Know what? Why her and not me? That's all. I need to know why you want to be with Abigail Lowry. Everybody knows you are. And you don't want to be with me. Roland wanted to know, too, and not just for the client. He'd seen Lowry's photo, and she was attractive, sure. Pretty, maybe even beautiful in a quiet sort of way. But next to the stupendous Sylby? She was no cherry pie a la mode. I don't know how to tell you. Just tell me the truth. Is she better in bed than me? Jesus Christ. That's the wrong thing to ask. On an impatient gesture, she pushed back a glorious fall of hair. I wasn't going to ask, even though I wonder. Just give me something, will you, that I can understand? She makes me happy. When I'm with her, I feel like that's where I'm supposed to be, where I've been wanting to be, and everything that matters makes sense. I don't know why one person falls in love with another Sylvie. They just do. 
You're in love with her. I'm in love with her. She stared down at the tabletop for a moment. Can I have a sip of your coffee? Sure. She took it, grimaced, set it down again after one sip. You always drink it too sweet. Bad habit. Did you ever love me? I wanted you. There were times I craved you like I was starved to death. The first time around, we were too young to know. The second, maybe we were both trying to know. I couldn't make you happy, you couldn't make me happy, and nothing that really mattered made sense. The sex did. He laughed a little. Okay, you're right about that. But sex, even good sex, can't be the start, finish, and the whole in between. I thought I'd figured that out after my first divorce, but I guess I didn't. And the second one? I never wanted to be the kind of woman with two divorces on her back. She turned to stare out the wide window. But I am. Maybe you should think of it as two marriages. I figure people who try marriage more than once, they're optimists. Optimists. With a half laugh, she shoved his coffee away. Sounds better than a loser. You're not a loser, Silby. I'm sort of seeing Grover. You, oh. Brooks picked up his coffee, gulped some down. Well. I know, he's not the type I usually aim for. He's not handsome and he's a little paunchy, but he's got a sweetness to him. You did, too, but I didn't appreciate it. I'm appreciating his. We're not sleeping together yet, but I feel good when I'm with him. I feel better about myself. I guess we're friends the way you and I never were. That's good. He makes me happy, and I didn't expect to be. I guess I'll find out if I can stay happy. I hope you can. So do I. She slid out. I don't think I'm ready to say I hope you stay happy with Abigail Lowry, but I nearly am. That's a start. I'll see you around. She sashayed out. Roland decided he had a lot more mulling to do, but since he'd finished his pie, he needed to do it elsewhere. In any case, Gleason was leaving, laying money on the tabletop for the coffee. Maybe he'd drive out toward Lowry's place, get the lay of the land. Taking a break from work, Abigail paged through recipes online. It kept her from worrying, nearly kept her from worrying. She knew Brooks would want to talk about what happened next when he came. She worried about what he thought should happen next. So she worked, did laundry, worked, weeded the garden, worked looked through recipes. She couldn't seem to settle, focus on one chore until she completed it. It wasn't like her. She wished he'd come. She wished she could be alone. She wished she knew what she really wished. She hated this indecision, the gnawing anxiety. It wasn't productive. When her alarm sounded, she spun in her chair, certain that telling Brooks, telling anyone the story— had brought the Volkoffs to her door. Illogical. Actually ridiculous, she admitted, but her pulse hammered as she watched the man in the ball cap on her monitor. A good camera, she noted, boots that had seen some wear, a backpack. A hiker or tourist who'd wandered onto her property despite the postings. That was it, probably. When he took out binoculars, aimed them toward her cabin— the anxiety increased. Who was he? What was he doing? Coming closer. Still closer. He stopped again, scanned with his compact field glasses, turning slowly until it seemed to Abigail he stared through them right at one of the cameras. Then he continued on, continuing the circle. He took off his cap scrubbed at his hair before taking out a water bottle and drinking deeply. Reaching into his pocket, he took out a compass, took a step, stumbled. 
He fumbled with the compass, dropped it. She saw his mouth move as he dived for it, snatched it off the ground. He shook it, lifted his face to the sky, then sat on the ground, dropped his head to his knees. He stayed as he was for several moments before pushing to his feet. He mopped at his face, then continued toward her cabin. After checking her weapon, Abigail took the dog outside, circled around. She could hear him coming. Nothing stealthy in his approach, she thought, and he was muttering to himself, breathing fast, heavy. From the side of the greenhouse, she watched him come into view, heard him say very clearly, Thank God, as he arrowed straight toward her rear door. He knocked, swiped sweat from his face, waited. He knocked again, more forcefully. Hello? Is anybody there? Please let somebody be there. He walked down the porch, cupped his hand on the window glass, and she stepped out, the dog by her side. What do you want? He jumped like a rabbit, spun around. Jeez, you scared the... His eyes went huge when he saw the gun, and his hands shot straight up in the air. Jesus, don't shoot me. I'm lost. I got lost. I'm just looking for the way back to my car. What were you doing in the woods, on my property? It's clearly posted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was taking photographs. I'm a photographer. I was just going to take a few shots, get the feel of things, and I got caught up, went in farther than I meant to. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have ignored the no trespassing signs. You can call the cops. Just don't shoot me. My, my name's Roland Babbitt. I'm staying at the Inn of the Ozarks. You can check. Please take off your pack, set it down, step away from it. Okay, sure. He wasn't wearing a gun. She'd seen him do a full circle and would have spotted it. But he might have a weapon in the pack. You can keep the pack, he said when he set it down. My wallet's in there. You can keep the money. I don't want your money. Listen, listen, I got lost. I dropped my compass and broke it. I saw the cabin through my binoculars when I was scanning around. I just came for some help. Call the police. Where did you leave your car? If I knew, I wouldn't be lost. I don't mean to be a smartass, he added quickly. I drove out of Bickford, south out of town for about a mile, then I pulled over. The light was really good, the shadows. I wanted to take some shots, photographs, I mean he said, with another wary look at the gun. You should respect private property. Yes, you're right. I'm really sorry. She pointed. If you go that way, you'll come to the road. Turn left. You should find your car in about a quarter mile. Okay, thanks. I'll just take your pack, she told him, as he started to step off the porch without it. Okay. He picked it up his eyes shifting from her face to the gun, to the dog, back again. Thank you. You're welcome. She watched him walk away, in quite a hurry, until he was out of sight. Back in the house, she continued to watch him on the monitor as he hiked at a half-jog up her road to the main one, tossing glances over his shoulders every few minutes. She'd frightened him, she thought. Well, he'd frightened her. She supposed that made them even. Roland knew exactly where his car was parked. He hadn't been expecting the gun. He hadn't been expecting the cameras, either. He'd been told she had security, including cameras around the house. Nobody had mentioned she had them ranged back in the woods. If he hadn't spotted one when he had, he'd have blown the job. She'd bought the scared, lost hiker routine. Why not? He had been scared. She'd held the Glock like someone who knew how to use it. Like someone who would use it. He had to admire that, now that he wasn't standing on the wrong side of it. And the dog. He'd known about the dog, but god damn, that was one big bastard. Then the locks on the back door. As good as they came, he mused, as he tossed the pack in the back seat. He was pretty damn good with the picks, but he'd never get through those. 
moot point as he couldn't get by the cameras, not without a whole lot of equipment. That much security? Overkill. The job just got a lot more interesting. Anybody with security like that, the big dog, the Glock, the Tood? She had something to hide. He loved finding out what people wanted to hide. Chapter 24 Brooks came into the kitchen with a clutch of white daisies with bright yellow buttons and a rawhide bone for Bert. You brought me flowers again. My daddy brings my mama flowers once or twice a week, and I figured out it's because they make her smile, just like you are now. I worried things wouldn't be right when you came tonight, that it would feel awkward after everything, and you brought me daisies. Then you can stop worrying. She got a vase, wished she had a pretty little pitcher instead, and vowed to buy one the next time she went into town. Every time I come in here, something smells good, in addition to you. It's the rosemary, she told him as she arranged the flowers. It's very fragrant. I found a new recipe for chicken I wanted to try. Happy to be your taste tester. It should go well with the Pouilly Fumé. If you say so. He brushed her hair back, then indulged himself with a nuzzle of her neck. How'd your day go? I was restless and distracted, but I finished some work, and I was interrupted by a lost hiker, a photographer. I don't understand why people don't respect boundary lines. There's so much land here open to the public, there's no need to come onto private property. Grass is always greener. He came to the house? Yes, he set off the alarm, and I saw him on the monitor. He dropped and broke his compass and apparently saw the cabin through his binoculars. Brooks paused in the act of pouring their wine. Binoculars? She checked the chicken. Yes, I wondered if he'd seen the camera through them, but apparently he was looking for his way or some help. I went outside around the greenhouse so I could come up behind him. You went out? When some strange guy was coming to the house? I know how to take care of myself. I've been doing it for a long time, remember? He was alone. I had my gun and Bert. He knocked, called out, and he was very disconcerted when I stepped out with the gun. Brooks finished pouring the wine, took a long swallow. Yeah, I can see that. I didn't mind frightening him. He shouldn't have come onto posted property. I questioned him briefly, then directed him to where, if he told me accurately, he'd left his car. He left quickly. An armed woman with a big dog? He'd have been a fool not to. What was he doing out here? Photography. He said his name was Roland Babbitt, and he was staying at the Conroy's Hotel. That's easy enough to check on? Brooks dug out his cell phone. What did he look like? Mid-thirties, between 5'10 and 5'11, about 170 pounds. Medium complexion, light brown hair, brown eyes, prominent chin. He wore a brown cap with the Greenpeace logo, a black T-shirt with the name of the band, R.E.M., khaki cargo shorts, and hiking boots. He had a navy backpack and a Nikon camera on a strap. The strap had multicolored peace signs on it. Yeah, you would have made a good cop, Brooks replied. I saw him at the diner earlier today. Cherry pie a la mode. What does that mean? Nothing, just curious. What time did he come here? The alarm sounded at 4.18. Yeah, that's curious. I see him at the diner in town going on to four o'clock. Less than a half hour later, he's out here. Her hand tightened on the stem of her glass. You think they've found me? Honey, did he look like Russian mafia? And would it be their style to have some guy poking around up in your woods? No. Her shoulders relaxed. He wasn't armed. At least he wasn't wearing a weapon. The Volkovs wouldn't send a single unarmed man. I think that's a pretty safe bet. But he intended to be thorough and punched in a number on his cell. Hey, Darla, how's it going? Uh-huh. 
Those spring colds can hit hard. You get some rest. Yeah, it's that time of year, all right. Listen, do you have a guest name of Roland Babbitt registered? No problem. Uh huh. Hmm. It takes all kinds, doesn't it? Uh huh. He rolled his eyes at Abigail. Yeah, Roland Babbitt. What room's he in? Now, Darla, I'm not just anybody asking. I'm the chief of police. I'm just following up on something. You know I can call Russ and ask. Uh huh. Is that so? Mm hmm. No, no trouble. Just a routine thing. You take care of that cold now. You hear? Bye. He picked up the wine again. Darla tends to run on a bit. He's there, all right. Took a room, requested it, right down the hall from the Ozark Suite. The one Justin Blake and his friends vandalized. That would be right. Now, isn't it curious how I saw this Babbitt in town, and he comes here, got a camera and binoculars, and he's staying down from that particular suite? It could be a coincidence, but it feels designed. Designed is a good word for it. Designed by Blake. Leaning a hip on the counter, he picked up his wine. What do you bet? If I scratched the surface some, I'd find out Roland Babbitt is a high-priced private investigator. I think I'd win the bet. He did see the camera, and he thought very quickly, pretending to be lost, duping her. She thought with considerable annoyance. But I don't see what he gained by coming here. A little legwork. Check out your setup here. Get a feel. He had some luck today, spotting one of your cameras, using it to his advantage to make contact. I don't doubt the reception gave him a bad moment, but all in all, it worked for him. He had a conversation, a close-up look. Same thing earlier when I happened to go in for some coffee when he was in the diner. He got to sit there eating his pie and get a good look and shit. I'm sorry. I bet his ears were trained too. I bet he caught damn near every word of my conversation with Sylvie, which I wasn't going to bring up. He added when Abigail said nothing, and now it occurs to me that was the wrong way because I guess it was an important conversation, and you were part of it. You talked about me with her, and that tone, that look in your eye, was why I wasn't going to mention it. I don't know what you mean. She turned away to put the green beans she'd bought earlier in the week and had already prepped on the stove to steam. I don't have a tone. You could cut brick with it. Not that I mind. He didn't bother to hide the grin when he gave her a friendly poke at the base of the spine. It's sort of flattering. I wouldn't be flattered. I don't care to have you talk about me with your former connection. Connect is what Sylvie and me never really did. She came in while I was having coffee, and she sat down, partly to apologize for that, we'll say, unfortunate incident back in March. The other was to ask a question. She wanted to know why you and not her. Considering, Abigail took the chicken off the heat. It's a legitimate question from her point of view. That's what you'd think. From mine, it's both awkward and annoying. A woman who looks like she does would be used to having anyone she wants, and wouldn't see me fairly enough in that same light. However true that might be, it's still annoying. You're flattered because I'm annoyed, and that only annoys me more. Before you move to downright pissed, don't you want to know what I told her? It's none of my business what you said in a private conversation. She got out plates, set them down sharply. Yes, I want to know. I told her that when I'm with you, it feels right. It feels like where I'm supposed to be. It all makes sense. I said I didn't know why one person falls in love with another, just that they do. She turned back, eyes on his. You told her you loved me. I did because I do. I'm less annoyed. Good. Heading in the right direction, I didn't want to have the conversation with her. But after I had, 
I realized it was a good one. I think we understand each other better than we ever did, and that'll make it easier for both of us. It would be easier for me if she weren't so physically gifted, and that's petty. I don't like being petty and shallow. As I grew up with two sisters, I can safely say odds are strong she's thinking the same about you. But my point is, this Roland Babbitt got himself an earful. None of it's applicable to the charges against Justin Blake, if indeed Babbitt is a private investigator working for Justin's father. No, but it's fuel. Just like you carrying a gun and having high-class security is fuel. How well will those bona fides of yours hold up? My documents and available history will stand up to a standard police run. There would be no reason to question them. A P.I. is not a cop, Brooks pointed out. I believe they'll hold up to a rigorous check. I've never had any trouble. Ever been arrested? Brought in for questioning? No, but I'm routinely checked by clients before contract. Due to the sensitive nature of the work and my fee, my documents and references are thoroughly checked by any new client. That's good. Satisfied, he nodded. That's good to know. My concern, and it's just a concern at this point, is that Babbitt wouldn't be working for a client wanting to hire you, but one looking for dirt, for something he can use to discredit you or threaten you. He'd have to be very skilled and very determined. Maybe we'll take some precautions. You could intimidate him. You have authority and weapons. You could confront him, intimidate him, and make him leave. Maybe I could, but that's the sort of thing that would tend to make him more curious once he's gone. Unless I have a lever. I don't want to leave. We're not going to let that happen. She hated this new stress, this additional complication that had nothing, nothing to do with the Volkovs. If I stayed in the house, not answered the door, or simply given him directions, I don't think that would have made much difference. He's doing a job. What we'll do, or you will, as I expect you're better and quicker, is find out what we can about him, see what kind of man we're up against here. Meanwhile, I'm going to want to borrow some of your cameras. Why? That precaution. Is it okay if the Bickford Police Department borrows some of your equipment for a day or two? Yes. She took a key ring out of her pocket. Borrow what you want. Thanks. I'll have Ash or Boyd run out and get it, if that's okay. I need to make a couple calls to set up that precaution. All right. I have to finish the meal. Hopefully it would settle her nerves. I don't want to overcook the vegetables. She had to do something, keep doing something, so the panic couldn't push through. If she performed normal tasks, add fresh thyme and butter to the green beans, drizzle the wine sauce over the chicken, plate them with the roasted potatoes, she could cling to the illusion of normality. She'd prepared and presented the meal very well, but she could barely force down a few bites. She had a contingency plan. She always did. All the documents she needed for the next identity were inside her safe room, locked away, waiting. But she didn't want to use them, didn't want to become someone else again. That meant she'd have to fight to protect who she was now, what she had now. If this investigator is very skilled and very determined, it will still take time for him to discredit my documents and history, she began. I need more time to plan and organize any sort of contact with Special Agent Garrison. She's in Chicago? I wanted someone in Chicago, where the Volkovs are based. She would have more incentive and more access. Her response time would be quicker once she learned to trust my information. Good thinking. But unless I can formulate an alternative, if I make direct contact, she'd be duty-bound to detain me. If that happens, I don't believe I'll have the time or opportunity to clear myself before I'm eliminated. He reached over, took both her hands. You're not going to be detained, and you're sure as hell not going to be eliminated. Look at me. Whatever it takes. And I've given some thought on alternatives and methods. 
I've considered sending Special Agent Garrison an email on her personal account, telling her who I am, relating the entire story, all the details. I can route it as I do the data I send her, and it wouldn't be possible to track. But it could leak. If the information I give her gets in the wrong hands, the Volkovs will know I'm not only still alive. Ilya Volkov saw you. They know you're alive. They knew I was alive five years ago in New York. I might have had an accident or contracted a terminal illness. Okay, slim, but point taken. They'll also know I've accessed their accounts, their electronics, and have given information to the FBI. Naturally, they'd take steps to block me from the access, which would cost me time and effort. They'd also be much more careful about what they put in emails and e-files. But more, it would make them very angry and increase their effort to locate and eliminate me. They have very skilled techs. Part of their income is from computer fraud, scams from identity theft. You're better than their techs. Yes, I am, but I've also had considerable time to study and program, to break through firewalls, elude alerts. It would take time to do that again with newer, stronger security in place. In their position, I'd lay traps. If I made a mistake, they might track me. Time again is important. If and when I contact the FBI, the process of taking Keegan and Cosgrove, identifying other moles, arresting Korotki, Ilya, all of that would have to happen quickly. Like dominoes falling, he suggested. Yes, along those lines. Bureaucracies don't, in general, operate in a timely fashion, and before the process can begin, the agent, her superiors, would have to believe me. They will. The word of a fugitive, suspected at least by some of killing or certainly causing the deaths of two U.S. marshals, against the word of two other marshals, one of whom has been decorated and promoted. He covered her restless hand with his. The word of a woman who, at sixteen, handed them a top-level mafia assassin on a damn platter. They're the ones who screwed up. You're biased because you love me. I love you, but I also have good instincts. You think the FBI, the marshals, the CPD wouldn't bend and twist to break the back of the Volkov organization? They'll deal with you, Abigail. It took an effort not to pull her hand from his. Are you asking me to trust them to protect me? No, I'm asking you to trust yourself and me to do that. I think I could. Then what we need is first a conduit. I don't understand. Someone to speak for you, to make contact and open the door to negotiations. You can't. No, he agreed before she'd finished. I can't. I'm too close to you emotionally and geographically. They'll check out the conduit, but they'd have no reason to connect me or you. To my former captain on the Little Rock PD, I don't know him. I do. Just hear me out, Captain Joseph Anson. You can research him. He's a solid cop, decorated, a twenty-five-year man. He's got a wife, first and only, two kids. He's a good boss, a smart cop, by the book, but not so much that he can't skip a page if it's the right thing to do. He's trusted and respected in the department because he's trustworthy and respectable, and he's got balls. She got up, walked to the window to think it through. A conduit made good sense, would lay a reasonable buffer down, but why would he believe me? He'll believe me. Even if he did, why would Special Agent Garrison believe him? Because of his record, his service, because he's clean. Because he'd have no reason to lie, he's a handful of years away from his thirty, away from retirement. Why would he risk that by lying to the feds? She nodded, seeing the logic. But why would he risk that by involving himself in this? Because he's a good man and a good cop. Now Brooks rose, went to her. Because he's raised two daughters, and if he doesn't imagine them in your place. I'll put them there in his head.
You're asking me to trust a man I don't know, have never met. I know it, and don't think for a minute I don't know how much that asks. If you can't do it, we'll find another way. She turned to the window again. Her gardens were doing so well. Her life had been so smooth, really, for the last year. And yet nothing had really grown until she'd opened the door to Brooks. Would you trust him with your life? I would be. You're my life now. Oh, God, you say that, and I feel I'd wither away if I lost what I've found with you. You make me want to risk the quiet, Brooks, and I thought the quiet was all I ever wanted. You can't keep running, Abigail. Taking her shoulders, he turned her around to face him. You can't keep shutting yourself up, shutting yourself down. I thought I could, but no, I can't. Not now. How would you do it? Drive to Little Rock. We couldn't risk a phone call or an email. It has to be face-to-face, -face, not only so we don't leave a trail, but because Anson's a face-to-face -face type. I could be there in under two hours, get this started, be back before morning. Tonight? What's the point in putting it off? There's a P.I. I guarantee is working on his laptop right now, scratching at that surface. We've got the advantage, why waste it? He got to his feet. You take your laptop or that iPad of yours. Do your research on the captain on the way. If you're not satisfied, we turn around, come back. You want me to go with you? Always. But in this case, I want him to see you, hear you. I want you to tell him the way you told me. You're scared. I don't blame you. He took her arms. You want to take more time to analyze, to calculate, work out details. But that's not what you did when you got out of that safe house. It's not what you did in New York when they chased after you. You went with instinct, and you beat them. I'm going to take my alternate identification and cash, my go bag. If this goes wrong, I can't come back here. If it goes wrong, I'll go with you. I know you mean that now. Now's where we are. You take whatever you think you need. I want to take Bert. Now, he smiled. I wouldn't have it any other way. He drove her car. Neighbors wouldn't think much about an SUV in Anson's driveway, but they'd remember a Bickford police cruiser if a badge asked somewhere down the line. While he drove, Bert did what dogs did in cars, hung his head out the back window with a dopey grin on his face, and Abigail worked on her laptop. Your Captain Anson has an excellent record. He's a good cop. Advantage or disadvantage, Abigail wondered. If he agrees to help, will you know if he's telling the truth? Yes, trust me. I am. She looked out the side window at the blur of landscape. More than I have anyone else in a dozen years. If this goes through and others believe me, it would lead to arrests, trials, my testimony. And there could be repercussions. You have to understand that. We could go on the way things are, let it alone. And both of us, I think both of us, would never feel quite okay with it. Safer, but not quite okay. Safe's been enough for a long time now. She looked back at him, still in wonder how one person could change everything. It's not now. Still, it won't be enough to hurt the Volkov organization, to just damage it. To be okay and safe, we have to destroy it. Working on it. I have some ideas, but not all of them are strictly legal. She watched the grin move over his face. That doesn't surprise me. What do you have in mind? I've been working on something, but I need to refine it a bit more. It's technical. He glanced over and down at her laptop. Nerd stuff. I suppose. Yes, nerd stuff. If we do this, I'll need to spend more time and effort on the programs I've been developing. In the meantime, and again, if your captain agrees, you have to decide on your communication. 
Once he makes contact with the FBI on this matter, they'll track his communications. We're going to make a stop on the way, pick up some prepaid cell phones. That should cover it for the time being. It should. He reached over, briefly laid his hand over hers. We're going to find a way. She believed him. It made no sense, defied all logic, and yet she believed him. Her nerves ratcheted up when Brooks drove down the quiet street in the pretty neighborhood. Old leafy trees, green lawns, lights glowing against window glass. Captain Anson might attempt to arrest her on the spot. He might insist on contacting the Federals. He might not be home, which would be anticlimactic and somehow more stressful. He might relax, Brooks said and stopped in front of a tidy two-story house with attached garage and a lovely red maple in the front yard. That's not possible. He shifted so they were face to face. In or out, Abigail. It's your choice. In, but I can't relax about it. If she had to run, she wouldn't allow him to run with her. She wouldn't allow him to give up his life, his family, his world. She had an extra set of keys in her bag and could be out and gone if necessary. If that happened. Whatever happens, I need you to know these past weeks have been the best of my life. Being with you changed me. Nothing will be the same for me again, and I'm glad of it. We're going to win this, starting now. All right. She ordered Bert to stay and got out of the car. After Brooks skirted the hood, he took her hand. She did her best to focus on that contact as her heart began to thud in her throat. Lights glowed in the window, and she could smell spring and the oncoming summer, the grass, the heliotrope, dianthus, some early roses. She felt the anxiety build, an anvil on her chest, and closed her eyes against it for a moment while Brooks knocked. The man who answered boasted broad shoulders and heavily salted dark hair gone thin at the temples. He wore khakis and a blue golf-style shirt with reading glasses hanging from the pocket by the earpiece. His feet were bare, and from somewhere behind him, Abigail heard the commentary of a ball game. His eyes were a hard steel blue, until the smile burst onto his face. Son of a bitch, it's Chief Gleason at my door. It's good to see you, Captain. Son of a bitch, Anson repeated, then gave Brooks a one-armed hug while he measured up Abigail. Are you going to introduce the lady? Abigail Lowry, Captain Joe Anson. Nice to meet you, Abigail. Man, Nadine's going to be sorry she missed you. She took her mom on a girl's trip, a spa thing, for her mom's birthday. She won't be back till Sunday. Well, come on in. The living room looked comfortable, Abigail thought, lived in and easy, with framed family photographs on a wall shelf and prettily potted houseplants on the windowsill. I was catching the game back in the den. Just let me switch that off. Sorry to interrupt, to drop by like this. No need. It's my second night batching it. I'm boring the hell out of myself. He slipped into an alcove off the living room. Seconds later, the sound went off, and an ancient yellow lab followed Anson creakily out of the den. He's harmless, Anson said to Abigail. I like dogs. He has a very intelligent face. Huck was always smart, mostly blind now and more than half deaf, but he's still got his smarts. Why don't we go on back to the great room, have a seat? How's your dad doing, Brooks? He's good, really good. That's good to hear. And the job? I like it, Captain. I like where I am and who I am there. He's a good cop, Anson said to Abigail. I hated losing him. How about a beer? I wouldn't say no. I would, Abigail said, 
then realized the simple truth sounded rude. I mean, if I could have some water. Sure. I got some lemonade. It's not half bad. That would be nice. Thank you. At Anson's direction, they settled into a seating area off the large, open kitchen. At the back, wide glass doors led out to a patio, where she saw what she assumed was an enormous grill under a black cover and several outdoor chairs and tables. As Anson got the drinks, the old dog shuffled over, sniffed at her, then rested his head on her knee. She stroked his head, rubbed his ears. If he bothers you, just tell him to go sit. He isn't bothering me. Abigail's got a dog, great dog. Bert's out in the car. What the hell did you leave him out there for? Go get him. We'll take this out back, let the two of them get acquainted and pal around. Bert would like that. If you're sure, I'll go get him. I ordered him to stay so he wouldn't get out of the car for Brooks. You go ahead. And just bring him on around the back. Side gates on the left. Thank you. When she went out, Anson handed Brooks the beer, jerked a thumb toward the sliders. What's going on, Brooks? He asked as they stepped out. A lot. Your lady covers it well, but she's got enough nerves lighting her up to power the whole city a little rock. She's got reason for them. I talked her into coming here to you because she needs help. And because I'm in love with her. Anson let out a breath, took a long swallow of beer. What kind of trouble is she in? I want her to tell you, and I need you to hear her out, all the way. I'm counting on you, Captain. She's not from around here, or up where you come from, either. No. But Bickford's her home now. We both wanted to stay that way. They heard the gate open and shut. Huck's head went up, not at the sound, Anson knew, at the scent. Anson's eyebrows lifted when Abigail walked around the house with Bert. That's one big, handsome bastard. He's very well behaved, Abigail assured him. Ami. She said when Huck, quivering, walked over to sniff the newcomer. Ami, jouer. Tails slashing the air, the dogs sniffed each other. Huck walked over to the fence line, lifted his leg. Bert followed suit. Then they wrestled. Huck's got some life in him yet. Anson offered Abigail the lemonade, gestured to a seat. Brooks said you had a story to tell me, Abigail. Yes. I should start by saying my name isn't Abigail Lowry. Technically. It's Elizabeth Fitch. When I was sixteen, I witnessed a man named Yakov Krotky, who is a lieutenant in the Volkov Crime Organization, murder his cousin, Alexei Gurievich, and my friend, Julie Masters. Anson sat back. After a moment, he glanced at Brooks. You did say a lot. Then he turned those steely eyes back on Abigail. Why don't you tell me about that? Chapter 25 She couldn't know if he believed her. His face showed nothing. No surprise, no doubt, no understanding. As Brooks had, he interrupted the flow a few times with questions, then only nodded so she'd continue. Before she finished, the dogs came back for rubs and were both sprawled out, exhausted from the play, when she stopped. I remember some of what you're telling me, Anson began. It was big news at the time, especially within law enforcement. Two U.S. Marshals killed, another wounded— the witness in a mob-related double murder missing. Your name and face was all over the national media for some weeks, and there were a number of interagency memos on you. Yes, I know. As well as an outstanding warrant for fleeing a scene, a bolo and APB. You're wanted for questioning in the matter of those agents' deaths and the explosion of the safe house. 
her fingers linked together, painfully tight, in her lap. Interoffice communication indicates that Keegan and Cosgrove have been taken at their word. Wanted for questioning is simply a ruse in order to charge me for murder or accessory to murder. How would you be privy to interoffice communication? Saying nothing, Brooks reached over, unlaced her fingers, kept his hand on hers. I'm a computer scientist and specialize in security. I'm also a hacker. And you're telling me you can access confidential files and memos inside the U.S. Marshal Service and the FBI? Yes, I'm very skilled and this has been a priority for me. Both Keegan and Cosgrove made statements which claim they came in, found Terry down in the kitchen and her weapon missing. As they began to call it in, they were fired on by persons unknown and Cosgrove sustained a wound. As Keegan returned fire, the lights went out. Keegan was able to get Cosgrove outside, call in the incident. But before he could go back in for Terry, or to find me or John, the house exploded. He also claimed he believed he saw someone fleeing. That about sums up what I remember from it, Anson agreed. One of the prevailing theories is I grew panicked, or perhaps bored, and contacted the Volkovs to make a deal. They tracked me to the safe house, and I fought with Terry as I tried to get out. Either I or persons unknown associated with the Volkovs shot John, fired on Keegan and Cosgrove, and I either escaped in the confusion or was taken. The assassins then blew up the house to cover the tracks. Or I did it. A sixteen-year-old girl getting the draw on two marshals and blowing up a house. Brooks shook his head. I wouldn't buy it. A highly intelligent girl, who'd been trained personally by one of those marshals in firearms, who'd requested and received five thousand in cash from her trust fund, who'd forged IDs, had spent a summer while the legal wheel slowly turned, thinking about what would happen to her once she testified. The logic of it stood firmly enough for Abigail. It's reasonable to believe that girl snapped tried to make it all go away. Reasonable, Anson commented, when there's nothing to contradict the statements and timelines, such as a conflicting statement from an eyewitness. I don't believe the theory I murdered John and Terry or had a part in their murders will hold, Abigail told him, but I do believe if I'm taken in, that won't matter. I'll be dead within 24 hours. It might be staged as a suicide, but I favor direct elimination. You're very cool about it, Anson observed. I've had a number of years to consider what they'd do to me if they could. Why come in now? She looked at Brooks. If I don't, nothing changes, and so much already has. Brooks asked me to trust him, and in doing so, to trust you. I'm trying. She's been feeding anonymously an FBI agent based in Chicago with intel on the Volkov organization. And you have that intel because you're hacking into the Volkov network? Puffing out his cheeks, Anson sat back. You must be one hell of a hacker. Yes, I am. The Volkov organization is very computer-centric, and they believe they're very safe, very well shielded. They have excellent techs, she added. I'm better than they are. Also, Ilya is consistently careless in this area. It's, in my opinion, a kind of arrogance. He uses email and texts routinely for both business and personal correspondence. They've made a number of arrests on that intel, Captain, Brooks said. Who's your FBI contact? Abigail looked at Brooks, got his nod. Special Agent Elise Garrison. Why didn't you go to her with your story? If it leaked, and I know there's at least one Volkov mole inside the Chicago office, she could be taken, tortured, killed. Killed outright. She could be used to lure me in. They haven't been able to trace the contact to me, once they do, her life and mine are put at serious risk. 
You want someone to make contact for you, someone who isn't, as far as any check would show, connected in any way to Elizabeth Fitch. Someone, Brooks continued, with a sterling record in law enforcement, someone with position and authority, credibility, someone this garrison is likely to believe. And if I buy into this, I go to Chicago and make this contact. What then? It opens the door for us to set up a meet between her and Abigail at a location we choose. I would continue to monitor law enforcement chatter and communications so I'd know if they'd attempt a trap or if any of the people I believe or suspect to be in league with the Volkovs learn of the communication. You're crossing a lot of lines here. He turned a cool, hard eye on Brooks. Both of you. Tell me, Captain, what do you think her chances are of living to testify if she goes in straight, with the moles in place, the Volkoffs whole? I believe in the system, Brooks. I believe they'd protect her. But I can't blame her for not believing it. If it was someone I loved, I'm not sure I'd believe it either. He exhaled deeply. In the quiet yard, with the dogs softly snoring, a little garden fountain gurgling, Abigail wondered the scrape of her nerves under her skin didn't screech like nails on a blackboard. We may be able to do this your way, smoke out Keegan and Cosgrove and those like them, Anson began. We may be able to make some key arrests that put a hard dent in the Volkoff organization. And then? Are you willing to go into witness protection? He asked Brooks. To give up where you like to be, who you like to be? Yes. No, Abigail said immediately. No, I wouldn't have agreed to come here if I believed that would be a result. Elizabeth Fitch will meet Special Agent Garrison, will testify. Only three people know Elizabeth Fitch and Abigail Lowry are the same person, and that has to remain constant. If a connection is made between them, I'll disappear. I can do it. Abigail? No, she said again, quietly, fiercely, to Brooks. You need to do the right thing, and you need to protect me. You can do both. I'm trusting you to do both. You have to trust me. I'll be Elizabeth again, for this, and then she's gone. She'll disappear, and Abigail can live her life. I know how to bring down the Volkoffs, and in a way I believe they'll never fully recover from. It's not about guns and knives and blood. It's about keystrokes. You're going to take them down with a computer? Anson demanded. Her eyes, calm and green, met his. That's exactly right. If I can do what I've theorized and the authorities listen and act, this will be over. I'm putting my life in your hands, Captain Anson, because Brooks trusts and respects you without qualification. Let's go in, have some coffee, Anson said after a moment, and talk this through. She insisted on driving back. Brooks had barely slept in thirty-six hours and would be on duty within another six, so he kicked back the seat and caught a little sleep on the drive and gave her time to go over everything again. Joseph Anson would go to Chicago, make contact. He would not use or reveal the name Abigail Lowry, but tell Agent Garrison that Elizabeth Fitch had come to him told him the story, given him the agent's name. He'd relate information Abigail had previously funneled to Garrison. If Garrison followed her previous pattern, she would report only to her direct superior. Then the process would begin. So many things could go wrong. But if they went right, she could belong to the man sleeping beside her, she could learn what to do at backyard barbecues. She could become Abigail so that everything that happened from that point on would be real. 
she would finally look out from the witness chair in the courtroom, stare into the eyes of Korotki, Ilya, Sergei Volkov, and speak the truth. As Elizabeth. No, as Liz, she thought. At least in her mind, she'd speak as Liz for Julie, John, and Terry. And she'd use everything she'd learned in the past twelve years to strip the bones of the Volkov organization clean. He stirred as she turned toward her cabin. I've been thinking, he said. I thought you were sleeping. Some of both. He brought the seat back up, scrubbed at his face with his hands. So I was thinking you should ask me to move in with you. I'm practically living here now, he added when she said nothing. But maybe you could make it official. Do you want to live here so you can protect me? That would be a side benefit. Other side benefits include having my stuff handy, some closet and drawer space, and easy access to sex. All of those are pluses, but the main reason I want to live here is because I love you and I want to be with you. She sat for a moment, looking at her cabin. Hers, she thought. The house, the gardens, the greenhouse, the little creek, the woods. She'd come to think of them as hers, to feel that belonging. For the first time, she'd come to think of a place as home. Hers. If you moved in, you'd need security codes and keys. They'd sure be handy. I'd like to think about it, if that's all right. Sure. The single word, so easy as he got out of the car, opened the back for the dog to jump out, told her he was confident he'd overcome any objection she might voice and have his way. It should have irritated her, she thought. It should even insult her. And yet it did neither. It simply reminded her who he was. Theirs. She tried out the word, let herself wonder over it while they waited for Bert to relieve himself after the drive. Theirs in the pretty, star-dazzled night, with the flowers glowing, the creek murmuring, and the soft breeze urging the leaves to whisper an answer. Their house, their gardens, their greenhouse and creek and woods. Hers was safer, quieter. Theirs, full of compromise and questions. And promise. She unlocked the front door, reset the alarm. Would you like to move in with me? Well, that's a big step. I'm going to have to think about it. You just said... She turned into his grin, felt her lips curve in response as she locked up. You're teasing. Caught me. He laid his hands on her shoulders, turned her to face him again. But it is a big step for you, I know. It's a more natural progression for you. You were raised in a traditional two-parent home. Boy, my mother'd be pissed to be labeled traditional. He put an arm around her shoulders to lead her upstairs. We'll keep that between you and me. I never considered sharing a home with anyone, and I've only begun to believe it's possible for me to stay here, to have a home here. Believe it and keep believing it. No point sending negative thoughts out into the universe. Optimistic or pessimistic thoughts don't influence events. How do you know? Playfully, he gave her hair a quick tug. You can't know what other people are thinking or wishing or believing unless they tell you. And what about the whole faith can move mountains deal? I've never seen a mountain move, much less through faith. Literal brain. He tapped her forehead. What about volcanoes? A volcano moves the hell out of a mountain. It's ludicrous to posit that a rupture in the Earth's crust, the diverging and converging of tectonic plates, the release of lava, gases, and ash through those ruptures can be caused by faith. Or the lack of it. Did I posit? I don't know what got into me. He saw her roll her eyes as she walked toward the bathroom. 
I made a volcano for a science project in sixth grade. It was very cool. For the first time, she didn't shut the door, but continued to talk to him as she prepared for bed. It's a very good project for a young student. Plus, cool. He walked in, picked up his toothbrush as she washed her face. I wanted to name it the Devil's Fart, but my father convinced me my grade would be adversely affected. Wise. I called it that in my head, though, so it made the whole baking soda, food coloring, and vinegar lava spewing out of the flour paste over soda bottle cone more memorable. I bet you killed in science projects. I did well. It felt odd, but in an interesting way, to share the bathroom sink with him. I built an underwater volcano on converging tectonic plates to demonstrate how islands are formed. He lowered his toothbrush, narrowed his eyes at her in the mirror. Underwater volcano. Yes, hot water always rises to the surface of cold and floats, with the baked clay model. Baked clay. Yes, and the remote-controlled plates, I was able to create a very satisfying eruption. How old were you? Nine. Show off. I did enjoy doing well in school. You're talking about science projects, so I'll relax and sleep better. It's working for me. She found when she lay beside him in the dark, her mind drifting, it worked for her as well. Brooks arrested Roland Babbitt as his first official duty of the morning. He felt pretty damn good about knocking on Babbitt's door at 7 a.m., better yet when the heavy-eyed, bed-headed Babbitt opened the door. Roland Babbitt? Yeah? Is there a problem? There is for you. I'm Chief Gleason of the Bickford Town Police, and this is my deputy, Boyd Fitzwater. I have a warrant for your arrest. Huh? And another to search your room, belongings, and vehicle. You're going to need to get dressed and come with us. What's this about? Under arrest? That's crazy. Not considering you're in possession of burglary tools, and used same at 2.15 this morning to illegally enter the Ozark suite, which is both locked and posted. Roland's eyes, not so heavy now, took a long study of Brooks's face. I want to make a phone call. No problem. You can have your phone call once we're at the station. I'm going to give you a chance to get dressed, or we can take you in while you're in the hotel robe. It's a nice robe. I'd like to get dressed. Okay, then. Boyd, why don't you read Mr. Babbitt his rights while he puts some pants on? Brooks held up the search warrant before he started wandering the room. Nice view. Mr. Conroy does it up right. You try the restaurant for dinner? Room service. Roland dragged on a pair of pants, pulled out a T-shirt. I had the steak. How was it? Bloody and good. Yeah, they do it right. He opened the Navy backpack, poked through, then put the lockpick set in an evidence bag. You visitin'? Despite the circumstance, Roland snorted out a laugh. Everybody asks. You know by now I'm here on business. Stube and Price out of Little Rock. As he sealed a mini tape recorder into a bag, Brooks's voice stayed smooth and easy as warm cream. I was on the job down there. You probably know that by now, too. That's a fancy firm with fancy prices, Mr. Babbitt. We do good work. I don't doubt it. He shot Roland a friendly smile. Too bad you don't have better taste in clients. Not my call. Do you mind if I brush my teeth, empty my bladder? I'd mind if you didn't. Brooks continued to search the room while Boyd stood in the open bathroom doorway. We're a quiet town, Brooks said conversationally. Oh, it can heat up some now and then, especially this time of year and on through the summer. A lot of tourists, a lot of conflicting personalities, you could say, stewing in all that heat. But we don't often run into P.I.s from fancy city firms doing some B&E right in our landmark hotel. 
I'm going to get my ass kicked over this. In a gesture that mirrored his attitude, Roland spat toothpaste in the sink. Lose my bonus. I was hoping to bring my wife down for a kid-free break after she has the baby. When she do? August 15th? October's a pretty time in the Ozarks, Brooks commented as Roland came out. We'd be happy to have you, when you're visiting. Boyd, you can finish up with the search. I'll take Mr. Babbitt in. You're not going to cuff me? Brooks offered that friendly smile again. You want me to? No, I appreciate it. I don't figure you're going to run, and if you did, where are you going to go? He didn't run. Even if he'd had somewhere to run, he was made, his cover blown, the job in pieces. At the station, Brooks gave him a cup of decent enough coffee, a phone, and a few minutes of privacy, at a desk rather than in a cell. After he made the call, Roland sat brooding. You finished up there? Brooks asked him. Yeah, finished. Why don't we talk in my office? Jeff, Brooks said to his part-timer, don't go poking in or sending in any calls, all right? Not unless it's important. Yes, sir, chief. Have a seat. Brooks closed his office door, walked over to lean a hip on his desk. Well, I'm going to tell you straight. You're in some trouble here, Roland. I got a lawyer coming down. Fancy lawyer from the fancy firm, I expect. Still, we got you pretty cold on the B&E. Camera caught you in the hall, at the door, then the other cameras caught you poking around inside the suite. Got your lock picks. As if sympathetic, Brooks let out a breath, shook his head. Even a fancy lawyer's gonna have a time getting around that, don't you figure? Could mean a little jail time and put a hurt on your license. And a baby coming? I'd hate for your wife to visit you in jail in her condition. Jail's doubtful, but the hurt on my license? Hell. Roland pressed his fingers to his eyes. Might be okay there. It's the first ding on my record. Brooks lifted his shoulders, let them fall. Might be. I'm not usually sloppy. I figured the look around for a breeze. I didn't spot the cameras. Don't be too hard on yourself. They weren't there until after you stopped by Abigail's. Uh-huh. Now, Roland's eyes met Brooks in perfect understanding. She, her dog, and her Glock scared the hell out of me. You scared her. She's a city girl still, Brooks lied cheerfully. Alone out there, no close neighbors. Add to that how she makes her living. I'm sure you know that already. Working security, always looking for how people get around it and do what they do. She's a bit jumpy. You'd have to be to have security cameras in the woods. Oh, she's always experimenting, running programs and what she calls scenarios. It happens you walked into one. Shook her up enough to have her lock herself in the house till I got home. You know, in case you were some axe murderer instead of a lost photographer. She didn't look shook up, Roland muttered. Well, Abigail, she puts on a good front, and the dog helps her confidence. She told me about you, and I had to wonder. You gave her your real name. I.D. was in my pack. She had the gun. I didn't want to annoy her with a lie if she checked my pack. But I didn't consider she or you would run me. Cops. We're just naturally cynical and suspicious. So, Roland, here's the thing. I know who'd hire a P.I. from a fancy firm to poke around at Abigail, at me, at the Conroys, and the hotel. I can't confirm or deny without my legal counsel. I'm not asking you to, I'm telling you. Lincoln Blake would do close to anything to get that asshole son of his off, including hiring out for somebody to plant false evidence, make false statements. Where he'd been slouched and sulky in his seat, Roland now straightened. Listen, 
I don't go there, not for any client, not for any fee. Neither does the firm. We wouldn't have the reputation we do otherwise. Off the record, I'll say I believe that. But on it, Brooks gave a careless shrug. Is there a deal coming along? Might be. Russ Conroy's my oldest and closest friend. His parents are family to me, and his mama broke down and cried after she saw what that fucker and his friends did to that suite. It's considerably better now, but Brooks picked up a file, handed it to Roland. We took those after Justin Blake and his idiot friends got done with the place. Jesus, Roland muttered as he examined the photos. That kind of damage, that's not careless or stupid or childish. It's downright mean. That's just what Justin Blake is. Brooks reached over to take the file back. And when the fucker managed to make bail, he comes out to the house of the woman I'm in love with, stoned, armed, in the middle of the night. He was stupid enough to take a jab at me with the knife he'd brought to slash my tires with. He upset my woman, and Roland, that upsets me. You might see why she reacted the way she did when you came hiking on down to the house. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Justin caused over a hundred thousand in damages to that suite. He punctured my tire, tried to puncture me, and scared my lady. And that's over and above him being a pain in my ass since I took this job. He's going down for what he's done, Roland. I will make it my mission in life to see to it. He's earned it, and if I gave a rat's flea-bitten ass, I'd say he needs it. He's got something twisted in him. The kind of thing we've both seen in others who end up dead or killing somebody. I'd like to say something, off the record. All right, then, just between you and me. I don't like working for Blake. He's a son of a bitch. There's nothing about his son you just said I don't agree with. I'll take my lumps on this if I have to, but I hate taking them on behalf of those two dicks. I can't blame you a bit. So here's the deal, before the lawyer gets here. Go away, Roland. I don't just mean leave town. Though, as I said, you come back to visit with your wife, we'll be happy to see you. I mean go away from this. It's upsetting my friends. It's upsetting my lady. And you're wasting your time because Justin Blake isn't going to slide his way out from this one. I don't blame anybody for doing a job they're hired to do, on the right side of the law, that is. But this can go pretty hard on you, and I can make it so your firm takes a hit. Maybe it's not much, considering, but I don't know why they'd want the bad publicity. I have to turn in my reports. You go right ahead on that. You didn't find anything on me, on Abigail, on the Conroys, because there's nothing to find. But if you keep poking at us, I'll find out, and it'll go different. You got far enough in this to know computers are Abigail's playground. There's a threat buried in there. I'm not burying a thing. I'm giving you the facts as I see them. I can let this go. You keep your clean record, you turn in your reports, and go home to your wife. Your lawyer's not going to cook you up a better deal. Why are you? For the reasons I just gave you. And one more. I don't much want to lock you up, Roland. That's another fact. If I'd gotten a different sense of you, if I thought you were the kind who enjoys working for a man like Blake, who'd edge over more than crossing a property line or going into a locked room to take a look around, you'd be in a cell right now. I'd work to keep you there. I'd like to call my boss, give him the status. Go ahead. Brooks pushed off the desk. I met your mother. Brooks leaned back again. Did you? I walked down, getting that sense, like you said. That house? It's amazing. We're partial to it. Go ahead and make your call, Brooks told him, and strolled out. Chapter 26 Abigail put everything else aside and focused entirely on the creation of the virus. 
She'd made numerous attempts to piggyback it on the worm she'd already constructed, but the results weren't satisfactory. She could do considerable damage with the worm, but with the worm boring openings into the Volkov network, the virus that followed, spreading through those openings, would devastate. To accomplish everything she needed, it had to be very fast, very complete, and trigger no alerts. She'd always considered the project a kind of hobby, one she'd hoped would one day pay off. Now, it was a mission. If she had time to build more equipment or the luxury of hiring another skilled tech or two, but she didn't, so speculating proved useless. This was only for her. In any case, over time she'd developed her own programming language, the better to thwart anyone who attempted to hack into her files, and even if she could hire on, she'd have to teach someone her language and techniques. Faster, more efficient to do it herself. She ran the next test, watched her codes fly by, and thought, no, no, no. It remained too unwieldy, too separate, took too long. She sat back, her hair twisted up off her neck and secured with a pencil. As she studied the screen, she drank iced green tea for clarity of thinking. The tea, the two yoga breaks she'd made herself take, the absolute quiet, didn't appear to help. When her alarm sounded and Bert went on alert, she checked her monitor. She hadn't expected Brooks so early, she thought, as she spotted his cruiser, then glanced at the time. She'd worked straight through the morning and into the middle of the afternoon. Six hours, she thought, with no appreciable progress. Maybe it was beyond her after all. She started to get up to unlock the doors for him, then remembered she'd given him keys and the security codes. An uneasy step, she admitted, but the advantage right that moment was she didn't have to stop to let him in. Still, there would be someone in the house, in her space. How was she supposed to concentrate on something this complex, this delicate, unless she was alone? Which tore apart her fantasy of a state-of-the-art computer lab and a team of highly skilled techs. But that was only fantasy, because she always worked alone, until... Hey! Brooks walked in, set a bag on the counter. How's it going? Not as well as I'd like. I need to try another sequence, test again. How long have you been at it? It doesn't matter how long, it's not done. Okay, I'll get out of your hair as soon as I put this stuff away. I brought some of my things over, so I'll deal with that upstairs. If you're not done when I am, I'll find something to do. Mm, was her only response. She tried not to tense up at the sound of the refrigerator, the cupboards opening and closing. When silence returned, she let out a cleansing breath and dived in again. She forgot he was there. Over the next two hours, she lost herself in the codes and sequences. When the headache and eye strain finally stopped her, she rose for medication, for fluids, and remembered him. She went upstairs, the quiet held so absolute she thought he must be napping, but she didn't find him in the bedroom. Curious, she opened the closet. There were his clothes, hanging with hers. Shirts, pants, a suit. She'd never seen him in a suit. She trailed her fingers over the sleeve as she studied the shoes and boots on the floor of the closet. They shared a closet, she thought. So much more intimate and vital, somehow, than sharing a bed. Crossing over, she opened drawers in the bureau. She'd meant to reorganize to give him space, but had forgotten in the work. He'd seen to it himself. She'd need to alter some of his choices, but that was a small thing. Closing drawers, she stepped back, took a turn around the room. Should she buy another dresser, a chest of drawers? Would they need one? Would he stay? A movement out the window caught her eye, and stepping closer, she saw him, hoeing at weeds in her vegetable patch. He'd mounded up her potato plants, something else she'd meant to do that day. Sweat dampened his shirt, gleamed wetly on his arms, 
and a ball cap shaded his face. And, oh, the thrill of it! The unexpected and staggering thrill of it! His clothes hung in the closet with hers as she stood at the bedroom window and watched him work the garden under a sky like bleached denim. She spun away from the window, hugging herself, then ran downstairs. In the kitchen, she found the food he'd brought in the fridge and the dozen lemons she'd bought a few days earlier. She made fresh lemonade, filled two tall glasses with cracked ice, and poured. She put the pitcher and glasses on a tray and carried it all outside. It's too hot to hoe, she called out. You'll be dehydrated. Nearly done. She walked out to him with the glasses as he finished the last row. It's fresh. While sweat trickled down his temples, he downed half the glass without pause. Thanks. You've done so much work. Leaning on the hoe, he studied the garden. I'm hoping to sample those butter beans come harvest. I'm fond of butter beans. Those are lima beans. You're standing in the south, honey. After a roll of his shoulders, he downed the rest of his lemonade. I haven't worked a garden since I headed down to Little Rock. Didn't know I missed it. Still, it's hot and close. She touched his hand to bring his gaze back to her. I wasn't very welcoming before. Work's allowed to get in the way now and again. Mine does, and will. Mine, in this case, is frustrating. I thought I'd be closer. Can't help you on that. I don't understand a damn thing you're doing. But I can work a garden, and I can grill up those steaks I picked up, so you can have more time at it. He cocked his head as he studied her. But I'd say it's time for a break all around, and I sure as hell need a shower. You're very sweaty, she agreed, and took the hoe from him to carry it to her little garden shed. I can pick some of the lettuce and a few other things for a salad when you're done. I'm thinking we. You've already done more than your share in the garden. Not we in the garden. He took her hand, pulling her along toward the house. We in the shower. I really should get wet with me. He paused to take off his dirty boots, sweaty socks. Did I ever tell you about this swimming hole we used to frequent? No. It's not that far from here, a little higher in the hills, really more a bend in the river than a pool, but it worked fine. Taking her glass, he set them both down on the counter as he moved her through the kitchen. Water's cool. The color of tobacco, I'd say, but clear. Russ and I and some others used to ride our mountain bikes up there on those long, schoolless days of summer, strip down and cool off. The first time I skinny-dipped with a girl was there, at what we locals call Fiddlehead Pool, because there's fiddlehead ferns thick as thieves up there. I'll take you sometime. That sounds very interesting, but right now... He'd managed to get her into the bedroom, began to back her toward the bath. You need to get naked and wet. Let me help you with that. You appear to be very determined, she commented when he pulled her shirt over her head. Oh, I am. I am. And flicked open the catch of her bra. Then I suppose there's no point in arguing. No point at all. Reaching behind her, he turned the shower on, then flipped open the button of her fly. Then I should cooperate. That'd be the sensible thing. I prefer doing the sensible thing. She drew his shirt off, let it drop. Hallelujah. But he started to hold her back when she would have moved into him. Let me rinse some of this sweat off first. I don't mind it. It's basic and natural and... She pressed her lips to the side of his throat. Salty. You about kill me, Abigail. That's God's truth. She wanted to, wanted to make him want and yearn and quiver as he made her. She embraced the musky scent of him, 
the good sweat of physical labor as she stripped off his pants, as he stripped off hers, and the water ran cool over her head, down her body. It feels good, she murmured. So good when his mouth took her mouth, when his hands took her body, when she tasted his hunger for her, felt his need for her. She imagined them sinking into cool, tobacco-colored water in the bend of a river where fiddlehead ferns grew thick and green and moonlight shimmered in rays through a canopy of trees. I want to go to your swimming hole. We will. In the moonlight, she said as her head fell back, as his lips skimmed over the column of her throat. I've never been romantic, not before you, but you make me want moonlight and wildflowers and whispers in the dark. I'll give you all of it and more. He slicked her wet hair back, framed her face to lift it to his. And more. Promises and secrets and all the things I never understood. I want them with you. I love you so much. I love you. That's already more than I ever had. More still. He drew her into the kiss, long and slow and deep, as the water showered over them. He'd have given her the moon itself if he could, and an ocean of wildflowers. Promises. He could give her those. A promise to love her, to help her find peace of mind, a safe haven. And moments like this, alone, where they could tend to each other, pleasure each other, shut the world and all its troubles, its pressures and its demands, away. She washed him, and he her, inch by inch, arousing, lingering, prolonging. Now the scent of honey and almond rising up, the slick, slippery slide of hands, of bodies, the quick catch of breath, the long, low sigh. So when he braced her, when he filled her, there was moonlight and wildflowers, there were whispers and promises, and more. There was, she thought as she surrendered, everything. The sensation of contentment stayed with her as she stood in the kitchen, contemplating doing something interesting with potatoes. Brooks liked potatoes, to go with the steak and salad. She glanced, a little guiltily, at her computer as she poured wine for both of them. I should try again, now that we've had our break. Give your big brain a little rest. Let's sit down a minute. I've got a couple updates for you. Updates? Why didn't you already tell me? You were involved when I first got home, he reminded her. Then I was distracted by shower sex. He sat at the counter, and since she'd already poured it for him, picked up his second glass of lemonade. I guess we'll take them in order. I had a talk with Roland Babbitt. The cameras I borrowed from you did the trick, caught him going into the Ozark suite using B and E tools to do it. You arrested him? In a manner of speaking. I have to say, I liked the guy once we got things aired and ironed out. He ran it through for her, but she didn't sit. Instead, she kept her hands busy, scrubbing, then quartering small, red-skinned potatoes. You told him he frightened me. I may have colored your reaction a little differently than the reality of it, but I figure your pride can handle it. You prevaricated, so he'd feel some sympathy toward me and less curiosity about the cameras, the gun, and so on. I like prevaricated. It's an important word, and classier than lied. You believed him, too. Believe he'll just leave and not pursue his investigation. I do. He's a family man at the base of it, Abigail, and with his wife expecting their third child, he doesn't want to risk his livelihood on this or go through the upset and pressures of a trial. His firm isn't going to want to deal with the publicity we could generate, especially as one of their operatives saw photos of the damage on the hotel. And over that, he doesn't like Blake or the boy. But he works for them. Roundabout, yeah. 
I work for them roundabout, as I'm a public official. Doesn't mean I have to like them either. You're right, of course. I made him a good deal, one he can live with. He can turn in his reports, fulfill the contract with the client, move on. If there's no more danger from that quarter, the logic you use to contact the authorities now to move forward with testifying doesn't hold. He reached out to still her hands for a moment to bring her eyes to his. It does if you consider that down the road something like this may happen again. If you consider you're never going to feel rooted here the way I think we both want you to until you finish this. That's true, but perhaps we could delay, take more time to. She trailed off when he said nothing, only looked at her. Delay is an excuse. It's fear, not courage. I'm never going to question your courage or criticize the way you've coped. That means a great deal to me. I want it over, Brooks. I do. And having taken appreciable steps toward that end is frightening. But it's also a relief. Then I hope you'll be relieved to know Captain Anson's in Chicago. He intends to contact Agent Garrison tonight. He called you? Late this afternoon, on the drop phone. I'm grateful to him. She began mincing garlic, her eyes trained on her hands, on the knife, as the pressure built in her chest. I hope she'll believe him. You picked a smart, capable, honest woman. Yes, I was very careful in my selection. Anson's a smart, capable, honest man. We couldn't do better. We both made logical choices. It's good it's happening quickly. Delay isn't sensible once decisions are made, so it's best it's moving forward quickly. She poured olive oil, spooned some Dijon mustard with it in a bowl. After a distracted moment, she added a splash of balsamic vinegar. Except for my part, you'll get there. I'm not confident of that at this point. I am so take some of mine. He watched her spoon a little Worcestershire in the bowl, then some Italian dressing he knew she used primarily for marinades. In went the garlic, some pepper, a little chopped fresh basil. What are you doing there, Abigail? I'm going to coat the potatoes with this and roast them. I'm making it up, she added as she began to whisk the mixture. It's science, and science keeps me grounded. Experimenting is satisfying when the results are pleasing. Even when they aren't, the process of the experiment is interesting. He couldn't take his eyes off her. She whisked, sniffed, narrowed her own eyes, added a little something more. Pretty as a picture, he thought, with her hair still a little damp from the shower and pulled back in a short, glossy brown ponytail— She'd put on a sleeveless shirt of quiet gray and jeans that rolled up into casual cuffs just above her knees. One of her nines sat at easy reach on the counter by the back door. Her face, those wide green eyes, stayed so sober, so serious as she put the potatoes into a large bowl, poured the experimental mixture over them, reached for a wooden spoon. Marry me, Abigail. She dropped the spoon. Bert sauntered over to sniff at it politely. Well, that just popped out, he said when she just stared at him. You were joking. She picked up the spoon, set it in the sink, lifted another from a pottery sleeve. Because I'm cooking and it's a domestic area. I'm not joking. I'd figured to set the scene a lot better when I asked you— that moonlight you wanted, flowers, maybe some champagne. A picnic's what I had in mind. A moonlight picnic up at the spot you like with the view of the hills. But I'm sitting here, looking at you, and it just popped out. He came around the counter, took the spoon, set it aside so he could take both her hands. So marry me, Abigail. You're not thinking clearly— this isn't something we can consider, much less discuss, particularly when my situation remains in flux. Things are always in flux. Not this. 
he added. I swear to you, we'll end this, we'll fix this. But there's always going to be something. And I think now's the perfect time, before it's ended, before it's fixed, because we should be able to promise each other when things outside aren't perfect. If it goes wrong, then it goes wrong. We don't. Marriage. She drew her hands free, used them to stir the coating on the potatoes. It's a civil contract, broken at least half the time with another document. People enter into it promising forever, when in reality, I'm promising you forever. You can't know. I believe. You, you've just moved in, just hung clothes in the closet. Noticed that, did you? Yes. We've known each other less than three months. She got out a casserole, and, busy, 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 scooped and poured the coated potatoes into it. We have a very difficult situation to address. If you feel strongly about the subject, and continue to feel strongly, I'd be willing to discuss our views on the matter at some more rational time. Delay is an excuse. She slammed the casserole into the oven, whirled on him. You think it's clever to throw my own words back at me. I think it's apt. And why do you make me lose my temper? I don't like to lose my temper. Why don't you lose yours? I don't mind getting pissed. He shrugged, picked up his lemonade. I'm not right at the moment. I'm more interested in the way you're twisting yourself into knots because I love you and I want to marry you. I'm not twisting myself into knots. I've very clearly given you my opinion on marriage, and... No, you very clearly gave me your mother's opinion. Very carefully, she picked up a cloth towel, wiped her hands. That was uncalled for. I don't think so, and it wasn't said to hurt you. You're giving me cold logic and statistics. That's your mother's way. I'm a scientist. Yeah, you are. You're also a giving... Caring woman, one who wants moonlight and wildflowers. Tell me what that part of you wants, what that part of you feels, not what your mother pushed into your head as long as she could. How can this be so easy for you? Because you're the one. Because I've never felt for anyone what I feel for you. I want a lifetime with you, Abigail. I want a home with you, family with you. I want to make children with you, raise them with you. If you truly don't want any of that with me, I'll give you the best I've got and hope you change your mind. I just need you to tell me you don't want it. I do want it, but I... But? I don't know. How can anyone think when they feel so much? You can. You've got that big brain to go along with that big heart. Marry me, Abigail. He was right, of course. She could think. She could think of what her life had been like without him, and what it would be if she shoved those feelings down and relied only on the flat chill of logic. I couldn't put my real name on a marriage license. He cocked his brows. Well, in that case, forget it. The laugh rushed out of her. I don't want to forget it. I want to say yes. So say yes. Yes! She closed her eyes, felt dizzy with delight. Yes! And threw her arms around him. This is right, he murmured, turned his lips to her damp cheek. I'm the luckiest man in the world. He drew her back to kiss her lips, her other cheek. My mother says that women cry when they're happy because they're so filled with the feeling they want to let it out, share it, and teardrops spread that happiness. It feels true. I hope the potatoes turn out well. On a laugh, he dropped his brow to hers. You're thinking about the potatoes? Now? Because you asked me to marry you when I was creating the recipe— if it comes out well, it'll be a very special one. We'll pass the story to our children. If they suck, we can still pass the story on. But we won't enjoy the potatoes. 
Jesus, I really love you. He squeezed her until she gasped. I never believed I would have this, any of this, and now I have so much. We're going to make a life together and create a family. We're mates. She stepped back, gripped his hands. And more. We're going to merge our lives. It's amazing that people do. They remain individuals with their own makeup, and still they become and function as a single unit. Yours, mine, but also, and most powerfully, ours. It's a good word, ours. Let's use it a lot. I should go out and pick our lettuce for our salad so we can have our dinner. We's another good word. We'll go out. I like that better. She started to turn for the door, went still as her thoughts aligned. Made it. Merged. If you want to mate and merge again, better turn down those potatoes. Not piggybacked. Not layered or attached. Integrated. Merged. Separate makeups, individual codes, but merged into one entity. I don't think you're talking about us anymore. It's the answer. A blended threat. Yes, I tried that. But it has to be more. Different than combining. It has to be mated. Why didn't I think of it before? I can do this. I believe I can do this. I need to try something. Have at it. I can handle dinner. Except I don't know when to take those potatoes out. Oh, she looked at the clock, calculated... Mix and turn them in another fifteen minutes. They should be done thirty minutes after that. Within an hour, she'd recalculated, rewritten codes, restructured the algorithm. She ran preliminary tests, noted the areas she'd need to adjust or enhance. When she pulled her mind out of the work, she had no idea where Brooks and Bert were, but saw Brooks had left the oven on warm. She found them both on the back porch. Brooks with a book, Bert with a rawhide. I've made you wait for dinner. Just gotta throw the steaks on. How'd it go? It needs work, and it's far from perfect. Even when I complete it, I'll need to Romulanize it. Do what to it? Oh, it's a term I use in my programming language. The Romulans are a fictional alien race. From Star Trek. I enjoy Star Trek. Every nerd does. The way he used the word nerd struck like an endearment and never failed to make her smile. I don't know if that's true, but I do. The Romulans had a cloaking device, one that made their starship invisible. So you need to make your virus thing invisible. Romulanize it. Yes. Disguising it as benign, like a Trojan horse, for instance, is an option, but cloaked is better. And it's the right way. It's going to work. Then we have a lot to celebrate. They had sunset, and what Abigail thought of as their engagement dinner. At moonrise, the phone in Brooks's pocket rang. That's the captain. Abigail put her hands in her lap, linked her fingers, squeezed them. She made herself breathe slowly as she listened to Brooks's end of the conversation and interpreted what Anson told him. He made contact, she said, when Brooks ended the call. He did. She was skeptical, suspicious. I'd think less of her if she hadn't been. She checked his credentials, asked a lot of questions, grilled him, basically. She knows your case. I expect every agent and marshal in Chicago does. He can't swear she believed he didn't know where you are, but there's not a lot she can do about that, as there's no connection or communication between you. But they'll need me to come in. They'll want to interview me. Interview Elizabeth Fitch in person. You're in control of that. His eyes on hers, he laid a hand over her tensed ones. You go when you're ready. They talked over two hours and agreed to meet tomorrow. We'll know more then. She's contacted her superior by now. Ten minutes after Anson left, she came out, got in her car. Again, he can't swear she didn't make the tale, but he followed her to the assistant director's house. 
Anson called to let us know right after she went inside. He's on the move. Didn't figure to be smart to sit on the house. They know I'm still alive now. They know I'm Tvoi Drug. Both of those things are in your favor from their point of view. Logically, she breathed deep. There's no turning back now. For either of us. I want to work, at least another hour or two. Okay, but don't push it too hard. We've got a barbecue tomorrow. Oh, but it's easy, and it's normal, and it's a break I figure both of us can use. A couple hours away from all this. He stroked a hand down her hair. It'll be fine, Abigail. Trust me. And we've got news. We're engaged. Oh, God. On a laugh, he gave a tug on the hair he'd just stroked. My family's going to do handsprings, I expect. I've got to take care of getting you a ring, he added. Shouldn't you wait to tell them if something goes wrong? We're going to make sure nothing does. He kissed her lightly. Don't work too late. Work, she thought, when he left her alone. At least there she knew what she was doing, what she was up against. No turning back, she reminded herself as she sat at her station, for either of them, from any of it. And still, she felt more confident at the prospect of taking on the Russian mafia than she did attending a backyard barbecue. Chapter 27 she jolted out of the dream and into the dark. Not gunfire, she realized, but thunder. Not an explosion, but bursts of lightning. Just a storm, she thought, just wind and rain. Bad dream, Brooks murmured and reached through the dark for her hand. The storm woke me. But she slid out of bed, restless with it, to walk to the window, Wanting the rush of cool air, she opened it wide, let the wind sweep over her skin, through her hair. I did dream. Through another sizzle of lightning, she watched the whip and sway of trees. You asked before if I had nightmares or flashbacks. I didn't really answer. I don't often, as much as I did, and the dreams are more a replaying than a nightmare. Isn't that the same thing? I suppose it is, basically. She stood where she was, the wind a gush of cool, the sky a black egg cracked by jagged snaps of lightning. He waited for her to tell him, she knew. He owned such patience, but unlike her mother's, his offered kindness. I'm in my bedroom at the safe house. It's my birthday. I'm happy. I've just put on the earrings and the sweater John and Terry gave me as gifts. And in the dream, I think, as I did then, how pretty they are. I think I'll wear them for the good, strong feelings they give me when I testify. Then I hear the gunshots. She left the window wide as she turned around to see him sitting up in bed, watching her. Kindness, she thought again. She hoped she never took his innate kindness for granted. It happens very slowly in the dream, though it didn't happen slowly. I remember everything, every detail, every sound, every movement. If I had the skill, I could draw it, scene by scene, and replay it like an animated film. It's hard on you to remember that clearly. I... she hadn't thought of that. I suppose it is. It was storming, like tonight. Thunder, lightning, wind, rain. The first shot startled me, made my pulse skip, but I didn't fully believe it was a gunshot. Then the others, and there could be no mistake. I'm very frightened, very unsure, but I rush out to find John. But in this dream tonight, it wasn't John who pushed me back into the bedroom, who stumbled in behind me, already dying blood running out of him, soaking the shirt I pressed to the wound. It wasn't John. It was you. It's not hard to figure out. 
She could see him in a snap of lightning, too, his eyes clear and calm on hers. Not hard to put in its place. No, it's not. Stress, emotions, my going over and over all those events. What I felt for John and Terry, but particularly John, was a kind of love. I think, now that I understand such things better, I had a crush on him. Innocent, non-sexual, but powerful in its way. He swore to protect me, and I trusted him to do so. He had a badge, a weapon, a duty, as you do. She walked toward the bed, but didn't sit. People say to someone they love, I'd die for you. They don't expect to, of course, have no plans to. They may believe it or mean it, or it may simply be an expression of devotion. But I know what it means now. I understand that impossible depth of emotion now. And I know you would die for me. You'd put my life before yours to protect me. And that terrifies me. He took her hands in his, and his were as steady as his eyes. He had no warning. He didn't know the enemy. We do. We're not walking into an ambush, Abigail. We're setting one. Yes. Enough, she told herself. Enough. I want you to know, if you're hurt during the ambush, I'll be very disappointed. She surprised a laugh out of him. What if it's just a flesh wound? He caught her hand, tugged her down. Very disappointed. She turned to him, closed her eyes. And I won't be sympathetic. You're a tough woman with hard lines. I guess I'll have to avoid flesh wounds. That's for the best. She relaxed against him, listened to the storm blow its way west. In the morning, with the sky clear and blue and the temperatures rising, she worked for another hour. You need to give that a rest, Brooks told her. Yes, I need to fine-tune. It's close, but not perfect. I don't want to do anything else until I consider a few options. I'm checking something else now, unrelated. I checked in with Anson. He's meeting Garrison and Assistant Director Cabot in about ninety minutes. I estimate I'll need another day on the program. She glanced back briefly. I can't divulge to the authorities what I plan to do. It's illegal. I got that much. Why don't you divulge it to me? I'd rather wait until I've finished it, when I'm sure I can do what I hope to do. She started to say more, then shook her head. It can wait. I'm not sure of the proper dress for this afternoon, or... She broke off, horrified, spun around in her chair. Why didn't you tell me? What? Her sudden and passionate distress had him bobbling the bowl of cereal he'd just poured. Tell you what? I need to take a covered dish to your mother's. You know very well I'm not familiar with the rules. You should have told me. There aren't any rules. It's just... It says right here. She jabbed a finger at her screen. Guests often bring a covered dish, perhaps a personal specialty. Where does it say that? On this site. I'm researching barbecue etiquette. Jesus Christ. Torn between amusement and absolute wonder, he dumped milk in the bowl. It's just a get-together, not a formal deal with etiquette. I picked up extra beer to take over. We'll grab a bottle of wine. I have to make something right away. She flew into the kitchen, began searching her refrigerator, her cupboards. He stood, watching her and shoveling in cereal. Abigail, chill it some. You don't need to make anything. There will be plenty of food. That's not the point. Orzo. I have everything I need to make orzo. Okay, but what is the point? Taking food in a covered dish I've prepared myself is a courtesy and a sign of appreciation. If I hadn't checked, I wouldn't have known because you didn't tell me. She put a pot of water on the stove, added salt. 
I should have my ass whipped. You think it's amusing? She gathered sun-dried tomatoes, olive oil, black olives. I may not know precisely how this sort of thing functions, but I understand perfectly well your family's opinion of me will be important. My mother and sisters already like you. They may tend in that direction until I rudely attend the barbecue without a covered dish. Just go out and pick a small head of radicchio out of the garden. I'd be happy to, but I don't know what it looks like. She spared him a fulminating glance before storming out to pick it herself. That sure took her mind off illegal computer viruses and stepping into the arms of the feds, he thought. And since she was on a tear, he thought it might be wise to stay out of her way for a couple of hours. When she stormed back in, he made a mental note that radicchio was the purple leafy stuff, in case it came up again. I need to go into the station for a couple hours, he began. Good, go away. Need anything? I can pick whatever up on the way back. I have everything. I'll see you later, then. Brooks rolled his eyes at Bert on his way out, as if to say, Good luck dealing with her. He'd barely gotten out the door when his phone rang. Gleason. Hey, Chief, there's a little to do over at Hillside Baptist, Ash told him. I don't handle to-dos on my day off. Well, it's a to-do with Mr. Blake and the Conroys, so I thought you might want in on it. Hell, I'm rolling now. He jumped in the car, backed it up with the phone at his ear. What level of to-do? Shouted accusations and bitter insults with a high probability of escalation. I'm rolling, too. If you get there ahead of me, you start heading off that escalation. He thought, hell, and hit the sirens and the gas when he swung onto the main road. It didn't take him long, and he pulled up nearly nose to nose with Ash as they came in from opposite directions. You shaved off your... It couldn't rightfully be called a beard, Brooks considered. Face hair. Yeah, it got too hot. Uh-huh. As Brooks had judged, the to-do had already bumped up to a scene, and a scene was one finger jab away from a ruckus, so he decided to wait to rag on Ash about the haze he'd scraped off his face. Lincoln Blake and Mick Conroy might have been at the center of it, but they were surrounded by plenty of people in their Sunday best, lathered up and taken sides on the newly mowed green slope in front of the red brick church. Even the Reverend Good, holy book still in his hand, had gone beet red straight back into the sweep of his snowy hair. Let's simmer down, Brooks called out. Some of the voices stilled, some of the chest bumpers eased back as Brooks moved through. Blake had brought his stone-faced assistant, and Brooks had no doubt he was packing. Arkansas still had laws against guns in church— Christ knew for how long, but it was short odds some of those gathered on that green slope wore a weapon along with their tie and shined-up shoes. Add guns, he thought, and a to-do could go from a scene to a ruckus to a bloodbath in a heartbeat. Y'all are standing in front of a church, he led with disapproval, laced with a thin cover of disappointment. I expect most of you attended services this morning. I heard some language when I got here that's not fitting at such a time and place. Now I'm going to ask you all to show some respect. It's Lincoln here started it. Jill Harris folded her arms. Mick no sooner walked out the door than Lincoln got in his face. A man's got a right to say his piece. Mo Jean Parsons, Doyle's mother, squared off with the older woman. And you ought to keep that parrot nose of yours out of other people's business. I coulda if you hadn't a raised a hooligan. Ladies. Knowing he took his life in his hands, women were apt to leap and bite and were as likely to be carrying as their men. Brooks stepped between them. It'd be best if you and everybody else went on home now. You entrapped our boy, you and that Lowry woman. 
Lincoln told me just what you did. And the Conroys here, they're trying to make a killing off a bit of teenage mischief. Hilly Conroy elbowed her husband aside. From the look of her, Brooks decided she'd finally found her mad. Mojean Parsons, you know that's a lie. I've known you all your life, and I can see on your face you know that for a lie. Don't you call me a liar. Your boys run that hotel into the ground, and you're trying to make my boy pay for it. You don't want to stack your son up against mine, Mojean. If you do, and you try spreading those lies, you'll be sorry for it. You go to hell. That's enough. Mojean's husband, Clint, stepped forward. That's enough, Mojean. We're going home. You need to stand up for your boy. Why? You've been standing in front of him his whole life. I apologize, Hilly, Mick, for the part I played in making Doyle the embarrassment he is. Mojean, I'm going down to the car and I'm driving home. You can come or stay. That's up to you. If you stay, I won't be home when you get there. Don't you talk to me that... But he turned, walked away. Clint! After a quick, wide-eyed look around, she trotted after him. This has about worn me out, Jill commented. I'm going to walk on home. Why don't Hilly and I give you a ride, Miss Harris? Mick stepped forward, took her arm. I'm sorry about this, Brooks. You just take Miss Harris on home. This isn't finished, Conroy. Mick sent Blake a cold stare with weariness around the edges. I'm telling you, for the final time, I'll do no business with you. Stay away from me, my family, and my properties. Keep your assistant and his like away from me, my family, and my properties. If you think you can squeeze more money out of me, you're mistaken. I made you a fair offer. Go on home, Brooks told Mick, then turned to Blake. Here, he didn't bother with disapproval or disappointment. He arrowed straight into disgust and let it show. I'm going to be talking to Mr. and Mrs. Conroy later. Getting your stories lined up. I'll be talking to Reverend and Mrs. Good as well. Do you want to imply your minister and his wife are liars too? The fact is, my deputies and I will be talking to everybody who witnessed or had part in this business this morning. If I find there's been any level of harassment on your part, I'm going to advise the Conroys to file a restraining order against you and whoever you've been using to dog them. You won't like it. You'll like it less if one's filed and you cross the line of it. You can't bully me. You'd know all about bullying, so you know that's not what I'm doing. I'm outlining the situation. You may want to talk it over with your lawyers before you do anything you might regret. For now, I'm telling you to move along. Your wife looks upset and embarrassed. My wife is none of your business. That's the truth. It will be my business if you cause another ruckus. Lincoln. His color down again, his voice calm, Reverend Good stepped forward. I understand you're in turmoil. I'm here if you want to unburden yourself. But I must ask you to take Jenny home. She looks ill. I must ask you not to come back to this house of God with an unchristian purpose. Go home now, Lincoln, and tend to your wife. I'll pray for you and your family. Keep your prayers. Blake strode away leaving his assistant to help Jenny down the slope toward the waiting car. You're going to need some strong prayers, Reverend. Good sighed. We do the best we can do. She changed clothes three times. It was completely unlike her to worry about wardrobe unless it was for the purpose of establishing identity or blending in. Her research indicated that attire would be casual unless specifically stated, but that could include a casual dress or skirt, neither of which she currently owned. Now she felt she needed to acquire some. If they succeeded, no, when they succeeded, 
as it did no harm to employ Brooks's positive thoughts, she'd find use for a more expansive and varied wardrobe. Now she settled on dark blue capris and a red shirt and sandals she'd rarely worn and only bought in a weak moment. She spent some time with makeup, also rarely worn since she'd become Abigail, as blending and going unnoticed had been the goal. But she had a good hand with it, if she said so herself. She'd use that hand if, when, she transformed to Elizabeth to cooperate with the authorities and give testimony against the Volkoffs. As she glanced to the monitor to watch Brooks come home, she put on John's earrings, worn when she felt a need for confidence. She went downstairs, found Brooks in the kitchen, scowling down at a can of Coke. Something happened. Unrelated. He popped the top, guzzled. There was a to-do edging toward ruckus down at the Hillside Baptist Church. Organized religion has an unfortunate history of fostering violence. He just rubbed the cold can over his forehead. This wasn't about religion. Blake's been hassling the Conroys, and he took that to church this morning. He takes something that public, makes a fool of himself. He's lost control. He's not going to leave this alone. I'm going to have to talk to the Conroys about taking some legal steps to... He finally focused on her. You look really good. I have on makeup. I thought it was appropriate. Really good. When he smiled, the anger and stress she'd seen in his eyes warmed away. How do you do that? Relax so quickly. I'm taking a pretty woman to a barbecue, and it sure takes the edge off my bad mood. Where's the stuff you made? She took it, then a six-pack of beer, out of the refrigerator. If you feel you should follow through on the problem now, I'm sure your family will understand. You're not getting out of this so easy. Colorful, he commented as he picked up the bowl. Ready? I suppose... She clipped a leash on Bert. You could brief me on the areas of interest of people who'll be there. It would help me make conversation. Believe me, making conversation won't be an issue. He snagged the beer on the way out. As soon as we announce we're getting married, every woman there's going to be all over you about wedding plans. We don't have any. Take my word on it, honey. You will before the day's over. She considered that while she rode with the bowl on her lap and her dog sniffing at every inch of the back of the cruiser. They may not be pleased. With what? You and me? He flicked her a quick glance. They'll be pleased. I don't think they would, if they knew the full extent of the situation. I wish I could tell them to prove you wrong, but it's better if we don't. You seem so calm. I've learned to be calm when something has to change, but this is different. It's hard to be calm, to wait for Captain Anson to call, to wonder what the authorities will say and do, to think about testifying, about being so close with the program. Whatever happens, we're together. That keeps me calm. She couldn't claim to be. Her stomach jumped, her heart kicked, and with each passing mile she had to fight to keep her nerves concealed. She tried to think of it as going into a new community, stepping out for the first time with fresh identification. Nerves plagued her each time, but she knew how to conceal them, how to blend so anyone who noticed her saw exactly what she wanted them to see. It had worked for a dozen years. It had worked until Brooks. He'd seen something else, something more. But she thought of that now as a blessing. If he hadn't, she wouldn't have this chance at a genuine life. And the genuine life she might have would include backyard barbecues. When he parked, she thought she had herself fully under control. Relax, he told her. Do I look tense? No, but you are. I'll take that. You get Bert. He tucked the bowl under his arm, hefted the six-pack, and with her hand steady on the leash, 
they walked toward the house, toward the music and voices, toward the scent of grilling meat. She recognized three of the women, Brooks's mother and his two sisters, but not the other women, the men, the children. The thought of being thrust into the midst of so many strangers dried her throat and thickened her heartbeat. Before she could get her bearings, Sonny set down a platter and hurried over. There you are. I had a little business to deal with, Brooks told her. I heard. Sonny tied Abigail's tongue into knots with a quick, hard hug before she gave Bert a casual rub. Don't you look pretty? And what's this? Orzo, Abigail managed. I hope it's appropriate with your menu. Since the menu's a lot of this, with more of that, it'll fit right in. And it's beautiful. Go on and put that on the table, Brooks, and get Abigail a drink. We've already got the margarita blender going overtime. I'll fix you up, he told Abigail. Be right back. My girl Maya, you met Maya and Sybil, makes killer margaritas. Why don't you let Bert off the leash so he can play with Play-Doh? Abigail crouched down as the dogs sniffed and wagged at each other. Ils sont amis. Ami, Bert. C'est tu. He's all right with kids running around? Sonny qualified. Yes, he's very gentle, very patient. He wouldn't attack unless I gave him the command. Or I was being assaulted. We'll be sure nobody assaults you. Come on and meet Mick and Hilly Conroy. They're old friends, and that's their son, Russ, Brooks's best pal, with his wife, Celine, and their toddler, Cece. They've had a spot of trouble, Sonny continued as she walked. I'm hoping to cheer them up. It's an unfortunate situation. Brooks is very concerned. We all are. Here's Abigail, Sonny announced when they joined the group. About time. The younger woman had smooth olive skin that set off the bright green eyes she used to assess Abigail. I was beginning to think Brooks made you up. No. He didn't. I did, Abigail thought. This is Celine and her CC and our Russ. Russ's parents are friends Mick and Hilly. I've seen you around town a time or two, Hilly said. It's nice to meet you finally. Thank you. I'm very sorry about your hotel. It's a beautiful building. It's good of you to say. Hilly tipped her head to her husband's arm as if seeking comfort. We'll have it all back and better than ever. Right, Mick? Count on it. I heard the Blake boy gave you some trouble, too. He wanted to give Brooks trouble, but he didn't succeed. He appears to be a very angry, very stupid person with violent tendencies. He should pay the consequences. We can all drink to that, Maya said as she strode over with a margarita in each hand. Daddy snagged Brooks a minute, so I'm delivering your drink. Oh, thank you. It looks frothy. She tried a sip, discovered the tequila ran strong and smooth through the froth. It's very good. Packs a nice kick, doesn't it? As she spoke, Sonny put an arm around Abigail's shoulders. You were right about Bert. Following the direction, Abigail looked to see Bert sitting cooperatively while the puppy danced around him, a long-legged girl hugged his neck, and a tow-headed boy stroked his back. He's very well behaved, Abigail assured her, and I think he's enjoying the attention. He's big as a horse, Celine commented. Abigail started to disagree. After all, the average horse would be considerably bigger— then had to remind herself not to be so literal. His size should intimidate intruders. Scare the crap out of them, Russ commented. Now that we've got a second coming along, I'm talking Celine into a lab. Poodle. Girly dog. We're girls. She gave her daughter a kiss on the cheek. You're outnumbered. This one might even things up. He tapped her belly with his finger. A guy needs a dog, not a little French toy. Poodles are smart. They are a highly intelligent breed, Abigail agreed. 
Only the Border Collie is thought to be more intelligent. They're agile and, if properly trained, very skilled and obedient. See? A lab's a dog. They're smart, Russ added, appealing to Abigail. Yes, of course. They're the most popular breed in this country and in Great Britain. They make excellent assistance dogs. They're loyal and most have a well-developed play drive. They're excellent with young children. Young children. He snagged Cece, made the girl laugh as he tossed her in the air. We've got one of those, getting another. Poodles are good with kids. When Celine turned to Abigail, Sonny laughed. Now you've done it. These two will tag you as referee in this battle. I'm going to save you, show you the gardens. Food's going to be ready in a few minutes. Maybe they should consider a labradoodle, Abigail murmured as Sonny steered her away. It wasn't so difficult, she realized. For about twenty minutes, she walked and talked the gardens, talked with Brooks's family and friends, answered excited questions regarding Bert from wide-eyed children. By the time everyone crowded around picnic tables, she felt more at ease and relaxed further when, with the food now the focus, the attention shifted away from her. A backyard barbecue had its points, she thought, a casual setting for socialization, a variety of food prepared by a variety of hands. It was a kind of ritual, she realized, and somewhat tribal, with adults helping to serve or feed or tend to the children, their own and those belonging to others, with the dogs nearby and, despite her wince of disapproval, enjoying the food scraps tossed their way. And she liked the margaritas with their frothy kick. Having a good time? Brooks asked her. I am. You were right. Hold that thought. He leaned in to kiss her, then picked up his beer. I think you'll all be interested, he began without raising his voice over the conversations crisscrossing the table. Abigail and I are getting married. And those conversations, every one, stopped cold. What did you say? Maya demanded. It's what she said that matters. He took Abigail's hand. And she said yes. Oh my God, Brooks! Maya's face went brilliant with her smile. She grabbed her husband's hand, squeezed it, then leaped up to rush around the table and hug Brooks from behind. Oh my God! Then it seemed everyone spoke at once, to Brooks, to her, to each other. She didn't know who to answer or what to say. Her heartbeat thickened again as, beside her, Brooks looked at his mother, and she at him. Ma, he said. Sonny nodded, let out a long sigh, then pushed to her feet. He rose as she did, as she reached out, folded him into her. My baby, she murmured, then closed her eyes. When she opened them again, she looked directly at Abigail, held out a hand. Unsure, Abigail got to her feet. Mrs. Sonny just shook her head, gripped Abigail's hand, pulled her into the fold. I'm going to cry just half a minute, Sonny told them. I'm entitled. Then I'm going in and getting that bottle of champagne we had left over from New Year's Eve so we can toast this proper. She held tight, tight, then slowly eased back to kiss Brooks on both cheeks. To Abigail's surprise, Sonny took her face in her hands, laid her lips on each of Abigail's cheeks in turn. I'm glad of this. I'm going to get that champagne. She needs a minute. Lauren stood, walked to his son. She's happy, but she needs a minute. He embraced his son, then turned to embrace Abigail. Welcome to the family. He laughed, then squeezed, lifting her to her toes. Everyone talked at once again, and Abigail found herself whirled between hugs, stumbling over the answers to questions about when, where, what about her dress? 
She heard the pop of the champagne cork over the questions, the laughter, the congratulations. She let herself lean against Brooks, looked up, met his eyes. Family, she thought. She could have family, and understood, now that she could touch it, that she'd do anything, everything, to keep it. Chapter 28 Wedding Plans Abigail saw them as a small, shiny snowball rolled down a mountain. It grew and grew and grew, gathering weight, speed, mass, until it produced an immense, messy, thunderous avalanche. In the sun-struck afternoon in the Gleason's backyard, that avalanche roared over her. So, are you thinking next spring? Maya asked her. Spring? I... No. Under the picnic table, Brooks patted Abigail's thigh. I'm not waiting that long. Spoken like a man who doesn't have the first clue what goes into doing a wedding. We had ten months for Sybil and Jake's, and worked like dogs to get it all done in time. But it was beautiful, Sybil reminded her. I assumed we'd just go to the courthouse, Abigail began, and was rewarded with stereo gasps from the women. Bite your tongue, Maya pointed at her. Sybil gave her sister an elbow in the ribs. You want something simple? Yes, very simple. She looked at Brooks. Simple, sure. I'm betting there's a lot of simple between a run to the courthouse and the diamond jubilee forming in Maya's mind. I'm thinking in the fall. Time enough for a little fuss, not enough time to rent a circus tent. That's less than six months. Less than six months to find the perfect dress, book the right venue, interview caterers, photographers. Photographers? Abigail interrupted. Of course. You can't have your Uncle Andy taking your wedding photos. I don't have an Uncle Andy. And she'd always avoided photographs. Ilya had recognized her in New York in a matter of seconds on the street. If a photo of her somehow got online or in a newspaper, it could, likely would, lead to discovery and disaster. Which leads back to the guest list. I can help with our side. I have the list from mine and from Sibs. How many do you estimate from your side? There's no one. Oh, but... Maya didn't need an elbow jab or the warning look from Brooks to cut herself off. She rolled on as if no one was perfectly normal. That sure keeps it simple. What we need is a planning session, a ladies' lunch, because you don't have anything to do about it, she told Brooks with a wide grin. Weddings flow from the bride. Fine with me. I know this wonderful bridal boutique down in Little Rock, Maya continued. White wedding, Celine put in. It is wonderful. I found my dress there. What we need to do is take a day, all us girls, go down there, check it out, have lunch, brainstorm. I'll have to check my calendar. Maya dug out her phone, began to swipe screens. Maybe we can set it up for next week. Next week, Abigail managed. You always were a bossy pants. Sonny sat back, sipping a margarita. That's one of the things we love about her, Abigail, but it takes some getting used to. Why don't you give her a few days, Maya, to get settled into being engaged? I am bossy. Maya laughed and tossed back her hair when her husband snorted into his beer. And when we're sisters, I'll be even worse. She means it, Sybil said. Abigail heard the quiet hum of the vibrating phone in Brooks's pocket. When she looked down, he eased it out, checked the display. Sorry, need to take this. His eyes met hers briefly as he stood up, walked some distance off. It seemed surreal. Maya continued to talk about wedding boutiques, flowers, and plated meals or buffets, and all the while Brooks talked to Anson about decisions that would put her life on the line. Like the snowball again, she thought, 
rolling, rolling, growing, picking up weight and mass until it took the mountain with it. No stopping it now, she reminded herself. She was committed to pushing through. Are you all right? Sybil asked her. Yes, yes, I'm fine. It's just a little overwhelming. And it's just getting started. It is. Abigail glanced over at Brooks. It started. Brooks walked back, laid a hand on her shoulder. Sorry, I have to take care of this. Go be a cop then, Maya advised. We can drop Abigail home on our way. Oh, for an instant, Abigail's mind went blank. Thank you, but I really need to get home to some work I left pending. Then I'll call you tomorrow, or email you. Email might be better. I can send you some links. Just give me your... Maya. Sunny arched her eyebrows. What happened to those few days to settle? All right, all right. I can't help it if I was born to plan and organize parties. You email me when you're settled. Grabbing a paper napkin, Maya wrote down her email address. Abigail had a feeling it would take more than a few days. I will. Thank you so much for the afternoon. Abigail. Sunny crossed to her, hugged her hard, and whispered, Don't worry. I'll run interference with Maya for a week or two. It took some time. Apparently, people didn't just say goodbye at a barbecue. They hugged or stretched out a conversation, made future plans, played with the dog, even called out and waved once you got as far as the car. Before you tell me what Captain Anson said, I want to say your family is loud, pushy. No. Well, yes, but that's not what I want to say. Affectionate. Naturally so. I understand you better now for having spent the afternoon with them. Your mother... Don't feel sorry for me. I don't like it. Okay. Your mother put her arm around my shoulders. It was just a careless gesture. I doubt she gave it a thought and has done the same countless times to others. But when she did that to me, I felt... I thought... So this is what a mother does. She touches you, or holds you, just because, for no important reason. And then I thought, if there are children, I want to learn to be the kind of mother who can touch or hold without thinking, and for no important reason. I hope I have the chance to do that. You will. Hanson talked with the FBI. For most of the day. His take is, initially at least, they'd hoped to do an end run around him, get to you, but he stuck with the out-of-left-field contact. They were careful what they passed on to him, but he's dead sure they'll be doing some surveillance on Cosgrove and Keegan. Does he think they believed my story? You'd laid it out, step by step, right down to what John said to you, and now you've been this very valuable source over the last couple years. Why would you lie about Cosgrove and Keegan? It wouldn't be logical. No, it wouldn't. They want to talk to you in person. They want you to come in. They promise you protection. They want to question me, to make certain I wasn't complicit in John's and Terry's deaths. If and when they're sure of that, they'll want me to agree to testify against Karotki. Yeah, and they're going to want more. You've got an inside track on the Volkovs. Access to data that can, likely would, put a lot of the organization in prison, fracture the rest. As long as the data comes from an anonymous source, the authorities can use it. Once it's known the data's been obtained by illegal means, they won't be able to. No, they wouldn't. They may be able to find a little wiggle room. She'd considered this, all of this. I won't give them the process. Even if they grant me immunity for the hacking, I need the process to take down the network. They can't do what I hope to do, not technically nor legally. I'll be exposed again unless I can break their network and siphon off their funds. Siphon off? You have that kind of access to their money? I can have, to a great deal of it. 
I've been considering where to funnel it once I'm ready to transfer funds from various accounts. I thought substantial anonymous donations to charities that feel most appropriate. He glanced away from the road, gave her a long look. You're going to clean them out. Yes, I thought you understood. If they have what's approximately 150 million in accounts to draw from, they can easily rebuild. And then there's the real estate. But I have some ideas on how to dispose of that. Dispose. Tax difficulties, a transfer of deeds, some property the authorities can and will simply confiscate, as they've been used for illegal purposes. But others are rather cleverly masked. They won't be when I'm finished. It's not enough to testify, Brooks, she said when he pulled up at her cabin. Not enough to put Kurotki, potentially Ilya, even Sergei in prison. With their resources, their money, they'll regroup, rebuild, and they'll know I caused the trouble. I don't intend for them to know how their network was compromised, and I don't intend to tell the authorities. They couldn't sanction what I plan to do. She stepped out of the car, looked at him over the roof. I won't go into a safe house again. I won't let them know where I am, even if and when I agree to testify. I don't trust their protection. I trust myself and you. Okay. He opened the door for the dog, then held out a hand for hers. We find a location in Chicago when that time comes. You and me? We're the only ones who know where it is. We'll stay there. For the meat, you pick a place. A hotel, I'd think, maybe in Virginia or Maryland. And you don't tell them the location until you're in. That's very good. You can't be with me. Yes, I can, as long as they don't see me. It stopped now. Every bit of it stopped, unless he was with her through it. I figure you can get eyes and ears in the hotel room so I can follow, and so we have a record, if we ever need one. I hadn't thought of that. I should have, as that would be best. You think? I think. That's how it's done. She turned to him, let herself move into him. It has to happen fast when it starts. Everything will have to happen quickly and in proper order. She wouldn't take him from his family if things went wrong. She'd learned that, too, at a backyard barbecue. I need to finish the program. This is only partially done without it. You work on that, and I'll start some research myself. I'll find us a location for the meet. Virginia, she said, Fairfax County. It's far enough from D.C. and less than an hour from a small regional airport in Maryland. I'll charter a plane. Charter? No shit. Perhaps you forgot you have a rich girlfriend. He laughed. I don't know how that slipped my mind. If they want to back up the meeting, have me followed, we'd be able to lose them on those roads, and they'd most likely look at Dulles Airport or Regan National. That's a plan. He kissed her. Go play with worms. He stayed out of her way, for the most part. But Jesus, after a couple hours on the computer, a man wanted a beer on a Sunday evening. And some chips, which he'd had to sneak in as she didn't have a single item of junk food in the place. When he walked into the kitchen, she sat, hands in her lap, staring at her screen. He eased open the fridge, took out a beer, glanced her way, eased open the cabinet where he'd stashed the chips, sour cream and onion. And she turned. I'll be out of your way in a second. I did it. He studied her face, set the beer aside. You finished the program? Yes, it works. Theoretically. I've tested it several times. I can't actually run it into the network until it's time, so I can't be absolutely certain. But I am. Certain it will work. He grinned, came over, boosted her up by the elbows for a kiss. You're a genius. Yes. Then why don't you look happy? I am. I'm numb, I think. 
I believed I could do it, but when I did, I realized I hadn't really believed I could do it. Because it ached a little, she pressed her fingers to her left temple. That doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. Brooks, I can take down their network, corrupt every file, every program. I can shut them down. No matter what operating system or computer any individual uses, I can do it. And doing it immediately after I siphon the funds, they'll be ruined, broken. Now she pressed her hand to her heart. And before I do that, I can give the authorities enough to shut down a string of operations, use that to prosecute other lieutenants and soldiers until the Volkov Bratva is in pieces they can never put back together. Humpty Dumpty them. She let out a breathless laugh. Yes. Yes, I didn't really believe I could do it, she murmured. If I had, I'd have done it before I agreed to testify. He kept his face blank. Do you want to step away from that? You'd let me. As he often did with her, she framed his face in her hands. I love you so much. You'd let me step away, even though it's against your code. But no, I won't. I can't. It's part of the whole, part of who I want to be, part of who you expect me to be. I only expect you to be who you are. I expect more now. I expect more of Elizabeth. I expect more of Abigail. And I want you to expect more of me now. My testimony, my data, the hacking, the super virus, it's all one. When it's finished, Elizabeth can go with a clear conscience. She closed her eyes, then opened them, smiled into his. And Abigail can marry you with one. I want to marry you so much. I might even want to go to a wedding boutique. Uh-oh. I'm a little afraid of it, but I might. Now you look happy. I am. I'm very happy. As soon as we find a hotel, I could arrange for transportation. We could have your captain set up the meeting. We could start the next stage. I've got the hotel, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, middle range, right off the highway. I'd like to see the hotel's website and a map of the area. Figured you would. I've got them bookmarked on my laptop. We could book the rooms, arrange the meeting for tomorrow or the day after. It's less time for the authorities to try to find me. Day after. I need to rework the schedule so I'm covered. That's better. I have to make arrangements for Bert. My mother will take him. Oh, but... She hesitated, looked down at the dog. I thought a licensed kennel with professionals. You're going to put him in jail? A kennel isn't a jail. Now she had two sets of hazel eyes staring at her. He did enjoy being over there this afternoon, but it seems like a lot to ask of your parents. They'll love it. Plus, that's what family does. Get used to it. Go on and check out the hotel. I'll give her a call. All right. Brooks pulled out his cell phone as Abigail left the kitchen. You owe me, he said to Bert. Everything in place, Abigail told herself. She stood in her safe room, carefully selecting what she'd need to take this next step. She booked the hotel rooms under two different names at two different times from two different computers. Brooks would check in as Lucas Bowman, the name of his first Little League coach. She'd create his ID the next day. Hers, which she'd give Anson to pass to the feds once she and Brooks were checked in, set up, would be Catherine Kingston, an ID she already had in her supply. She considered her collection of wigs, her supply of hair color. Going as a redhead? Brooks commented when she lifted a short, straight bob in golden red. My natural color tends toward auburn. I don't have a wig that matches my natural color. Hold on. Head angled, he studied her. You're a redhead? Brown's more accurate, but with reddish tones. Just want to mention, I've seen the other 
area on you, and it's not brown with reddish tones. It would be, but I'm thorough when I change appearance. Interesting, really interesting. Maybe you should have aimed for the CIA. It didn't capture my interest. I think they'll expect me to alter my appearance somewhat for the meeting. This should be just enough, along with some slight changes with makeup and some padding, larger breasts. You can hardly ever go wrong with larger breasts. I believe my natural breasts are more than adequate. Let's see. He cupped them, considered. More than. Obsession with breast size is as foolish as obsession with penis size. I believe my natural penis is more than adequate. She laughed, turned toward the mirror. I guess you're not going to check to make sure. Perhaps later. She put the wig on with such quick, skillful moves. He knew she'd worn one often. It's a change. He preferred her longer hair, he thought, and the less studied style. Yes, I can work with this. I'll need to buy one closer to my natural color. A longer length I can style in several ways. I'll want to look like the photos they'd have of Elizabeth, even though they're dated. I can use contacts, change my eye color, just the tone of it, subtly. Fuller hips, larger breasts, a few shades deeper in skin tone with some self tanner. Yes, I can work with this. She repeated. She took the wig off, replaced it on its stand. Operatives in the CIA have to lie and deceive. It's necessary, I imagine, for the tasks they perform. I've done a lot of lying and deceiving for the past twelve years. I'd like to have a life where lying and deception aren't part of my every day. I can't put all the lies away, but she turned to him. I'll have one person who knows the truth, who knows everything, whom I'll never lie to. That's a gift. You're a gift. I've got one person who believes in me enough to tell me the truth, to trust me with everything. That's a gift too. Then we're both very lucky. She crossed to him, took his hand. I think we should go to bed. I need to run a few tests to verify your penis is adequate. Lucky for both of us, I've always tested well. His cell phone rang at a quarter to two in the morning. Brooks did a half roll to the side of the bed as he reached for it. Chief Gleason. Hey there, Brooks. It's Lindy. What's the problem, Lindy? Well, that's what I need to talk about. I got Tyball here with me. Shit. Yeah, it's some shit, but not the kind you're thinking. You're going to want to hear what Ty has to say. Brooks shoved himself up to sit. Where are you? Right now, we're in my truck, about a half mile from the Lowry place. Since your car isn't in town, I figured you're there. That's like police work, Lindy. Why don't I meet both of you at your place? Rather not do that under the shit we're talking about. It's going to be best if we come on over there, talk this out in private. People tend to see things in town, even at an hour like this. Maybe especially. That's a point. Hold on. He put his hand over the phone. I've got Lindy from the diner. Yes, I know who he is. He's telling me he's with Tyball Crew and they need to talk to me in private. Here? If it wasn't important and didn't need to be private, Lindy wouldn't be calling me at two in the morning. I'll get dressed. I'll keep them downstairs, out of your way. I think if someone needs to come here at this hour to talk to you, I should hear what they have to say. All right then. He put the phone back to his ear. Is Ty sober? He is now, or near enough. Come on ahead. Shoving one hand through his hair, Brooks set the phone aside. I'm sorry about this. Even days ago, I wouldn't have let anyone come here like this. But I don't feel nervous, not really. I feel more curious. Should I make coffee? It wouldn't hurt my feelings. It pleased her to do it, 
To think that in her future with Brooks, late night calls, making coffee for people in trouble, would be part of the routine. She hoped she'd make a good cop's wife. Still, she was just as pleased to know that Bert, with orders to relax, lay in the corner of the kitchen, and she also took the precaution of turning her computer monitors to screensavers. She wasn't quite sure how to address two men who visited in the middle of the night, but when she took coffee out to the living room, Brooks let them in the front door. And Lindy, long gray braid dangling down the back of a faded Grateful Dead t-shirt, led the way. Ma'am, he bobbed his head. I sure do apologize for disturbing you this time of night. Then slapped a back fist into Tyball's gut. Yes, ma'am, Tyball responded. Sorry to put you out. I'm sure you have good reasons. Damn well better, Brooks muttered. Jesus, Ty, you're sweating, rebel yell. I'm sorry about that. The tips of his ears went pink as he dipped his head. There's extenuating circumstances. I got my sixty-day chip, and now I gotta start over. Everybody takes a slide, Ty, Lindy told him. Your first day starts now. I've been going to meetings. Ty shuffled his feet and looked to Abigail like a scruffy, shame-faced bear. Lindy's my sponsor. I called him. I know how I should have called him before I took the drink, but I called him. Okay, okay, sit down, the pair of you, Brooks ordered and tell me what the hell you're doing here at two in the damn morning. The thing about it is, Brooks, I'm supposed to kill you. Ty wrung his ham-sized hands. I ain't gonna. I'm relieved to hear it. Sit the hell down. I didn't know what to do. Ty sat on the couch, hung his head. Once I started thinking past the whiskey, I still didn't know. So I called Lindy, and he got me sobered up some, talked it all through with me, and he said how we needed to come tell you. Maybe Lindy could tell you some. I don't know how to start. Drink some coffee, Ty, and I'll get it rolling for you. Seems like Lincoln Blake's wife left him. When? Brooks frowned as he picked up his own coffee. I just saw her this morning. At the church, yeah. I heard about that. Expect most everybody has by now. That's what did it to my way of thinking. What I hear is after they got home, she just packed up a couple suitcases and walked out. Ms. Harris's granddaughter Carly was out and about, saw her putting the suitcases in the car, and asked if she was going on a trip. Ms. Blake says, just as calm as you please, how she's leaving her husband and never coming back just got into the car and drove off. Seems like he holed up in his study the rest of the day. That can't have set well, Brooks commented. Blake's pride already took a hard hit this morning. Earned it, didn't he? Anyways, Bertie Spitzer does some for them, and isn't one for gossip. Be why she's hung on to the job, you ask me. She told me herself. I guess this was too juicy a grape not to squeeze some. Said there was some hollering, but there's some hollering per usual in that house, from him anyhow. Then the missus left, and he shut himself up. Bertie knocked on the door sometime later to see if he wanted his supper, and he yelled out for her to get the hell out of his house and not come back. Blake fired Bertie. Surprised, Brooks raised his eyebrows. She's worked in that house for twenty years. Twenty-four, she says, come August. Guess that's another reason she carried the tale to the diner. She doesn't know if she's got a job or not. Doesn't know if she wants it, should he expect her back even so. Now he's alone, Abigail said quietly. I'm sorry, I shouldn't interrupt. That's all right, and you got the truth of it. He's alone in that big house with his son in a cell and his wife gone. Speculating, I'd say he sat and brooded some on that and came to the conclusion the reason for his situation rested right here on Brooks.
That's an inaccurate conclusion based on faulty criteria, she began. Mr. Blake's conclusion, I mean, not yours. Yes, ma'am. Lindy grinned. That's a pretty way of saying he's full of shit. If you don't mind plain speaking. No, I don't. Yes, he's full of shit. Brooks took a sip of coffee, shifted his attention to Ty. How much did he pay you to kill me, Ty? Oh, well, God. Abigail managed and surged to her feet. Relax, honey, Ty isn't gonna hurt anybody. Are you, Ty? No, sir. No, ma'am. I come to tell you. Lindy said that was best, so here I am. Tell me what happened with Blake. Okay. See, he called me out there, to the house. I ain't never been in there, and it's sure something, like out of a movie. I thought maybe he had some work for me, and I could sure use it. He had me come right into that study of his and sit right down in this big leather chair, offered me a drink. I said no thanks, but he just poured it, set it there beside me. My brand, too. I got a weakness, Brooks. I know it. But I haven't had one drop since you arrested me. God's truth, not till tonight. I was kind of nervous, sitting there in that fancy house. He kept saying how one drink wouldn't hurt me. I was a man, wasn't I? I didn't take it. All right, Ty. But he kept saying it, and saying how he had some work, but he didn't hire pussies. And what was that other word I told you, Lindy? Unix, fucker. Sorry, more plain speaking. I agree with your opinion, Abigail told him, then looked at Ty. He tied your weakness to your manhood, and tied both to your desire for work. It was cruel and manipulative. It made me mad, but it felt true when he said it. How you tried to make me feel less of a man, Brooks, and how you humiliated me and castrated. He said you'd castrated me, and it made me feel bad. Mad, too. And that glass of rebel yell was right there. I only meant to have the one, just to prove I could. But I had another, and I guess another after that. Ty's eyes filled, and when he lowered his head, his shoulders shook. Abigail rose, left the room. I just kept drinking, cause the glass was right there, and it never seemed empty. I'm an alcoholic. And I know I can't have one drink and not take another. Carrying a tray of cookies, Abigail came back in. She set the plate on the table. As he watched her take one, pass it to a teary tieball, Brooks thought he loved her more than breath. He was cruel to you, she said. He should be ashamed of what he did to you. I kept drinking and getting mad. He kept talking about what Brooks had done, making me look weak and gutless in front of my own wife, how he was trying to run this town into the ground. Look how Brooks had framed his son. Something had to be done about it. He kept talking and I kept drinking. He said what was needed was somebody with guts and balls. He asked if I had guts, if I had balls. Goddamn right I do, that's what I said. Maybe I'd just go kick your ass, Brooks. Ty shook his head, hung it again. I've been going to meetings, and I've been going to group. I'm getting to understand when I've been drinking, I just want to go beat the hell out of something. I hurt Missy because of it. And between what he said and the drink, I was wound up good and proper. It seemed like a good thing when he said how ass-kicking wasn't enough. It had to be permanent. You'd killed my manhood. That's what you'd done. The only way to get it back was to kill you. Since he'd be grateful, he'd give me five thousand dollars. Like a reward, he said. He gave me half of it there and then. He gave you money? Brooks asked him. I took it, too. I'm ashamed to say it was cash money and I took it. But I didn't keep it. 
Lindy's got it. What he said, Mr. Blake said, to do was go on home, get my gun. How I ought to wait till after dark, sit on out here, on the road. Then I ought to call you up, tell you there was trouble. And when you drove out, I'd just shoot you. I went home to get my gun. Missy wasn't there as she's over to her sister's. I got my rifle, loaded it up, too. And I started thinking, why the hell wasn't Missy home? Started thinking she'd earned herself a couple good smacks. I don't know how to explain, but I heard myself thinking those things. And it made me sick. It made me scared. I called Lindy, and he came over. You did the right thing, Ty. No, I didn't. I took the drink. I took the money. And you called Lindy. You have an illness, Mr. Crewe, Abigail said. He exploited your illness, used it against you. Lindy said the same, thank you, ma'am. I'm ashamed to tell Missy. She's still some pissed at you, Brooks, but she's glad I'm not drinking. Things are better with us, and she knows it. She'll be more pissed if you put me in jail. Lindy said you wouldn't. Lindy's right. I'm going to need the money, Lindy. It's locked up in my truck. And I'm going to need you to come in, make an official statement, Ty. Missy's gonna be pissed. I think she might be a little pissed about the drinking, but when she hears it all, start to finish, I think she's going to be proud of you. You think so? I do. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you didn't try to kill me. So am I. What are you going to do, Brooks? I'm going to put all this together, all right and tight. Then I'm going to go arrest Blake for solicitation of murder for hire of a police officer. Chapter 29 The next step, Abigail thought, when she got home from taking Bert to Sonny, it felt strange and a little sad, she realized, to walk into the house without Bert. It's just for a short time, she reminded herself, a quick trip that changed everything. When Brooks came home, they'd drive to the airport, take the private plane to Virginia, check into their two rooms. She'd have plenty of time to set up the cameras and video feed. Plenty of time to obsess, worry, overthink if she let herself so she wouldn't. She focused on the task at hand and began to transform herself into Catherine Kingston. When Brooks arrived, he called out, Where's my woman? and made her smile. She was someone's woman. I'm upstairs. Is everything all right? As it can be. Blake's got his lawyers scrambling, and I expected deals coming along. He might even slip out of this, seeing as Ty was admittedly impaired. But even so, he'll be done in this town. I don't expect... He trailed off as he got to the doorway and saw her. I repeat, where's my woman? It's a good job, she decided, studying herself in the mirror. The hairstyle and the careful makeup sharpened the angle of her jaw. Contacts darkened the green of her eyes, the careful padding transformed her from slim to curvy. They'll probably ask the hotel for any security feeds once they know the hotel. We'll be in by then, but they'll run them to see when I checked in and if I came alone. That's the reason we take separate cabs from the airport, have different check-in times. You look taller. Eyeing her, he walked over, kissed her. Definitely taller. I have lifts in my shoes— just an inch, but it adds to the illusion. If any of this leaks to one of Volkoff's moles, they shouldn't be able to match me. Abigail's not in the system, and that'll make it very hard to connect Catherine Kingston or Elizabeth Fitch to Abigail Lowry. I'm ready whenever you are. I'll get the bags. He'd never flown private, and decided he could get used to it. No lines, no delays, no crowds— and the flight itself smooth and quiet. And he liked the wide leather chairs positioned so he could face Abigail, 
or Catherine, he supposed, and the way the light played over her face as they winged north. They've started a fresh file on Cosgrove and Keegan, Abigail told him as she worked her laptop. They've applied for warrants to monitor their electronics and communications. They may find something. Cosgrove especially tends to be careless. He gambles, she added, both online and in casinos. How's he do? He loses more than he wins, from what I've gathered through his finances and his gambling pattern. It was the gambling and the losses that allowed the Volkovs to pressure him into working for them while I was under protection. Gambling problem, Brooks speculated, and he caves when pressured. How would he respond to an anonymous source claiming to have information about his connection to the Volkovs? She glanced up, tipped down the large framed sunglasses she'd added to her illusion. That's an interesting question. If he folds under pressure, blackmail might push him into making a mistake. He's not as smart as Keegan, which is why he hasn't moved up the ranks as smoothly, I believe, in the Marshals or the Volkov organization. I calculated the Volkovs would have eliminated him by now, but apparently he's seen as having some value. Have you ever done any fishing? Brooks asked her. No, it appears like a tedious pastime or occupation. I don't understand what fishing has to do with Cosgrove or the Volkovs. He pointed at her. First, I'm going to take you fishing sometime, and you'll see the difference between restful and tedious. Second, sometimes you hook a little fish, and it can lead to a bigger catch. I don't think... Oh, it's a metaphor. Cosgrove is the little fish. There you go. Hooking him might be worth a try. Yes, it might. Greed responds to greed, and his primary motivation is money. A threat, something with just enough information that proves the source has evidence. And if he uses his electronics or phones to communicate, they'd have enough to question him. Which could lead to that bigger fish. And it'd add more weight to your testimony. He held out the bag of pretzels he opened, but Abigail shook her head. What's your bait? Because you need bait to hook even a little fish. With a nod, he bit into a pretzel. Wait till you drown your first worm. I don't even like the sound of that. However, there was a woman in witness protection after testifying against her former boyfriend, a low-level gangster involved with the Volkov's prostitution ring in Chicago, she was found raped and beaten to death in Akron, Ohio, three months after the conviction. Was Cosgrove her handler? No, he wasn't assigned to her, but everything I was able to gather at the time pointed to his being the one to pass her information onto his Volkov contact. I know enough to compose a believable and threatening message. Another pebble in the river. What river? The one with the fish? Laughing, he gave her foot a bump with his. Could be, except if we were sticking with that metaphor, you don't want to be tossing any pebbles. Might scare those fish away. I'm confused. In this metaphorical river, we toss the pebbles because we want a lot of ripples. Oh, a pebble then. She considered this for a moment, then began to compose. Anya Rinke testifies against Dmitry Bardov, July 8, 2008. Enters the witness protection program. New ID, Sasha Simka. Transferred to Akron, Ohio. Employed as sales clerk at Monique's Boutique. Case assigned to Deputy U.S. Marshal Robin Treacher. Case files accessed by William Cosgrove, October 12th and 14th, 2008. No login or official request for same on record. Copy of email from personal account of William Cosgrove to account of Igor Bardoff, brother of Dmitri, sent October 15, 2008, attached. $15,000 deposited in account for William Dwyer, a.k.a. William Cosgrove, on October 16, 2008. Anya Rinke, a.k.a. Sasha Simka, found raped and murdered October 19, 2008. 
This data will be emailed to Administrator Wayne Powell within 48 hours unless you agree to a payment of $50,000. Details on the remittance of same to be given in the next communication. I think that's a nicely formed pebble, she said, and turned the screen so Brooks could read it. His smile spread slowly before he shifted his gaze from the screen to her face. Good shape, good weight. You had all those dates in your head? They're accurate. What's the content of the email you're going to attach? It said, Sasha Simka, Akron, 539 Eastwood, Apartment 3B. The smile faded as Brooks eased back from the computer screen. So Cosgrove killed her for 15000 Yes, not personally beating her to death doesn't make him any less responsible. I believe he'll respond to this. I believe he'll agree to pay. As soon as I know the surveillance is in place, I'll send it. What did they pay him for you? His tone, hard and cold, had her taking a moment to shut down her laptop. He owed 50000 in gambling debts. Ilya bought, they're called markers, he bought Cosgrove's markers, then used the debt to threaten him. And when you weren't eliminated? They forgave half and required him to work off the rest. The fee, even though I lived, was considerably more than the fee for Anya Rinki. You'd have to conclude Korotki is worth more to Sergei Volkov than Dmitri Bardov. He spoke quietly now, and with absolute certainty. They'll pay, Abigail, for what they did to you, to Anya Rinki, to all the others. I swear it to you. I don't want you to make a vow over something you may not be able to control. His gaze never wavered from hers. Whatever it takes, however long it takes. Because it touched her and frightened her a little, she glanced out the window. We're starting our descent. Nervous? No. She took a moment to be sure. No, I'm not nervous about what happens next. It's surprising, really, how completely I was convinced I could never do this, and now how completely I'm convinced I can and must. And the difference is... She took his hand, linked fingers. This. Just this. This, he tightened his grip, is pretty damn important. She checked in a full thirty minutes before Brooks, so by the time he knocked on her door, she'd already positioned the cameras and mics in the sitting area of what the hotel called an executive suite. In his room, across the hall and two doors down, she set up the monitors, linked the equipment. In just over an hour, she'd set interfaced, and tested the equipment. As soon as we make contact, the feds will put men on the hotel, Brooks told her. I know, but the sooner the better. Nothing more to do, she determined. No more precautions to take. Let's make the call. She had to wait alone, but found it comforting to know he could watch her. So she worked while she waited, and when she had confirmation on the warrant on Cosgrove's and Keegan's electronics, programmed a time lag of two hours, long enough for the surveillance to be in place, to send her blackmail note. A pebble in the river, she thought, and looked directly at the camera and smiled. As she monitored activities, she knew exactly when the plane carrying Assistant Director Gregory Cabot and Special Agent Elise Garrison cleared for takeoff to Dulles International. They're on their way now, she said clearly, and should land at Dulles in about an hour and forty minutes. She checked her watch, calculated. I'd estimate they'll be in the hotel by ten. They may still opt to watch and wait until morning, but I think they'll come to me tonight, as it puts control in their hands, or they'd believe it would. She rose, wished she could open the curtains, but with the right equipment, the right angle from a neighboring building, they could watch her in the room. I think I'll order a meal, 
It would give them an opportunity to put an agent undercover as a room service waiter, so they can get a visual of me and the room. The confirmation I'm here alone might be helpful. She ordered a salad, a large bottle of water, a pot of tea. Finding it oddly intimate, she continued a one-sided dialogue with Brooks as she switched the TV on, volume low, as she assumed someone alone in a hotel might do. She checked her makeup, her wig, though she really wished she could remove both, and as an afterthought, rumpled the bed a little so it might look as if she'd stretched out with the television. When the food arrived, she opened the door for the waiter, gestured toward the table in the sitting area. He had dark hair, a compact build, and what she thought of as quick eyes. Are you in town for business, miss? Yes, I am. I hope you have time for some fun while you're here. Enjoy your dinner, he added when she signed the bill. If you need anything, just pick up the phone. I will. Thank you. In fact, perhaps you could arrange for more water or coffee, if they prefer, when the assistant director and special agent Garrison arrive. Excuse me? Your shoes, your eyes, and the weapon under the waiter's jacket. I hope you'd communicate to the assistant director and agent that I'm ready to speak with them tonight, if that suits them. And that, she thought, telegraphed clearly that the control remained in her hands. It can wait until tomorrow if they prefer keeping me under surveillance longer, but I don't intend to go anywhere. It should save time to talk tonight. And thank you for bringing the meal. The salad looks very nice. He gave her a long look. Ma'am, he said, and left her alone. That wasn't just impulse, and it wasn't showing off. Exactly. I felt if they understood I understand, we might move more smoothly through this process. The pebble dropped into the river while I was speaking to the FBI waiter, she added. I think I'll eat. The salad does look nice. In his room, munching on some mini-bar nuts, Brooks just shook his head. What a woman he had. When she'd finished, she set the tray outside the door. Plenty of fingerprints, she mused, sufficient DNA as well. They could run her prints and save yet more time. She sat, drinking her tea, monitoring her computer for alerts and thinking how much she wished to be home with Brooks, her dog, her gardens. She knew now, really knew, how lovely it was to wish for home. When the knock came, she switched off the computer, rose, walked to the door to look out through the security peep at the lanky man and the athletically built woman. Yes? Elizabeth Fitch? Would you please hold your identification up so I can see it? She knew their faces, of course, but it seemed foolish not to take this step. She opened the door. Please come in. Assistant Director Cabot. He held out a hand. Yes, thank you for coming. And you, Special Agent Garrison. It's nice to meet you in person. And you, Miss Fitch. Elizabeth, please, or Liz. We should sit down. If you'd like some coffee, we were told you'd already offered. Cabot smiled very slightly. It's on its way up. The agent you made is taking a lot of guff from his colleagues. I'm sorry. I was expecting you'd send someone in if you had the opportunity, and I'm very observant. You've managed to stay off the radar for a long time. I wanted to stay alive. And now? I want to live. I've come to understand there's a difference. Cabot nodded. We'll want to record this meeting. Yes, I'd prefer you did. Set it up, Agent Garrison. I'll get that, he said at the knock on the door. Garrison took a computer out of a case. I'd like to ask why you chose me as your contact. Of course. You have an exemplary record. You come from a solid family base, and while you excelled in school, you also took time for extracurricular activities, formed lasting friendships— I concluded you were well-rounded, intelligent, and had a strong sense of right and wrong. Those were important qualities for my purposes. In addition, in studying your higher education and your record at Quantico, then in Chicago, I concluded that, while ambitious, 
you wished to succeed and advance on your own merits. You have a healthy respect for authority and the chain of command. You may shave the rules, but you respect them as a foundation for the system and the system as a means to justice. Wow. I apologize, as some of my research on you included invasions of your privacy. I justified that by the desire to serve as a source on the Volkov organization. The ends justify the means. That's often no more than an excuse for doing the wrong thing. But in this case, at that time, I believed it was my only viable option. Would you like me to pour the coffee, Assistant Director? I've got it. Abigail held her silence a moment as she took a self-evaluation. Nerves, yes, she admitted. Her pulse beat rapidly, but without the pressure of panic. I assume you verified my identity from prints on the room service dishes. Again, Cabot nearly smiled. You assume correctly. Agent? Yes, sir. We're set. Will you state your name for the record? I'm Elizabeth Fitch. Miss Fitch, you contacted the FBI through a liaison expressing a desire to give a statement regarding events that occurred in the summer and fall of 2000. That's correct. We have your written statement as provided, but again, for this record and in your own words, would you tell us about those events? Yes. On June 3rd, 2000, I argued with my mother. This is important, as I had never to that point argued with her. My mother was, is still, I imagine, a dominant personality. I was a submissive one. But on that day, I defied her wishes and her orders, and it set off the events that followed. As he listened to the retelling, Brooks's heart broke again for that young, desperate girl. She spoke carefully, but he knew her now. He knew those slight pauses when she struggled for composure, the subtle changes in inflection, in her breathing. How many times would she have to say it all again, he wondered, to the prosecutors, to judge and jury? How many times would she have to relive it all? How many times would she have to start and stop, start and stop, as the listener interrupted with questions, with demands for clarification? But she didn't waver. Marshals Cosgrove and Keegan both stated, and the preponderance of evidence supports those statements, that Marshal Norton was down when they entered the safe house for their shift, that they were fired upon and returned fire upon person or persons unknown. They were unable to access the second floor at that time. As Cosgrove was wounded, Keegan carried him out of the house. When he called for assistance, he observed an individual fleeing the scene. He was unable to determine the identity of the individual as there was a rainstorm and visibility was impaired. At this time, the safe house exploded due to what was later discovered to be a deliberate sabotage of the gas furnace. Yes. Hoping she appeared calm, Abigail nodded at Cabot. That's an accurate synopsis of their statements? They lied. It's your contention that two deputy U.S. Marshals gave false reports? It's my sworn statement that these two men, in collusion with the Volkov organization, killed Marshals Teresa Norton and John Barrow. Ms. Fitch, I'd like to finish. William Cosgrove and Stephen Keegan, under the directive of the Volkov Bratva, intended to kill me to prevent me from testifying against Yakov Korotki and others. They rigged the explosion to cover themselves. It's my sworn statement that both these men continue on the Volkov payroll. John Barrow died in my arms while trying to protect me. He gave his life for mine. He saved my life by telling me to run. If he hadn't, I would have died in that house. She rose, went to the open suitcase on the bed, took out a sealed bag. This is the sweater and the camisole Terry gave me for my birthday that evening. I went upstairs to put it on before Cosgrove and Keegan arrived. I was wearing it when I held John, bleeding from multiple gunshot wounds. This is his blood. It's John's blood. She paused when her voice broke, 
bore down hard. She handed the bag to Garrison. John and Terry deserve justice. Their families deserve the whole truth. It's taken me a long time to find the courage to tell that truth. There isn't any concrete proof on the shooter from that day, but again, there is evidence that could be interpreted as a young girl, nerves stretched past the breaking point, who killed her protectors in an attempt to escape the situation. Abigail sat again, folded her hands in her lap. You don't believe that. You don't believe I could have attacked and killed two experienced marshals, wounded another, blown up a house, then escaped. It's certainly possible, but it's not logical. John Barrow taught you how to handle and shoot a sidearm, Garrison commented. Yes, and he taught me very well, considering the limited time we had. And yes, I asked for and received five thousand in cash from my trust, she added before Garrison could. I wanted the security and the illusion of independence. I know the explosion damaged some evidence, but you would have been able to reconstruct. You would know Terry died in the kitchen and John on the second floor. You would also know from their reports and from the reports, interviews, and statements from the child services representative assigned to me that I exhibited no signs of that kind of stress. She took another moment before going on. If you've studied my background at all, if you know anything about my home life before that June, you'd understand that rather than stressed, I was, in fact, more content than I'd been in my life. If Cosgrove and Keegan are responsible for the deaths of Marshals Norton and Barrow, they will be brought to justice. Your testimony in the murders of Alexei Gordievich and Julie Masters and in the death of Deputy U.S. Marshals Norton and Barrow is essential to the investigations. We'll need to place you in protective custody and transport you back to Chicago. No. Miss Fitch, you're a material witness and a suspect. Suspect is stretching credulity, and we all know it. If you put me in protective custody, you're killing me. They will get to me, and through whoever you put in their way. Elizabeth, Liz, Garrison said, leaning forward. You've trusted me with key information that's led to arrests, to convictions. Trust me now. I'll personally take the lead in your protection. I won't be responsible for your death, for your parents' grief. I promise you, if I live long enough, I'll run again rather than testify. I'm good at hiding, and you'll never have my testimony. You have to believe we won't let anything happen to you. No, I don't. Who else might you trust with my life? What about Agent Picto? Garrison sat back. What about Picto? Special Agent Anthony Picto, age 38, assigned to Chicago Bureau. Divorced, no children. His weakness is women. He enjoys them more when they're reluctant. He's funneled information on investigations in exchange for access to women the Volkovs bring to the States from Russia, then force into prostitution. They pay him, too, but that's secondary. He's digging for the FBI contact. You, Agent Garrison. He's getting closer. If he learns who's receiving the data that's led to these arrests, to these busts, you'll be taken. Questioned. Tortured. Raped. They'll threaten you with the torture and death of everyone you love, and perhaps will select one as an example to demonstrate how serious they are. When you're of no further use, they'll kill you. Agent Picto reports to you, Assistant Director. Yes, Cabot confirmed. He does. You're making very serious accusations about an agent in good standing. They're not accusations, they're facts and only one of the reasons I won't put my life in your hands. I'll help you put these people away, help you break the Volkov organization, but I won't tell you where I am. If you don't know, you can't divulge the information under duress. She reached into her pocket, took out a flash drive. Check the information I've correlated on Picto, then ask yourself if, before reading it, checking it, you would have trusted my life, this agent's life, others under your command, others in the marshal's service, to this man.
You would never have found me, but I came to you. I'll give you everything you need, and all I'm asking is you let me live. Let Elizabeth Fitch live to help get justice for Julie and Terry and John. And when she's done, let her die. I can't promise to do this your way. I have people to answer to. Impatience shimmered through. Do you think I'd have come to you if I didn't know you could authorize exactly what I'm asking? You have power, you have evidence, and considerable leverage. My way and the Volkoffs will be done in Chicago, in New York, New Jersey, Miami. You'll weed out agents and other law enforcement and judiciary officials who have worked for them, by choice or out of fear. No longer able to sit, pretend a calm she didn't feel, Abigail surged to her feet. I was sixteen, and yes, I had poor judgment. I was reckless. One night of my life I broke the rules. But I don't deserve to die for it, any more than Julie did. If you take me in against my will, this will leak to the press, and they'll talk of that young girl of twelve years in exile in coming forward to offer help at great risk. Is that a threat? Yes, it's very much a threat. Your superiors wouldn't be pleased with the bad press, especially at a time they're working to break the Volkov Bratva, especially when trusted FBI agents like Anthony Picto are implicated. Perhaps explaining that to those you answer to will give you additional leverage. Pause the recording, Agent Garrison. Yes, sir. I'm going to make a phone call. With that, he strode out of the room. Abigail sat again folded her hands in her lap, cleared her throat. Ah, uh, should I order more coffee? No, thanks, I'm good. You play hardball, Liz. I'm playing for my life. Yeah. Picto. You're sure? I wouldn't impute someone's name, reputation, and career otherwise. Okay. He's been asking some questions. Nothing that bumped my radar, nothing out of line, but I've heard he's asked some questions about the last couple Volkov busts. And when I put those questions in this context, it bumps my radar. Hard. I'd have trusted him, Garrison admitted. Of course. You know, if he's ordered to bring you in, Cabot will have you locked down tight. I want you to know, if that happens, I will keep you safe. If he takes me in, I'll get away, however tight he locks me down. I'll find a way. You'll never see or hear from me again. I believe you, Garrison murmured. I can be very resourceful. It took twenty minutes for Cabot to come back. He sat. I think we can work out a compromise. Do you? An elite two-man team, known only to me, to guard you in a location, again, known only by me. And when they learn, and they will, you have the information, and they take your wife or one of your children, when they send you a hand or an ear, who will you save? Cabot's fists balled on his knees. You think very little of our security. I have your address. I know where your children go to school, where your wife works, where she prefers to shop. Do you think they can't access the same? Won't use any means to access it when their organization is threatened? I'll cooperate. I'll speak with the prosecutors, with your superiors. I'll testify in court. But I won't go into a safe house again, and I won't go into witness protection once it's done. That's my price, and it's very little for the value I'm offering. And if we move on this, push forward on this, and you run again? She reached over, picked up the bag holding the blood-stained sweater. Terry's sweater. John's blood. I've kept this for twelve years. Wherever I've gone, whoever I became, this was with me. I need to let it go, and at least some of the pain and guilt and grief— I can't until I do what I need to do for Julie, for John, for Terry. I'll keep in daily contact via computer. When it's announced I've been found and I'll testify, they'll do everything they can to find out who knows where I am, who's protecting me. 
but they'll find nothing, because there won't be anything to find. And when I walk in the courtroom that day, it ends for them. It ends for all of us. That's the deal. When they left her, finally left her, she lay down on the bed. Will he keep his word? She closed her eyes, imagined Brooks there with her instead of just watching. Will he? I'm so tired. I'm so glad you're here. Right here, she said, and fisting a hand, laid it on her heart. Brooks watched her drift off and thought if Cabot didn't keep his word, there would be hell to pay, and he would exact the payment. But for now, he stood watch while she slept. Chapter 30 Brooks spotted the FBI shortly after he sat down for breakfast at the hotel's morning buffet. He barely glanced toward where Abigail sat, reading the newspaper at her single table. Casually scanning the room, he pretended to make and receive calls on his cell phone, just another busy man in transition. With the phone still at his ear, he headed out with his overnight bag and pulled the fire alarm on his way. He paused, as any man might, surprised, mildly annoyed, and watched the crowd in the buffet area push away from tables, heard the noise level rise as people talked all at once. She was good, Brooks observed. Abigail merged with the exiting crowd. As he zigzagged between her and the tailing agents, joining the people exiting, she nipped to the side and into a restroom. If he hadn't been watching for it, hadn't known the plan, he wouldn't have seen the move. He slowed his pace a moment. Fire alarm, he said into the phone. No, it won't hold me up. I'm heading out, he added as he fell in behind the agents. After he pushed the phone into his pocket, he pulled a ball cap out of his bag. Still moving, he put on sunglasses, stuffed the jacket he'd worn into the buffet in the bag, pulled the strap of the bag long, then slid it crossways over his body. They were looking for her now, Brooks noted, one of them doubling back, searching the crowd, aiming for the lobby and the main exit. Less than two minutes after he'd pulled the alarm, she slipped out of the restroom, joined him. The long tail of her blonde hair was pulled through a ball cap like his. She wore flip-flops and a pink hoodie, and had shed a good ten pounds. They walked out together, hand in hand, then broke from the crowd and climbed into a cab. Dulles Airport, Brooks told the driver, American Airlines. Jeez, you think there's a real fire? Abigail asked, with a hint of New York in her tone. Don't know, baby, but we're out of it now. At Dulles, they got out at the American Terminal, went inside, circled around, then exited to take another cab to the terminal for the private charter. Can't really blame the feds for wanting to tail you, Brooks commented once they were settled on board. No. And you make a pretty hot blonde. She smiled a little, then turned her laptop toward herself. Cosgrove responded. Already? Brooks tilted his head. I don't know who you are, but be aware you're attempting to blackmail a federal officer. This matter will be turned over for immediate investigation. Standard first round bluff. Yes, Abigail agreed. I'm about to call it. She glanced up. I'm a very good poker player, and it's ironic he's the one who taught me. Brooks watched the text come on screen. The student becomes the master. Rudolf Yankovich was your Volkov connection on the incident. He is currently serving 10 to 15 in Joliet. I'm sure your commanding officer would be interested in this information. The payment has now increased to $75,000 and will continue to increase by $25,000 for each scoop of bullshit you serve. You now have 37 hours. Scoop of bullshit? Yes, I believe harsh language is appropriate at this time. I'm so in love with you. 
The sentiment made her smile. I know how to say bullshit in several languages. I'll teach you. Looking forward to it. She sent the email, sighed. I can't wait to pick up Bert and go home. It could be like this, would be like this, she corrected, as she sat on the back porch with a glass of wine, the dog at her feet. Peaceful, quiet, yes, but not solitary, not with Brooks sitting in the second chair, which he'd bought on the way home. Will I get used to it, do you think? Being one person, being safe, being with you? I hope you will, even to the point where you take it all for granted now and again. I can't imagine that. She reached over for his hand. It should happen quickly now. We'll be ready. She sat for another moment, her hand in his, looking out over her thriving garden, the quiet woods. Just another soft evening, she thought, as spring drifted toward summer. I'm going to make dinner. You don't have to bother. We can forage around for something. I feel like cooking, like routine, like every day. She saw understanding when he looked at her. Every day sounds good. To her mind, no one who hadn't done without every day could fully appreciate how precious it was. She gathered what she needed, pleased when he came in to sit at the counter and talk to her while she worked. She chopped plum tomatoes and basil, minced some garlic, shredded some mozzarella, added some cracked pepper and poured olive oil over them to marinate. For fun, she began to prepare a pretty tray of antipasti. I thought we could get another dog, a puppy, as company for Bert. You could name him since I named Bert. Two dogs, no waiting he considered. It'd have to be Ernie. Why? He nipped one of the hot peppers off the tray. Bert and Ernie. Muppets? Sesame Street? Oh, that's a children's program. Bert and Ernie are friends? And possibly more, but since it's a kid's program, we'll stick with friends. I named Bert for Albert Einstein. I should have figured. He is very smart. Her computer signaled. That's incoming mail, she said, and stepped out of every day. She walked to the computer, leaned over, and brought up the mail. It's Cosgrove. He took the bait. Blackmail me, blackmail the Volkoffs. You won't live to spend the money. Back off now and live. He's tying himself to the Volkoffs with this response. It's not concrete, of course, but it's a start. Let me answer this one, Brooks requested, and took a seat. Oh, then Abigail's uncertainty turned to a nod of approval. That's very good. Tell the Volkoffs you're being blackmailed, you're a liability. They eliminate liabilities. Pay now and live. Payment is now $100,000. You have 29 hours. I'll route it. He gave her the seat, stood behind her, rubbing her shoulders as she worked what he thought of as a strange magic with the keyboard. Now he could call the bluff. He could let this go past the deadline, wait it out. No, he won't. Brooks leaned down, kissed the top of her head. He shifted from using the law as a lever to using the Volkoffs. He's sweating. His next response will demand a guarantee. How can he be sure we won't come back for more? That's irrational. Once the message was routed, she turned in the chair to look up at Brooks. It's all dishonest. It's extortion. Asking for a guarantee is not logical and would cost another 25000 He should either agree to the payment or ignore any other communications. Side bet. Ten bucks. I'm sorry? I have ten dollars that says he'll come back whining for a guarantee. Her brows drew together. You want to wager on his response? That doesn't seem appropriate. He grinned at her. Afraid to put your money where your mouth is? That's a ridiculous expression, and no, I'm not. Ten dollars. He drew her to her feet, into his arms, swayed into a dance. 
What are you doing? Making sure we'll make a nice picture dancing at our wedding. I'm a very good dancer. Yes, you are. She laid her head on his shoulder, closed her eyes. It should feel strange dancing with no music, making wagers while we're orchestrating something so important. Does it? No, it really doesn't. She opened her eyes in surprise when her computer signaled another incoming email. So quick. He's on the edge. Squeeze play. I don't understand what that means. Baseball. I'll explain later. Let's see what he has to say. How do I know you're not going to come back for more later? Let's work out a deal. That's a very foolish response, Abigail complained. It cost you ten dollars. Keep it short. Say, you don't, no deals. You're up to a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars clock ticking down. She studied him a moment. That slightly crooked nose, the hazel eyes, a wash of green over amber now, the shaggy black hair in need of a trim. I think you're very good at extortion. Thanks, honey. I'll put the pasta on while he considers. That's what he's doing now, considering. Sweating, pouring a drink, trying to figure out who's screwing with him. Oh yeah, Brooks thought he could picture it. He's probably thinking about running. Not enough time to make running plans, so he'll pay and start making them. At the counter, he popped an olive from the tray into his mouth, then topped off her wine, and when her back was turned, tossed a slice of pepperoni to Bert. By the time she'd boiled the pasta, drained it, the signal came through. One-time payment. Come after more. I'll take my chances with the Volkoffs. Spend it fast because I'm coming after you. Big talk. You understand him very well, Abigail noted. Part of the job. You have to understand bad guys to catch bad guys. Where were you figuring to have him wire the money? I have an account set up. Once he's transferred the funds, I'll distribute it to a charity for children of fallen police officers. That's commendable, and I don't like denying kids. But you have another recipient in mind, Keegan. Can you transfer Cosgrove's payment to Keegan's account? Oh, her face lit up as a woman's might when given rubies. Oh, that's brilliant. I have my moments. More than moments, it implicates both of them. It gives the FBI cause to bring them both in for questioning. Honey, it fucks them both inside out. Yes, it really does. And yes, I can do it. It'll take me a few minutes. Take your time. Bert and I will go for a little walk while you work. He snagged a couple more slices of pepperoni on the way out. One for him, one for the dog. A nice evening for a stroll around, he thought. With time to check out the progress of the garden, think about what he might do around the place on his next day off. This is our place, he said to the dog. She was meant to come here, and I was meant to find her here. I know what she'd say to that. He laid a hand on Bert's head, rubbed lightly. But she's wrong. When Bert leaned against his leg, as he often did with Abigail. Brooks smiled. Yeah, we know what we know, don't we? As they circled around, he saw Abigail come to the door, smile. It's done. Dinner's ready. Look at her, he thought, standing there with a gun on her hip, a smile on her face, and pasta on the table. Oh yeah, he knew what he knew. Come on, Bert, let's go eat. Brooks spent a chunk of his morning, too big a chunk in his opinion, meeting with the prosecutor on the Blake cases. The kids crying for a deal. Big John Simpson, slick as they came, and with one eye on a political future, made himself at home in Brooks's office. Maybe a little too much at home. And you're giving him one. Save the taxpayers' money. 
Let him plead guilty to assaulting an officer, resisting the trespass. Got him locked on the vandalism at the hotel, the assaults there. All we give him is a buy on the deadly weapon. We'd never make attempted murder stick. He gets five to seven inside with mandatory counseling. And serves two and a half, maybe three. Big John crossed his ankles above his mirror-shined shoes. If he behaves himself and meets the requirements, can you live with that? Does it matter? Big John lifted a shoulder, sipped at his coffee. I'm asking. No, they'd never make the attempted murder stick, Brooks admitted. A couple years inside would do one of two things, he calculated. It would either make Justin Blake into a halfway decent human being, or it would finish his ruination. Either way, Bickford would be free of him for a couple years. I can live with it. What about his old man? Big city lawyers doing their big city shuffle, but the fact is we've got a lock there. We've got the phone records proving he called Tyball Crew. Got three separate witnesses saw Crew's truck outside the house on the day in question. Got the cash money turned in, and Blake's fingerprints are on a number of the bills. He paused a moment, recrossed his ankles. He's claiming he hired Ty to do some work around the place, paid him in advance cause Ty needed the money. Casa sure. Say what? Bullshit in Farsi. Don't that beat all. Big John let out a chuckle. Yeah, it's bullshit in any language. We can bring in a couple dozen witnesses who'd swear Blake never pays in advance, never pays cash, always gets a signed receipt. True enough, Ty was pretty damn impaired by the end of it, but he hasn't changed his story by an inch. So, he shrugged, drank more coffee. If Lincoln Blake wants to push it to trial, it won't hurt my feelings. Make a nice splash. He's charged with solicitation of murder for hire of a police officer. They're gonna want to deal before it's done. Any way it's sliced, he'll do time. I can live with that, too. Good enough. He unfolded his six-foot-six-inch frame. I'll make the deal with the boy's lawyer. You did good, clean work with both these arrests. Good, clean work's the way it's supposed to be. Supposed to and is aren't always the same. I'll be in touch. No, they weren't always the same, Brooks thought. But he'd like to get back to that good, clean work. Just that. He wanted the rest over and done, however intriguing parts of it were. The everyday, Abigail called it. It surprised him how much he'd learned to value the everyday. He stepped out of his office. There was Alma at dispatch, a pencil behind her ear, a pink tumbler of sweet tea at her elbow. Ash at his desk, brows knitted as he pecked away at the keyboard— Boyd's voice over the radio reporting a minor traffic accident off Rabbit Run at Mills Head. He'd take this, Brooks realized. Yeah, he'd take just this. Every day. Abigail walked in. He knew her, so he saw the tension, though she kept her face impassive. Alma spotted her. Well, hey there. I heard the news. I want to say best wishes to you, Abigail, as your family now. You got yourself a good man there. Thank you. Yes, I do. A very good man. Hello, Deputy Heiderman. Aw, oh, it's Ash, ma'am. Nice to see you. It's Abigail. It's Abigail now. I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you have a moment? She asked Brooks. Or two. Come on in. He took her hand kept it after he closed the door to his office. What happened? It's good, what happened. The good made her a little breathless. Garrison contacted me. Her report was very brief, considering, but inclusive. Abigail, spill it. I'm... 
Oh, yes. They've picked up Cosgrove and Keegan. They're interrogating, and that may take some time. She didn't mention the blackmail, but I've followed some of the communications in-house, so to speak. Naturally, they believe Keegan blackmailed Cosgrove, and they'll use that to pressure each of them. More, more important, they've arrested Karotki and Ilya Volkov. They've arrested Karotki for the murders of Julie and Alexei, and Ilya as accessory after the fact. Sit down, honey. I can't. It's happening. It's actually happening. They've asked me to meet with the federal prosecutor and his team to prepare me for testifying. When? Right away. I have a plan. She took both his hands now, held tight. I need you to trust me. Tell me. On a bright July morning, one month and twelve years from the day she'd witnessed the murders, Elizabeth Fitch entered the courtroom. She wore a simple black suit and white shirt and what appeared to be minimal makeup. A pair of pretty dangling earrings were her only jewelry. She took the stand, swore to tell the truth, and looked directly into Ilya Volkov's eyes. How little he'd changed, really, she thought, a bit fuller in face and body, his hair more expertly styled, but still so handsome, so smooth, and so cold under it all. She could see that now, what the young girl hadn't, the ice under the polish. He smiled at her, and the years dropped away. He thought the smile intimidating, she decided. Instead, it made her remember and helped her forgive herself for being so dazzled that night, for kissing a man complicit in the murder of her friend. Please state your name. My name is Elizabeth Fitch. She told the story she'd recounted now almost too many times to bear. She skipped no detail and, as instructed, allowed her emotions to show. These events happened twelve years ago, the federal prosecutor reminded her. Why has it taken you so long to come forward? I came forward that night. I spoke with detectives Brenda Griffith and Sean Riley of the Chicago Police Department. They were in the courtroom, too. She looked at them, both of them, saw the faint nods of acknowledgement. I was taken to a safe house, then transferred into the protection of the U.S. Marshals Service and transferred to another location, where I remained under the protection of Marshals John Barrow, Teresa Norton, William Cosgrove, and Linda Pesky for three months as there were delays in the trial, until the evening of my seventeenth birthday. What happened on that date? Marshals Barrow and Norton were killed protecting me, when Marshal Cosgrove and a Marshal Keegan, who had arranged to replace Marshal Pesky, attempted to kill me. Hands tightly clenched in her lap, she sat through the objections, the jockeying. How do you know this? the prosecutor demanded. She talked, and continued to talk, of a pretty sweater and a pair of earrings, of a birthday cake, of shouts and gunshots, of her last moments with John Barrow and his last words to her. He had a wife and two sons whom he loved very much. He was a good man, a kind one and a brave one. He gave his life to save mine. And when he knew he was dying, when he knew he couldn't protect me, he told me to run, because two men he trusted, two men who'd taken the same oaths he had, betrayed their oath. He couldn't know if there were others or whom I could trust other than myself. He spent his last moments doing everything he could to keep me safe. So I ran. And for twelve years, you've lived under an assumed name and remained hidden from the authorities. Yes, and from the Volkovs, and from those within the authorities who work with the Volkovs. What changed, Ms. Fitch? Why are you testifying here and now? As long as I ran, the life both John and Terry died for was safe. But as long as I ran, there could be no justice for them 
or for Julie Masters, and the life they saved could only be half a life. I want people to know what was done, and I want to make the life they saved worthwhile. I'm finished running. She didn't waver through the cross. She'd assumed it would pain her to be called a liar, a coward, to have her veracity, her motives, her actions twisted and warped. But it didn't. It only made her dig in deeper, speak more concisely. She kept her eyes level, her voice strong. Testimony completed, she walked out under escort and into a conference room. You were perfect, Garrison told her. I hope so. You held tough, gave clear answers. The jury believed you. They saw you at sixteen, Liz, and at seventeen, just as they saw you now. You made them see you. If they did, they'll convict. I have to believe they will. Believe me, you turned the key. Are you ready for the rest? I hope I am. Garrison took her arm a moment, spoke quietly. Be sure. We can get you out safe. We can protect you. Thank you. She held out a hand to Garrison. For everything, I'm ready to go. Garrison nodded, turned away to signal the go. She put the flash drive Abigail had palmed to her in her pocket, wondered what she'd find on it. They surrounded her, hustling her through the building toward a rear entrance where a car waited. They'd taken every precaution. Only a select team of agents knew her route, the timing of her exit. Her knees trembled a little, and a hand took her arm when she stumbled. Easy now, miss. We've got you. She turned her head. Thank you. Agent Picto, isn't it? That's right. He gave her arm a reassuring squeeze. We'll keep you safe. She stepped outside, flanked, moving quickly toward the waiting car. Brooks, she thought. The shot sounded like hammer on stone. Her body jerked and blood bloomed on her white shirt. For an instant, she watched the spread of it, red over white, red over white. She went down under Garrison's shielding body, heard the shouts, the chaos, felt herself being lifted, pressure on her chest. She thought again, Brooks, then let it all go. Garrison sprawled over Abigail's body in the back seat. Go, 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 she shouted at the driver. Get her out of here. I can't get a pulse. Can't get a pulse. Come on, Liz. Jesus Christ. Brooks, she thought again. Brooks, Bert, her pretty butterfly garden, her spot where the world opened to the hills. Her life. She closed her eyes and let it go. Elizabeth Fitch was pronounced dead on arrival at 3.16 p.m. At 5 p.m. sharp, Abigail Lowry, boarded a private jet bound for Little Rock. God, God. Brooks framed her face, kissed her. There you are. You keep saying that. Dropping his brow to hers, he held her so tightly that she couldn't get her breath. There you are, he repeated. I may say it for the rest of my life. It was a good plan. I told you it was a good plan. You weren't the one pulling the trigger. Who else would I trust to kill me, to kill Elizabeth? Shooting a blank and still my hand shook. I barely felt the impact through the vest. And still the moment had shocked her. Red over white, she thought again. Even knowing the blood capsules had released on her command, that spreading stain had shocked. Garrison was very good, and the assistant director, he drove like a crazy person. She laughed, a little giddily. Having Picto right there on the scene, knowing he'll report to the Volkoffs Elizabeth is dead, there's no reason to doubt it. And since you picked up the chatter about the bounty on your head, someone will probably take credit for it. 
And even if no one does, it's official. Elizabeth Fitch was shot and killed this afternoon after testifying in federal court. The federal prosecutor was very kind to Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth was gone, she thought. She'd let Elizabeth go. I'm sorry he doesn't know about me. He'll work harder for the convictions not knowing. Besides you, only Captain Anson, Garrison, and the assistant director, and the FBI doctor who pronounced Elizabeth dead, know how it was done. It's enough to trust. It's more than I've trusted most of my life. Because he needed to touch her, keep touching her, he brought her hand to his lips. Are you sorry she's gone? No. She did what she needed to do and could leave content with that. Now I have one last thing to do for her. Abigail opened her laptop. I passed Garrison a flash drive with copies of everything on the Volkoffs, their financials, their communications, addresses, names, operations. Now, for Elizabeth, for Julie, for Terry, for John, I'm going to take it all away from them. She sent the email to Ilya, using his current mistress's address, with a sexy little text mirroring those Abigail had accessed from the past. The attachment wouldn't register. That, she thought with considerable pride, was only part of its beauty. How long will it take to work? It'll start the minute he opens the email. I estimate about 72 hours before everything's corrupted, but that corruption will begin immediately. She sighed. Do you know what I'd like? I'd like to open a bottle of champagne when we get home. I have one, and this feels like exactly the right occasion. We'll do that, and I've got something to add to it. What? A surprise? What sort of surprise? The kind that's a surprise. I don't know if I like surprises. I'd rather... Oh, look, he's opened the email already. Satisfied, she closed the laptop. A surprise, then. Epilogue He wanted to take the champagne up to her spot overlooking the hills. Like a picnic? Should I pack some food? Champagne's enough. Come on, Bert. He listens to you, follows you. I think he likes to because you sneak him food from the table when you think I'm not looking. Busted. She laughed and took his hand. I like holding your hand when we walk. I like so many things. I like being free. I'm free because of you. No, not because of me. You're right, that's not accurate. I'm free because of us. That's better. You're still wearing a gun. It may take a little time for that. It may take me a while to aim one again. Brooks, it's done. It worked. So I can tell you, putting you in those crosshairs was the hardest thing I ever did. Even knowing the why, the how, it was like dying. You did the hardest thing because you love me. I do. He brought her hand to his lips again. You need to know. I would have loved Elizabeth or Liz or whoever you were. I do know. It's the best thing I know, and I know a great deal. Smarty pants. She laughed, realized she could spend hours just laughing. I've been thinking. As smarty pants are inclined to do. Global Network is going to close. The head of the company is going into seclusion. I want to start fresh. Doing? I want to go back to developing software. And games. I really enjoyed that. I don't want my whole world revolving around security and safety now. She grinned, and this time brought his hand to her lips. I have you for that. Damn right you do. I'm chief of police. And maybe, one day, the Bickford Police Department will need or want a cybercrimes unit. I'm very qualified, and I can forge all the necessary documents and degrees. I was kidding about the last part. 
she said when he gave her a long look. No more forging. None. Or hacking. Her eyes widened. At all? Ever? Can I qualify that? I'll want to know how the virus is working over the next couple days, and after that, no more hacking unless we discuss and agree. We can talk about it. It's compromise. Couples discuss and compromise. I want to discuss having your friends and family to dinner, and wedding plans, and learning how to... She trailed off, stopped. There's a bench, she murmured. There's a beautiful bench exactly where I wanted one. That's your surprise. Welcome home, Abigail. Her vision blurred as she stepped forward to run her hands over the smooth curve of the back, the arms. It looked like a log, hollowed out, polished to a satiny gleam, and on the middle of the back was carved a heart with the initials A.L. and B.G. in the center. Oh, Brooks. Corny, I know, but... No, it's not. That's a stupid word. I prefer romantic. So do I. It's a beautiful surprise. Thank you. Thank you. She threw her arms around him. You're welcome, but I get to sit on it, too. She sat, pulled him down. Look at the hills, so green as the sun lowers, and the sky just starting to hint at reds and golds. Oh, I love this spot. Can we get married here, right here? I can't think of a better place. Since I can't... He pulled a ring box out of his pocket. Let's make it official. You got me a ring. Of course I got you a ring. He flipped the top open. Do you like it? It sparkled in the softening light. Like life, she thought. Like the celebration of all that was real and true. I like it very much. She lifted her eyes, drenched now, to his. You waited until now to give it to me because you knew it would mean more. No one's ever understood me the way you do. I don't believe in fate or in things being meant, but I believe in you. I believe in fate and in things being meant, and I believe in you. He slipped it on her finger. He kissed her to seal it, then opened the champagne with a quick, happy pop. She took the glass he poured for her, waited while he poured a second plastic cup, then frowned when he added a small amount to a third and set it on the ground for the dog. He can't have that. You can't give champagne to a dog. Why not? Because... She stared at Bert as he tilted his head, watched her with his pretty hazel eyes. All right, but just this once. She tapped her cup to Brooks's. Soon, and for the rest of my life, I'll be Abigail Gleason. And while the dog happily lapped at his share of champagne, 